Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Cabbage Head Fanfics, back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of, what if Deku had solo leveling quirk? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. The Gates, Bridges Between Dimensions On one fateful day, these gates popped into existence all around the world, monsters of all shapes and sizes pouring out of them like an infection. They held no weaknesses to modern conventions. Not even tanks or missiles could kill them. They came to be known only as villains. From the start, it was humanity's battle to lose. The gates were metaphysical and could not simply be boarded up. The only way to close them permanently was to enter them and kill the boss villain. Some were powerful enough to tear entire squads of soldiers apart. Others could wipe out armies. Or at least, that was the estimate. Bosses never left their gates and the basic villains were enough to decimate humankind on their own. Entire cities were lost and villains were running rampant. Entire governments were in disarray. The public was on the verge of total anarchy, and it had only been three weeks. But then, everything changed. The first of humanity's weapons emerged. Heroes as they would come to be known, exploded onto the scene, each and every one of them wielding quirks, powers that allowed them to fight the villains head-on and win. They could be as simple as increased strength, or as powerful as a scorching inferno. While the massive influx of attacks by villains was being steadily subdued, the amount of hero deaths in those early days was astronomical, so a system was put in place. Heroes, villains, and gates were given a value, a rank if you will, to ensure that a hero never took on more than they could chew. Unfortunately, not all heroes were created equal and I was a victim of that system. I am the world's weakest E-rank hunter. I had no unique quirk, and I had come to find myself at the mercy of the world's most powerful dungeon, the Double Lair. I was at the edge of death, alone and beset on all sides by villains. But as my vision faded and I sunk into unconsciousness, I felt a gentle touch on my head and from there, everything changed. Upon waking up, I found myself in a hospital, completely safe and blessed with my very own quirk, the system, a quest window that only I could see. If I completed the quests given to me by this system, I could grow stronger, I could surpass the weakness that held me down. My name is Izuku Midoriya. And this is the story of how I became the world's most powerful hero. There's a villain gate by Tatooine Station. I hear some sort of giant broke through the hero's lines. Those two sentences sent a shock of excitement through Izuku Midoriya's body as he watched the masses begin sprinting towards the site. Not because he liked watching villains rampage, but because he loved watching heroes take them down. It was a spectacle that anyone and everyone loved to watch. A spectacle that proved humanity wasn't just some punching bag, that they were a force to be reckoned with. Of course, while this was the excuse Midoriya gave out, it was not the truth. Every takedown, every display of heroic power gave him the extremely satisfying catharsis he could not give himself. Izuku Midoriya, like most of the world's current population, was considered an E-rank hero. But unlike the majority of the world, he did not have any unique quirk to accompany him. He was completely special in that regard, which only made him mundane in the eyes of the rest of his peers. He didn't have the same increased strength that came standard with being a hero, or the slightly increased regeneration. Midoriya was as weak as they came. If he were to face off against even the lowest of E-rank villains, it would take all of his efforts and a healthy amount of luck to escape with his life. He wouldn't even be able to hope to defeat his enemy. For all those reasons and more, he found himself inexorably drawn to every last hero fight he could witness. And before he even knew it, Midoriya found his legs rapidly pumping as he followed closely behind the crowd. As he neared the station, Izuku found his eyes tracking far above the railways to gaze upon the shark-headed villain tearing apart the surrounding area. Just behind him, Izuku could see the telltale signs of a gate. The swirling blue ethereal portal stood fifty feet in all directions. Though Izuku himself was adept at sensing the intricate energies coming off the gate, he had seen enough to recognize the pattern. Its rotary speed and the duration of the particles coming off of it told him it was a low B rank at best, highly dangerous and yet, hundreds of people had crowded around to observe as if it was an everyday occurrence, probably because it was. It had been decades since the first emergence of gates and in modern times, people had become desensitized to it all. Heroes were always stationed at gate entrances, so even in the event that some villains snuck out, they were typically dealt with in a matter of seconds. In this case, it was none other than Kamui Woods at the rear guard. His body was completely unnatural, made entirely of wood that bent and flowed like water. With roots shooting from Kamui's body to entangle the villain, Izuku made haste to pull out his latest notebook, nearly missing a second giant join the fight. Eat this, with a roar that would put a dragon to shame. Mount Lady, a hero with gigantification quirk, brought a massive iron mace to the side of the villain's head, deeply denting its skull. Midoriya almost sympathetically winced, forgetting for a moment that it was a villain, an interdimensional monster that only existed to kill. Mount Lady was an a-rank hero, 
At the top of her game, it wasn't unfeasible for one strike to be all she needed to take down the threat. In fact, as the villain collapsed to the ground, Izuku was able to make out his unmoving body. The sudden beeping of an alarm shook Izuku out of his focus and he looked down at his watch, blanching as he did so, I'm gonna be late. Izuku hated the feeling of his current clothing. His sweatshirt hung too loosely and was so baggy that he ended up spending a good two minutes trying to shove all of it into his too tight pants. These were his hero clothes so to speak. They were the only clothes he owned that he could also afford to lose. On multiple occasions, Izuku had considered his form-fitting school uniform, which was by far more comfortable. But school uniforms were expensive and Izuku didn't have the skill needed to knit the clothing back together well enough to hide the claw marks and bladed attacks. Approaching a construction site, Izuku looked down at his phone making sure that this was, indeed, the site of the D-rank gate. While pros were officially licensed and run by the government, thus giving them access to more power and more money, it wasn't necessary to become a pro hero to clear gates. It was, however, necessary to be in possession of a beginner's badge, an idea of sorts that confirmed the person in possession was able to make their own informed decisions about entering gate. Izuku grimaced in response to the memory that thought brought up. It had taken months of convincing and conniving to get his own beginner's badge without a quirk of his own. In reality, he shouldn't have been able to get a hold of it in the first place. Again, Izuku heard a familiar voice cry out in his direction and flinched in response. Uh, good afternoon Miss Yeyarazu. Turning on his heel, Izuku came face to face with Momo Yeyarazu, an irrefutably beautiful girl who was a good seven centimeters taller than him. Her obsidian hair was currently hanging low over her back as she attempted to work it up into a massive ponytail. Izuku had a hard time not staring at her. Every bit of her body was as if it was hand sculpted by the gods. No matter how much of a gentleman he was, her chest always demanded a quick glance from him, much to his shame. Thankfully, Yeyarazu was too caught up getting herself ready to focus on Izuku's emerald green eyes. I keep telling you, it's just Yeyarazu, or Yamomo. It's what my friends call me. Besides, we're the same age. Izuku bowed low, I'm sorry miss um. I'm sorry Yeyarazu. Yeyarazu fought to not roll her eyes. Her father always scolded her about how unladylike it was. What happened this time? Izuku stood up straight once more and scratched the back of his head nervously. Oh, it just happened while doing some hero work. Sure, what actually happened? Izuku sighed, knowing full well where this was going. As expected, he ended up sitting on a nearby piece of rebar with the girl as they waited for the entire hero party to be assembled. You even went to a hospital? Yeah, Izuku mumbled. Red hot embarrassment filling his body, it was an E-rank and I was the only one hurt. How could you have gotten hurt that badly in a party? Izuku found himself wishing that he didn't exist at that moment. Here he was, sitting with the drop-dead beauty of a girl and he was spilling his guts over why he was so weak. It was detestable, it was shameful, it was just straight up horrify. Midoriya, Yeyarazu's concerned tone dragged him back to the present and he shook his head. Sorry, it's been a long day and I haven't managed to snag any coffee yet. He chuckled lightly in an attempt to ease her mind, but her gaze only grew more concerned. I swear, it's nothing. I'm fine. Yeyarazu finally nodded, giving up her immediate concern for him and instead choosing to ask, Why do you even want to be a hero? Of course, it was only Izuku's luck that a change of topic would draw him back into that pit of shame and disappointment. Earlier that day, since you're all third years, I think it's time for you to seriously take a look at your future and think about what you want to become. Izuku held his head low to his desk as his middle school teacher spoke. I'll be passing out the handouts now, but... The man threw the papers into the air. You're all pretty much planning to go into the hero course aren't you? The class screamed yes, in affirmation and Izuku meekly raised his hand alongside them. He might have already been able to do hero work with his permit, but Izuku didn't dream of merely staying at the bottom of the ladder. He wanted to climb as high as possible and reach his favorite hero, All Might. To do that Izuku needed to go to the very best hero school, Yue Hai. Izuku realized the rest of his class was staring at one Katsuki Bakugo. He didn't need to hear the rest of the conversation to know that the blonde was bragging about how he was totally going to enroll at UA and get accepted for sure. He had been like this since childhood and showed no signs of changing anytime soon. The teacher nodded as he looked at his papers. Oh, it looks like Midoriya wants to go to UA as well. Izuku attempted to bury his head further into his desk, but the attention of his peers drew it back up. You can't get into UA's hero course just by studying. Yeah, a quirkless E rank like you stands no chance of getting admitted. H hang on. Izuku tried to break through their wall of shouts. They abolished that rule. T there's just no precedent ah. Izuku was flung back as Bakugo slammed his palm down on his desk. A mini explosion sending him flying backwards into the wall. Listen here you quirkless loser. Bakugo shouted. You'll never make anything of yourself. You're below even the rejects. So why don't you just take a nosedive off a building? Bakugo. The teacher said calmly. We don't accept that sort of talk here. 
Izuku didn't bother to mention that the teacher had only spoken up after Bakugo had made his point. Grinning arrogantly, Bakugo took his seat once more, a final, worthless, thrown over his shoulder at Izuku. Present time. Worthless, huh? Izuku murmured to himself as he looked up to the partially constructed building, wondering if he should just make the climb now and save everyone the trouble. But Yeyarazu's calming hand on his shoulder dislodged the bleak thought from his mind. He had a responsibility to his mother, he couldn't leave just yet. Midoriya, you keep spacing out. Yeyarazu suddenly blanched and hopped off the beam before bowing. Forgive me, I've caused you discomfort with my question. Izuku waved her concern away with a wide smile. Nah, it's nothing. I just want to become a hero for the fun of it. I think I'd die of boredom if I didn't have this job to keep me company. Yeyarazu looked like she wanted to say something else. But a nearby, alright, let's get this show on the road. Cut her off. Looking over, Izuku saw their raid leader standing at the ready and pushed himself to his feet. Clenching his fist, he steeled his nerves. Time to prove my worth. You say you do this for fun, but if you keep having fun, you're going to end up dead. Yeyarazu complained as she used her unique quirk to create bandages that she wrapped around Izuku's injuries after spilling some potion over them. Yeyarazu technically wasn't a healer hero, but her ability to create medical supplies and healing potions that no one else could make from her mana made her a vital asset to any raid she was a part of. Izuku shrugged, sorry, Midoriya, the way you fight, it's awful, you put yourself in danger so readily, without any concern for yourself. Yeyarazu looked directly into his green irises, what is the real reason behind not quitting your job as a hero? Izuku looked down at the small crystal in his hand, the villain core was likely the only money he would make off this raid. It was a tiny E-rank piece, barely enough to keep him afloat. I just want to be a hero I guess, save people and all that, Izuku said as he thought back to that one catchphrase, that one internet clip of a certain hero rescuing hundreds from Kala Island as the S-rank gate emerged. His reasoning wasn't necessarily a lie. Izuku relished the thought of being able to save people from the rampant villain gates that appeared without a band. But of course, that was just a dream, this was reality. And in reality, Izuku was a hero because it was the fastest way for someone like him to make money, to both take care of himself and his mother's medical bills. Obviously, Izuku hated handing out that factoid. He was already weak and struggling as it was, he didn't want to bring any more shame upon himself by asking for handouts. Hey everyone, Kaido Atachi, the raid leader, shouted out, listen up for a moment. With a jet black katana resting on his shoulder, he certainly fit the image of a warrior. Even with his wrinkled appearance, since the gate hasn't closed yet, it looks like the boss is down this tunnel. Since none of us are employed by any hero agencies, it's up to us if we want to take this thing on. He nodded solemnly at some of the cautious glances he was receiving. It's going to be dangerous, so we could always just wait for the more skilled heroes to come in and kill this thing. On the other hand, our profit margin will go way down. So, I have a proposal. The seventeen of us will take a vote. And no matter what the result, no complaining when we're done. Two of Kaido's old buddies immediately agreed. Then two other heroes voted against continuing. Eventually, the final two votes came down to Izuku and Yeyarazu. I I don't want to go. Yeyarazu stuttered out, one hand grasping her arm. Hum, Kaido acknowledged, eight to eight. Which just leaves one. All eyes focused in on Izuku who fidgeted under their gaze for a moment as he looked down the boss's tunnel. It was claustrophobia inducing. Roughly made from stone, and likely had a deadly villain at the end that was willing to kill them without hesitation. But, stealing his nerves, Izuku met Kaido's eyes, I'm going. Just one last time, for my mother, for us. Izuku wrung out his hands nervously as he stole a glance at Yeyarazu. Hey, I'm sorry about forcing you to come by voting yes. I'm fine, you don't need to worry about me. Her eyes were hidden by her bangs and her tone was anything but fine. Are you, really okay? Yeyarazu exploded like Izuku had never seen before, no. Of course not. Are you crazy? If that stab had been just an inch higher, you would have had a hole in your heart. Not to mention all the other wounds I had to patch up. What even made you say yes? Did you hit your head too? Sorry, Izuku mumbled. Once again, she's right and once again, I'm in her debt. Are you sorry? Yes. Yeyorazu heaved out a sigh, sufficed with her rant. Then if you're really sorry, maybe you can pay me back by having some lunch with me. Izuku was stunned silent for a moment. Until Yeyarazu spun around and locked eyes with him, thankfully missing his blush in the darkness of the cave. What, do you not want to eat with me? Yeyarazu asked with mock offense. And no, Izuku said a little too forcefully. That's not it at all. I, hey, Kaido yelled out. I think this is the boss's door. It was a tall, two-door entrance, blue with gold trims and detailing. Its handles were the old-fashioned type of door knockers. Two simple massive rings to pull the thing open. Quietly, so that no one else could hear, Kaido's two friends whispered to each other. Hey, this feels dangerous. It wasn't a question. Yeah, the second man agreed. All right people, Kaido announced. This is it. 
Let's make some money. Resting his palm against the door, he lightly shoved, opening it with next to no resistance. A chill settled against Izuku's spine and for a moment he considered stopping, turning around and running away. But the surrounding heroes convinced him otherwise. Mr. Atachi is one of the most skilled C ranks out there. If he weren't about to turn 60, he could have chosen any hero agency he wanted. We trusted him this far. It only makes sense to keep going. Just like that. Opinion had shifted in Kaido's favor and before he knew it, Izuku found himself stepping cautiously into the dark room, about to throw a fireball into the room to light it. Kaido was nearly blinded by the torches that exploded into existence with blue fire. Oh, while wow. Izuku breathed out as he gazed upon the massive stone-walled room. It was a good 200 feet in diameter. The edges of the room were covered with giant stone statues that stood only five feet apart. The real attraction, however, was at the very back of the room. A king's throne occupied by a statue at least three times the size of the others. Its head was adorned by an odd crown and it seemed to be wearing some sort of robes, like the senators of ancient Greece. I've never seen anything like this. Are we sure this is still a dungeon? Don't be stupid. You think the statues are the enemies. There's nothing else here. Do I really have to repeat myself? They're statues, they don't move. Don't be stupid. Yeyarazu found herself hugging closer and closer to Izuku. It feels like someone's watching us. Come on now miss, don't talk like that. It's only gonna scare the others, Kaido reprimanded. Izuku could help but find himself agreeing with Yeyarazu, even if he was the more inexperienced hero. Mr. Otachi, I think I found something. You should come see this. What the hero had found was by far the most curious thing in the room. Another statue, tucked away besides the massive statue at the back. It was an angel of death, a slab of engraved text held in its bony hands. Hey, isn't that runic? Anyone know it? Yeyarazu quickly volunteered herself, always happy to show off the skills not related to her quirk. Karthan in Temple's Commandments First, worship the Lord. Izuku suddenly shuddered, the same chill he had felt earlier tracing its way down his back. Turning around, he was certain he caught the movement of one of the bigger statue's eyes. Second, praise the Lord. Izuku squinted closely, attempting to discern anything he could from the behemoth carving. Third, prove your face. Those who do not follow these commandments will never return alive. Izuku and many from the rest of the party found themselves jumping in shock as a bang echoed through the apparent temple. Looking over to the source of the sound, Izuku's veins filled with ice, the door had slammed itself shut. For a few crucial seconds, not a sound could be heard, not even the labored breathing of Yeyarazu. Finally, a muscle-bound hero threw his hands in the air, that's it, I'm done with this shit. It was a mistake to even come here. Enjoy the boss's treasure. Strutting towards the door, he reached out for the ring handles. No, Kaido mumbled at first, his body completely tensing up, don't touch it. The distinctive screeching of stone on stone filled everyone's ears and then, a simple W-H-O-O-S-H-I-N-G of air. Just like that, their party member was dead and in his place. Stood one of the stone statues, his mace extended out and covered in crimson blood. It moves. Yeyarazu squeaked out, her legs beginning to shake. Wait, if that one moves. Then, Izuku's head swiftly whipped around to face the king. He hadn't moved a muscle, but his eyes were glowing bright orange and staring down the helpless teen. Oh, God. The second those glowing eyes swiveled around to stare down Izuku, he vowed to himself that he would throw away his beginner's badge if he ever made it home and wait until he could get one legitimately from school. Why did this urge suddenly come upon him? It was the realization that he experienced near death far too many times for a 15-year-old. Getting separated from his party once and getting slashed down the back. Getting lost and nearly starving to death, and at least 20 other brushes with death. But it was those very same experiences that saved his life. He had known the Reaper long enough to see its finishing blows coming from a mile away. Izuku wrapped his arms around Yeyarazu and tackled her to the ground as he screamed to the rest of the party, Get down. Izuku's entire world exploded with heat and light as pure beams of magical energy shot out of the king's statue's eyes, digging a furrow into the chamber's floor. The attack lasted mere seconds, if even that, but to the party, it felt like they were pinned against the floor for minutes. When the beam finally shut off and some semblance of peace returned to the room, Izuku pulled himself off of Yeyarazu, who had both hands clamped over her ears and tears streaming down her face. Yeyarazu, Miss Yeyarazu, are you oh? A shrill scream cut him off and he turned back to see a charred hand laying on the floor, the only remains of whomever the king had struck. Don't stand up, Kaido shouted, just remain in your positions. As soon as he saw that everyone had acknowledged him, he began crawling his way over to Izuku, many of the party noticing he was only using his right arm. Izuku was too busy making sure Yeyarazu was okay to notice the older man until he placed his hand on the teen's shoulder. Mr. Otachi, Izuku began, but Kaido cut him off. Miss Yeyarazu can't handle these sorts of situations too well, which is why she can only enter E or D-ranked dungeons, even as an A-rank hero. 
This, this certainly isn't an E or D rank. We only lived because of you. Oh, really? Wait. Kaido gave Izuku an incredulous gaze. I thought you called out cause you knew that would happen. Izuku shook his head sheepishly, and no. I just knew it was dangerous. He trailed off as his eyes traced their way to Kaido's left arm. Sir, your arm, from just above where the elbow should have been, was a bleeding stump. Kaido grinned in spite of the situation. I'm fine. Just help me stop the bleeding, will ya? There, Izuku said as he tightened the bandages around the swordsman's remaining arm. That's as good as it's gonna get. Hey Midoriya, what rank do you think that thing is? I'm not sure. I've never been in a raid any more difficult than a D rank. Kaido nodded. I've been in a B rank maybe once or twice and even there, there was nothing like this thing. It's A, no, maybe even S rank. Izuku briefly considered his surroundings. Those commandments, worship the Lord, praise the Lord, and prove your faith. That's in reference to some sort of God, right? He looked right back into those horrific glowing yellow eyes. I think, that's the God. Kaido scowled as he gripped his bleeding stump. Is that going to be okay? The bleeding won't stop. Well, there's not much we can do about it right now is there? He scoffed. I thought we'd only need three healers for this raid since it was only D rank. But look at us now. One was killed so brutally nothing remains of his corpse. Another's too shocked to even function. He said nodding at a young man huddled in a corner, crying silently to himself. Even in a rank hero like Yayarazu was unprepared for something like this, which is why none of us should be expecting healing anytime soon. For now, let's just wait until things calm down and then try making a run for it. It won't be easy, but screw that. A voice rang out, drawing everyone's attention to a slim, runner-like, 20-something male, crouched into a sprinter's position. I finally signed on with a big agency, so I ain't dying here. What are you doing? Don't move. But the runner didn't listen and using his superhuman speed, launched off the ground hard enough to crack the brick foundations, heading for the door like a rocket. He never made it. The red-hot energy beamed tore its way through his body, leaving only his smoking feet as the remains. The king's judgment had been passed swiftly and harshly only reinforcing everyone's positions on the ground, while everyone else only continued to panic. However, Izuku got to work thinking, running the only gift he had, his mind. These things could kill us at any time, so why don't they? They aren't acting like some sort of blindly raging villain. The ones at the door only move if anyone gets too close and the king only attacks if someone stands up. It's a pattern. A pattern. Izuku spun around, his eyes locking onto the angel of death holding the commandment slap. There are rules to this place. Huh, Kaido mumbled, then blanched as Izuku made to stand, kid. What the F? It's fine. It won't attack. Kaido made to tackle him, but the look in Izuku's eyes made him take pause. Those aren't the eyes of a man wishing for death, he realized and ever so reluctantly. He allowed Izuku to do whatever it was he was doing. Izuku took a step forward as he rose to full height, attracting the gaze of the king, whose stone orbs lit up with power. But before that power could discharge, Izuku threw himself to the ground and the glow dimmed, confirming his theory. Everyone, bow down to the statue. What the hell? Was the first response. Have you lost your marbles, kid? Kaido grimly looked around. You figured something out. He only attacks when you rise past a certain height. If we bow down low enough, we're safe. It's the first commandment. Worship the Lord literally means bow down to him. This isn't just a gut feeling right. For now. Yeah, Izuku answered as he pressed his forehead against the cool stone bricks. Well, I guess there's not much else to do. One by one, everyone followed Izuku's example, bowing down as low as they could as they faced the king's statue. Even Yeyurazu recovered enough to bow, tears still pouring off her in waves. Eventually, mercifully, the yellow glow in the god's eyes dimmed to nothing, earning glares of relief from the surrounding heroes, only for that relief to fall into sheer terror. The statue's previously unmoving lips parted to form the widest, most sinister smile anyone had ever seen. The only description for the supposed god's smile was demonic. Is it? Is it over? One man asked, standing tall. Wait. No. Look. It's not attacking. It's over. The air became ecstatic as people cheered. We get to live. But Izuku knew better? No. Not yet. It's not done. As if on cue, the statue began to move, its hands gripping the armrests hard enough to crack them and its feet digging into the floor hard enough to make it bend beneath its weight. Don't tell me. We have to fight that thing. Kaido grabbed Izuku with one arm and shook him out of his stunned stupor, Midoriya. Any other ideas would be nice. Stuttering for a moment, Izuku thought on the commandments, T the next one is praise the Lord. Praise it. How on earth can we praise that thing? A man with slicked back hair was the one to step forwards. If it's praising you need, I suppose I could give it a try, he said, pulling out a cross from around his neck. I was a member of the church choir. Taking a deep breath, he closed his eyes and clutched the pendant tightly, walking forwards as he began to recite a prayer. I is it working? I think it's slowing. Wait, Izuku breathed out. You're praying to the wrong god. Unfortunately, 
It was too late, and the man didn't even have his eyes open in time to see the massive stone foot crush him into a blood puddle. Scatter, Izuku latched onto Yeyurazu and began pulling her along, dashing away from the statue as it crushed another victim underfoot, out of the corner of his eye. He was just barely able to make out someone stopping at the edges of the chamber, a stone soldier at their backs. Here should be safe, right? Behind you. The man was cleaved in two before anyone could even blink. That's no god. That's a devil. Izuku frantically thought as he sprinted along, his mind churning through all his knowledge. Behind us walks a murderous lord. In front of us, guards keep the door from being accessed. And in every other direction, we've got even more warriors to keep us penned in with their weapons and instruments. Izuku nearly stopped running. The thought sprung up so violently, instruments? Hang on. If the ones with weapons attack when you get too close, then that means the ones with instruments. Get to a statue with an instrument. Izuku screamed out, hoping to anyone that would listen that he wasn't dooming the rest of the party. Kaido was the first to reach one, which almost immediately began playing out a solemn methodical tune. The ones with instruments don't attack. Several others died as they picked their way to one of the more musically inclined killer statues. But Izuku didn't have time to worry about anyone else as he and Yeyarazu came to a stop next to one with drums. But even as Izuku urged it on, it wouldn't start playing. Why? Looking around, he noticed that the only thing different about theirs was the number of people. Recognizing that only one person could sit safely at each statue, he tore himself away from Yeyarazu and began sprinting as fast as his legs would carry him. Stay there. You'll be fine. His theory was confirmed as a steady drumbeat started up behind him, signaling Yeyarazu's safety while he made for the final instrument, the harp. Suddenly, a shadow passed over him and Izuku's instincts took over, causing him to dive forwards, the god's foot crashing down just behind him, sending him flying through the air and skidding across the ground. No, not that way. Izuku looked up just in time to see himself sliding towards a warrior armed with only a shield. The step of the giant had thrown him off and now, he was at the mercy of the mortar guardian. Digging his feet in, Izuku slowed his slide just as the shield was brought down, kicking up a cloud of dust and debris and sending an intense pain rocketing up his leg. His breathing was labored, and his body was bloodied, but his will was barely dented and the desire for life outweighed his pain as he crawled, bit by bloody bit to the final statue. Izuku grabbed onto that thin string of fate and hauled himself those last feet, his body collapsing just as the soft melodies of the harp and the womanly voice rang out. All the instruments and melodies meshed together to form one of the most horrifically beautiful songs Izuku had ever heard. It was also apparently enough to calm the wrath of the god, who calmly retreated to his seat and sat down. The evil grin still spread across his face. Izuku's vision grew dim as he attempted to focus on Yeyarazu, who was desperately sprinting for him. Huh, where'd all this blood come from? Oh, my leg's gone. It only took about a minute for Izuku to come back to consciousness. But in that time, a new development had taken place. Yeyarazu was clutching her stomach over Izuku's mangled stump, spitting up bits of blood. Her mana exhaustion was beginning to take a toll on her for certain. She'll be fine. One of the remaining six brushed off. At least she's alive. That's something eleven of our party can't say. And now we've got two gravely injured, Kaido said, glancing down at his own arm. Suddenly, Kaido's one remaining buddy from their glory days, Ryoji, turned venomous, spitting out, Yeah, it's a shame you lost your arm, but none of this would have happened if you hadn't acted rashly and rushed in here. Yeah. Behind them, the god statue raised its hands from its position on the chair, a stone piece rising from the ground as he did so. Circular in nature, it came up to just about Izuku's chest. The hell is that thing? Tan, Alter, Izuku answered weakly, his body trembling from the blood loss. You know, the ones where they sacrificed living beings to their lord as a show of their faith. Pigs, cows, sheep, virgins. And the last commandment is, prove your faith. Then I think we all know who should be the offering, Ryoji said as he leveled his sword at Kaido. Who brought us here? Eleven people are dead now because of you. Take responsibility for your actions. Izuku weakly raised his hand, sir. That's too harsh. You shut up and stay still. He's right, Kaido admitted, all the light having gone from his eyes, I'll do it. With that, the man turned on his heel and stumbled off to the altar as Izuku desperately attempted to get up. Midoriya, your wounds are still bad. We all voted to come here. It's nothing but a coward's ploy to blame him now. But no matter how he struggled, Izuku could make it to his feet, and Kaido reached the altar. Magically, a yellow and orange flame burst into existence at the circumference of the altar. What now? Kaido stared down Midoriya once more. Hey, is this not what we're supposed to do? Izuku, barely awake, did his best to think. None of the statues are moving, even though something did happen. Do they not approve of the offering? Or maybe, I, I need someone to help me to the altar. Ryoji blanched. Are you crazy? It'll probably be fine. He didn't have the energy to create any convincing comforts any longer. Upon reaching the altar with two people helping him, 
Izuku watched three more flames spring to life around the altar, so that's how it is. Getting Kaido's attention he asked, Do you think the heroes will come get us if we just wait here? Shaking his head, Kaido answered, Today marks the seventh day this thing has been open. Those guys will be moving before reinforcements show. They neglected this gate because it's only deranked. Nothing new for the agencies. Izuku clenched his teeth, remembering Mount Lady's fight just the other day. These things getting out into the world would be total chaos. Was that just yesterday? It feels like that was weeks ago. Looking over his shoulder, he met Yeyarazu and Ryoji's eyes. You two should come over here too. It looks like the trial only starts when all the flames are lit, so we need everyone up here. With a little hesitation, all six remaining party members made it up to the altar and all six flames were lit, starting the final trial as Izuku had expected. Lines of bright blue energy shot out from the altar's center, each line creating its only blue flame at a much wider circumference. But the energy didn't stop there. It raced past the flames and ran up the statue's legs, making them look more like futuristic robots than statues. And then, the door opened. What? Does that mean we can leave? No, Kaido shouted. It's likely just a trap. All at once, every single armed statue sprung to life and began taking slow methodical steps towards the ground. No 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 no. Izuku, even from his brain addled status, recognized something odd going on from his position leaning against the altar. Whenever he looked at one, it stopped. Don't take your eyes off of them. They stop moving if we look at them. Ever so gently, Izuku pulled Yeyarazu's hands down from her eyes. We need you too. Doing their best to make a circle. Everyone put their backs to the altar and switched their gazes back and forth between the statues, slowing them. But not everyone was willing to abide by such a simple rule. With a sudden and shrill shriek, the girl who had helped Izuku over suddenly started sprinting for the door, making it past the advancing line of soldiers, making it through the door. What? How? She made it through. Midoriya. How is this possible? The door closed a little bit when she made it through, and her flame disappeared, which confirms the red flames are linked to the number of people. But the blue flames keep disappearing, even though no one else has left. Izuku shook his head, it's a trap, a false hope. The final commandment is to prove your faith, to remain strong even against temptations. If we can just let this timer run out, we'll get to live. What timer? But before Izuku could answer Ryoji's question, the other man who had helped Izuku limp over to the center of the room went pale, I'm sorry, I can't stay either. Wait ugh. The man pushed past Izuku as he went dashing for the door, knocking him down in the process and making it through. No one else move. Izuku screamed with all his might. If anyone else leaves we won't have enough people to look at the statues. We will die. Kaido was starting to become more panicked as the warriors got closer and closer. Midoriya. What is this? We just have to stay alive until the blue flames disappear. Those are the timers. When all the blue flames are gone, we win. Are you sure? Ryoji asked solemnly. Do you know for certain that once the blue flames are gone that the door won't just close forever? Izuku wasn't, but the sudden realization stunned him into silence. I never expected someone like you to be so helpful to be honest. I always found myself looking down on someone weak like yourself. But, because of you, I'm still alive. Thank you, Mr. Ryoji. Izuku asked, ice creeping back into his veins. But I'm sorry. Tears began streaming down his face. I've got a family, and I don't want to die. The sound of a sword clattering to the ground was Izuku's only answer as he screamed his throat raw after the man. Thank you. Don't make me laugh. You running from here. You just killed us. As Ryoji passed the threshold of the door, everything suddenly clicked into place. You should both leave, he told Izuku and Yeyarazu. As long as there's one person on the altar, the door won't fully close. You two are young. Miss Yeyarazu, will you please assist Midoriya to the door? Oh of course. Yeyarazu moved to help up Izuku, but her legs almost instantly turned to jelly and she fell to the floor, trembling. W what? I can't. I can't move my legs. Kaido frowned even deeper than he had thought possible. Mana exhaustion. You used far too much trying to heal Midoriya. Izuku's fate dawned on him at that moment. Sir, you should take Yeyarazu and get out of here. I told you I would stay. Then who's going to help Yeyarazu to her feet? Just go. No, Yeyarazu shrieked. I'd rather stay here with you. Izuku chuckled. We said we'd get something to eat after this right? He asked, pulling his E-rank villain core out of his pocket and placing it in Yeyarazu's hands. You eat without me. You can pay me back when I meet you again. The tears started freshly leaking from Yeyarazu in waves. This is no time for jokes. Yukaido delivered a swift chop to the back of her neck, knocking her out cold. As Kaido heaved her up and over his shoulder, Izuku requested, take care of her. Please. The man sniffed back his own tears. Yeah, I will. And with that, he stumbled his way out the door, slamming shut with a resounding thud just behind him. Well, at least it's just me dying. 
He scoffed. Had I known this would happen, I would have gotten myself some insurance. Izuku put every last drop of energy he had in him into standing, scooping up Ryoji's dropped sword as he vowed to himself and the steadily approaching statues. I might as well go out taking one of you with me. Raising the sword, he murmured to the stone deaths, come get me. They did just that and before Izuku could even draw another breath, he found a massive stone spear piercing his side that heaved itself upwards, flinging him into the air and carving him open. Collapsing down onto the top of the altar, Izuku found himself in the worst, most unbearable pain he had ever experienced like someone had poured acid into his veins. No, no, I don't wanna. I don't wanna die. I have family too. All of you, liars, cowards, you left the weakest one behind to die for you. A scimitar was raised high above his body, the sword tall enough to completely bisect Izuku with one swing. If only I had. One more chance. The sword was brought down on him just as the final blue flame popped out of existence and the world froze. What's this? Izuku found himself looking up at some sort of holographic screen with those words printed onto it. You have earned the right to become a player. Will you accept? What's going on? You do not have much time left. If you refuse, your heart will stop 0.02 seconds later. Will you accept? If I accept, then I don't have to die. Yes, this chance. I'll take it. Welcome player. A bright light exploded over Izuku and just as he felt himself losing consciousness, a gently calming hand placed itself over his head and he felt a rush like he had never known. Then, the light eclipsed all, and Izuku slipped into a deep sleep. Izuku gasped as he sat bolt upright in bed, adrenaline pouring into his veins. His eyes dashed around the room, looking for the statues that killed him, but instead, all he found was that of a typical hospital room. Hesitantly, he reached under the cusp of his blankets and with shaking hands, threw them off, expecting to see a stump in place of his leg, but instead, he found himself completely intact. Was, was it all a dream? Just as he went to look at the setting sun through the pane glass window, his door opened and two lanky men came strolling through one with dark hair and another with bleach blonde. It's about time you woke up. I wasn't sure if I could wait another three days. I've, I've been asleep three days. The blonde man answered with a half smile. I'm sorry if we surprised you, but we've been needing some answers. Handing Izuku a card, the two men took a seat on the nearby couch. Japan Hero Agency Inspectors Izuku's blood ran cold for a moment as he realized these were government men. He was too young to have his beginner's license and he wasn't enrolled in any hero schools. He doubted they would overlook this. Chill out, kid. The blonde man said, we've revoked your permit, but you're not gonna be charged with anything. Izuku was stunned into silence. Wasn't illegally obtaining those sorts of IDs a huge deal? I think you've been through enough at your age. The man responded to the silence, and I gotta say, I respect anyone who risks their life for their family. He gave the same tired smile. You're not in trouble, kid. We just want to know what the hell happened. Finally snapping out of his trance Izuku asked, How are Miss Yeirazu and Mr. Otachi doing? They'll live, but the old man's lack of a left arm will likely impede his work. He may end up retiring. As for Yeirazu, she's still being tended to for her mental trauma. The doctors are still unsure if she'll continue. The man scratched his cheek. Other heroes like Ryoji and... No, that's enough. Thank you. Izuku couldn't help but imagine the bloodied scene as Ryoji sprinted out of the room, leaving the rest of them to die with no remorse. The man nodded, his partner finally taking up the conversation. Only six heroes survived that double dungeon. And while heroes put their lives on the line every time they enter a gate, a massacre like this hasn't happened in some time thanks to the ranking system and healers that are standard in most raid parties. As such, it warranted a rather large investigation. However, upon entering the dungeon, both the inspector agency and the hunter agency found nothing. Nothing but you laying on that altar. Every statue was completely absent. T that's impossible. We thought so at first as well. Had any of the testimonies differed in the slightest? Or had we not found some of the deceased's body parts, we would have come up with a different theory. However, as things stand, we believe you may have undergone a double awakening inside that gate. A double awakening. A good 99% of the world's population could be considered heroes. Either during their birth or later on in life, they received their awakening. A blessing of power that was typically accompanied by the standard physical enhancement quirks. Or ever so rarely, a rank B or higher would awaken with a specialized quirk, something like Yeirazu's creation. Even rarer was the double awakening. There are stories of C ranks jumping all the way to a rank or B ranks going all the way to S. We just need you to place your hand on this reader. If your mana is higher than what is recorded on your revoked license, then we can assume you have undergone a secondary awakening. Izuku nodded and somewhat hesitantly placed his hand down on the purple crystal as the man held up a reader. The gem glowed faintly for a few seconds and the man glared disappointedly at the reader. What's it say? Izuku asked. It appears that we were wrong for suspecting you. 
The two men stood and gathered their things. Our apologies for disturbing you, good luck on your recovery. Without another word, they left Izuku alone with his thoughts once more. Nothing huh? Then, does that mean they can't see this? Izuku pondered as he stared up at the holographic screen. You have unread mail. How on earth do I use this thing? Izuku had been trying to tap at it for about ten minutes now to no avail. Not a touch screen I guess. Hum, he wondered out loud. Maybe. Read mail. Nothing happened. Open inbox. The screen flashed suddenly and Izuku felt like cheering with his success. It had reacted to a very specific wording. Meaning that it wasn't just some hallucination, whatever this was, it was real. If he fails to obey the system's orders, there may be a penalty. Your rewards have arrived. This is weird. Izuku whispered to himself as he sat in bed, looking over the messages. Has arrived. Uh, check. The screen disappeared and in its place, a long list of objectives popped into existence. Push-ups. Incomplete curl-ups. Incomplete curl-ups. Incomplete squats. Incomplete running. Warning. Failure to complete this daily quest will result in a punishment associated with this quest. Izuku smiled. This is a joke right? Someone in the hospital doesn't have the energy for this. I'll take a look at it. Izuku flopped back in bed. After I get some sleep. Unbeknownst to the teen, as he slept, the clock displayed at the bottom of the quest turned different colors, going from green to yellow to red as time passed. Eventually, the timer ran out and a slight ringing noise filled Izuku's ears, waking him from his slumber. As his eyes cracked open, he was almost flung out of bed by an intense earthquake. What the hell? Izuku whimpered out the last part as he found his hands digging not into the bed's mattress, but into a sandy dune. A desert. Izuku's heart sank as he saw a huge shadow beginning to loom over him. His head turned around at a snail's pace, his eyes meeting that of a six-eyed centipede, just above the massive creature's head. Izuku could make out the words, Poison Fang Giant Sand Centipede. Izuku's eyes went wide as another window popped up in front of him. Goal, survive until time runs out. Time required, 4 hours. Time remaining, 3 hours, 59 minutes, and 57 seconds. You're okay kidding, right? The creature roared in response and he began running for his life. Izuku didn't have the focus or mental fortitude to even guess at how much time was left. He had been too busy avoiding the giant centipedes that chased him throughout the open expanse of the sandy plains. It could have been three hours. It could have been fifteen minutes for all he knew. Time lost meaning when the only thing that was keeping you going was adrenaline. His breathing heavy, Izuku began to wonder how much longer he could keep himself going. The three centipedes practically nipping at his heels. Every muscle in his body was screaming for mercy, but he had none to give. Taking one last look back, he noticed the closest of the villains were literally inches away and he gave one last scream of defiance before. He fell to the hospital floor, covered in sand. On his hands and knees, shaking from exhaustion, he looked up. Your rewards for the penalty quest have arrived. Would you like to accept? Izuku had just enough time to read the screens and mumble, huh, before his body gave out and he passed into unconsciousness once more. Four days later, nurses watched from the windows as Izuku Midoriya sprinted around the hospital circumference, his shirt soaked through with sweat. How long has he been running? Shouldn't he be resting? Not sure. But the doctors say that active heroes are quicker to recover, so I'm sure he'll be fine. Just as he made it to the hospital courtyard, Izuku finally collapsed onto a nearby bench, his 10 kilometers running goal reached. He smiled as his system windows popped up. Rewards for his daily quest. Inventory to store his reward items, and his status screen to display his stats. Just like a game, he murmured to himself, careful not to draw the attention of any nearby people. As he learned immediately after waking up from his desert run, the daily quests provided him with three rewards, status recovery, three stat points, and one random gift box. The status recovery was the first he accepted due to his exhaustion. It was like he had never been tired or injured in the first place. The random box had given out some sort of key at first, but from there on out only gave out little trinkets like pens, which he thought was pretty lame next to the stat points reward or status recovery. Strength, vitality, agility, intelligence, sense. All of them could be upgraded with these stat points and so far, Izuku had put all 12 of his that he had gotten from the daily quests into strength. The difference wasn't hugely noticeable, but Izuku knew that it was having an effect on his stamina. Um, he raised his eyebrows as he looked over the description for the random key he had gotten. Maybe I should give this thing a go. Item, Dungeon Key. Item Class, E. Type, Key. A key that allows you to create an instance dungeon. You may use this at the third entrance of Tatooine Station. Taking a one-day leave from the hospital was easier than Izuku expected it to be. He was completely ready to argue with a nurse that he was fine. But much to his surprise she simply smiled and gave him permission, wishing him luck with his business. From there, it had only taken Izuku half an hour to end up at the subway entrance, grass green key in hand, instance dungeons, inventory, stat points, all of this. Is it part of a double awakening? 
or is it the lead up to my double awakening? He smirked, the weakest E-rank hero receiving a double awakening. I'm sure that we get a chuckle out of some people, getting his serious face on. Izuku readied the key. I'm confident in my ability to run, so if things get too dicey, I can just run away. With that, Izuku stabbed the key into the air. Blue lightning sparking around him as a blue gate appeared before him and he stepped through, determined to become stronger. Izuku took a moment to consider the crackling energy in front of him before stepping forwards, passing the threshold and beginning the descent into the dungeon. As soon as he did, he heard a sound that was akin to water freezing over. Spinning around, he saw the gate dispersing from its swirling portal form and instead hardening into that of a bright blue wall. Izuku slammed his fist against it, finding that it was just as solid as it looked. Hey, he screamed, hoping to earn some attention, but no one seemed to hear him. The signature sound of heels on concrete made him spin around to see a girl walking up the stairs towards him. Are you okay? He asked, worried that he had just trapped some stranger inside a gate. But she didn't respond, instead choosing to ignore him as she walked straight through the wall, as if it wasn't even there. Wah, is this, some other dimension? Warning, you cannot exit this dungeon. Either kill the boss or use a hearthstone. Izuku paled. Just a week ago, I was struggling with E-ranked dungeons, and now, this thing seriously expects me to clear a dungeon. Without a party, with every passing moment, Izuku's nerves frayed further and further. He had been walking through the subway station for around 15 minutes now, not a living thing in sight. The subway was no longer the same beautiful underground railway system that Izuku remembered from his previous trips to Tatooine Station. Instead, it looked abandoned and decayed, as if it was from a post-apocalyptic novel. Damn, coming here was a mistake. He lamented as a heavy stench filled his nose, like wet dog times a hundred. Suddenly, every nerve in Izuku's body went into overdrive, shouting at him to move. Unable to perceive the threat any further, Izuku simply dove forwards, narrowly dodging the loud metallic snap that echoed behind him. Swiftly recovering, Izuku turned around, his eyes widening at the massive red wolf that had emerged from an alleyway. Steel surrounded the bottom of his mouth, silver fangs poking up to mix with the gleaming white teeth. It's got a name. Most villains had obtained some nickname or title from heroes, such as giants, goblins, or even slimes depending on how severely mutated they were. But Izuku had never heard of a villain with a specific name, much less one that looked perfectly like a wolf. Is this a real villain, or is the system creating it for me? Maybe it has to do with the fact that this is a special dungeon. Sizing up the creature, Izuku noticed the name hovering just above its head was colored red. It held his interest for just a moment before he came back to reality. His name meant nothing if Izuku couldn't kill it. As the wolf's hackles began to stand on end, Izuku tried to move, but found that his legs were frozen in place, entangled by a veil of fear. I can't move. The wolf launched forwards, its metal maw ready to snap shut. The sudden movement seemed to shock Izuku into motion and he sidestepped the wolf, his arm far too close to the vice grip that closed around where his head had been moments earlier. Stumbling backwards, he noticed the wolf wasn't letting up and before Izuku could even fathom a response, it bit right next to his face, coming mere inches from killing him. Instincts took over Izuku's body in that instant and he planted his palms on the wolf's body, vaulting off of him like a gymnast, flipping end over end. Izuku did a one-handed handstand hand as he landed, pushing off it once more to land on his feet. Unfortunately, he didn't expect the heavy momentum that caused him to continue forwards until he had rolled onto his back and his feet slammed into the wire gate of a closed and ruined storefront. My body feels light. He firmly planted both hands on the ground as he looked at the wolf from his upside-down position and pushed off, launching into the air and landing just to the right of the wolf's face. His fist clenched. Izuku felt power coursing through him like nothing he had ever experienced before. I just barely got my life back. I refused to lose it like this. The strike was so powerful. Izuku wasn't even sure if he had seen it. All he knew was that his punch had sent the wolf flying through the air, crashing into another storefront. Izuku was stunned, absolutely and completely befuddled. The sudden power coursing through his veins was like a lightning bolt. It was liberating, it was freeing, and it was intoxicating. As the wolf, mostly unharmed, extracted itself from the wall, Izuku wasted no time dashing forwards, delivering another swift uppercut. This time, however, the wolf was ready for it and Izuku had to bring his left fist down on its head just to avoid the bite that followed. The high that he had just experienced with his new power almost completely disappeared as Izuku realized that while he was indeed stronger, his simple punches would do nothing to kill his enemy. No backup, no healers, but I do have this. Izuku reached forwards as he shouted, Inventory. His hand plunged into the glowing screen and he could feel the cool leather grip of a steel sword as his fingers grasped for his salvation. Withdrawing the magic sword Ryoji had wielded in the double dungeon, Izuku swung forwards, cleaving the wolf that was flying through the air in two, collapsing behind him in a bloody puddle. You have defeated Steel Fang Raken. You have leveled up. 
I'm pretty sure I overheard Ryoji say he bought this sword for 260,000 yen. I'm too poor to ever afford touching it. But for now, Izuku looked over his shoulder as the telltale growls of the steel fangs filled his ears. I think I'll be using this sword. Izuku was resting on the ground, his back against a pillar as he looked through his status screen, three dead wolves keeping him company. So every time I level up, all my stats increase by one, plus the three stat points I earn from the daily quest. Him, I guess hunting villains and leveling up would be the most worthwhile way to earn points. Looking over his strength, he realized that thanks to his leveling and daily quest points, it had only gone up 10 points. And yet, Izuku felt far stronger with 20 points than he had with 16, which could only mean the growth is exponential. He shrugged to himself and stood. Well, at least I know now. I know that even someone like me can get stronger. A dozen or so pairs of glowing red eyes peeked out at him from shadows and Izuku smiled. You don't scare me. After all, I've already died once before. Izuku refused to go down. Horde after horde of the steel fangs appeared before him. Slashed, hacked, and severed by Izuku's steadily dulling blade. They fell before him. You have leveled up. He moved faster than he ever had before. You have leveled up. His strength was like nothing he had ever experienced before. You have leveled up. And this was more blood than he'd ever seen in his whole life. You have gained the title of Wolf Slayer. From now on you will gain 40% increased stats when fighting beast-type villains. The floor was littered with dozens of corpses, every single one decapitated or completely cleaved in two. Upon picking through their bodies, Izuku finally realized why he hadn't found any villain cores in the previous wolves. Instead of cores, they dropped items, once again, akin to an RPG game. Izuku pulled open his inventory to tally up his haul so far. 34 wolf fangs, traveler's clothes, two worn daggers, and most importantly, a hearthstone. Now with the option to escape the dungeon, Izuku felt about 10 billion times safer. But as he gripped the softly glowing stone in his hand, he weighed the pros and cons of running. On one hand, he was alone, and his blade was beginning to chip away from where. On the other hand, he might never get the same easy chance to level up like this ever again. Shoving his hearthstone back into the inventory, Izuku managed to accidentally pull up a separate tap. A store. He smiled. Man, this thing has everything. Gold. Izuku wasn't sure if the fangs could be used for anything else, although considering the game elements, it was possible. However, his status as a poor teenager was a little more than overwhelming. If this gold was convertible to real-life currency, he might be able to worry less about his own expenses. Sell 17. 340 gold poured into his account and he went to check the purchasing side of the store, only to receive a curious message. You are not high enough level to access the shop. Please return when you are at a higher level. How polite. Izuku joked to himself as he hefted his sword onto his shoulder and continued deeper into the special dungeon. Every kill, every attack, made the next just a little bit easier. Izuku once again felt himself referring to this dungeon as a game. Unlike normal dungeons, the villains respond and continued launching themselves at him. It was thanks to this that Izuku had learned their pattern. As he leaned on his sword like a cane in an attempt to catch his breath, he felt one presence above him and one to his right. Monkey above, cat to the right. Reversing his current grip on his sword, his heaved it out of the ground and spun it around, practically letting the monkey-like villain fall onto the blade as the green-haired teen slashed diagonally downwards, decapitating the cat before it even knew that he was in motion. Looks like the progress has slowed, Izuku noted as he looked over a bisected wolf. The name tag had changed from a deep orange to a white color. Maybe it's because they're too weak for me now. They're not giving me the experience needed to level up anymore. But, Izuku mumbled out loud, even with my current strength, I'm not sure I can take whatever's sitting down there. His skin erupted with goosebumps as he stared down the dark set of steps. No question about it, that down there is the boss. He knew his sword couldn't take much more and his growth had already slowed, so he decided that he would at least take a look at the boss before deciding to take it on or teleport. Is this really Tatooine Station? Izuku asked himself as he continued down the all-too-long stairs. If I go any further down, I might turn up on the other side of the world. Thankfully, his curiosity was answered as the passageway opened up to a spacious subway boarding platform. But like the rest of the dungeon, it was destroyed and water filled the subway tracks, obscuring a dark form from Izuku's eyes. He only had moments to raise his sword to defend against the shape that shot out of the water, slamming into him and sending him crashing into a nearby pillar, coppery blood leaking into his mouth from the strike. Falling onto his rear, Izuku gasped for breath and his eyes widened at his broken blade. He had attempted to use it to block or slice through the strike, but it was apparently just too much for the worn blade. Now, only about a third of the actual blade remained, jagged at the ends. I thought I had gotten a bit stronger, but your name's still orange. The massive cobra snake hissed at him loud enough for it to be considered more of a roar. 
Its body was about as tall as Izuku was. Izuku reversed his grip on the sword, holding it more like a dagger as he stared down the beast. I guess you're the final boss. Just one more kill, and then I can finally get some rest. Izuku said to himself as he put every last bit of energy he had into his legs and he shot forwards, dragging his stump of a blade along Rasaka's middle section. He only earned a metallic scraping noise and sparks for his effort, prowling right back at the cobra. Izuku put his back into the effort and struck several more times, rushing along its length to avoid any attacks. Unfortunately, this tactic only lasted about five seconds. Rasaka got bored with the pesky human scratching his sides and his body pivoted rapidly, slamming the hero to the ground, then to the side, then back to the ground. Izuku's old wounds found themselves reopening as the scales slashed him back and forth, taking more and more of his life force with each passing second. How much more? How much farther do I have to go to escape my past as the weakest? Izuku parried away Rasaka's fangs with his own blade, narrowly avoiding the huge drops of poison falling from it. Strength, Izuku cursed it. No matter what you do, strength is all that matters. I could be the most intelligent man on the planet and still lose to this thing. I could be the richest man on earth and still be powerless, even if you're wise or knowledgeable, or if you receive thanks. In front of strength, it all means nothing. Izuku stood once more, throwing his broken blade to the side. I came here to become strong, to throw away the title of weakest. As the boss slithered towards him at a cautionary pace, Izuku's fists opened, making it look like he was going to grapple with it barehanded, my classmates. He screamed, Bakugo's face appearing in his mind, my friends. Yairazu came to the forefront of his thoughts, everyone. They all look down on me. Some give me pity. Some scorn me. Some are even embarrassed by me. Red hot rage coursed through his veins. Compared to that statue, you're nothing. You don't scare me at all. So come on. Rasaka roared back, his neck snapping forwards to eat Izuku whole, but he found nothing. He was not in possession of the knowledge that Izuku's only skill before reawakening was his ability to dodge and run. From his position in the snake's blind spot, Izuku wrapped his arms halfway around its neck, digging in his fingers as far as they would go. I put all my points into strength. If it's that much, then I know I can kill you with nothing but my bare hands. Rasaka began to flail as Izuku's insane pressure crushed his windpipe dragging his body against the subway's walls. He attempted to shake the young hero loose, but the lack of oxygen was absolutely debilitating. Just, die already. Die, die, die. Izuku screeched out, the walls shaking as the roars of the two warriors mixed. Nurse, yes, doctor. Has Izuku Midoriya returned yet? It's getting quite late. I'm sure he's fine. After all, we were going to discharge him tomorrow. I'm not so sure. The doctor scratched the back of his neck. Have you seen some of the conditions those guys come in with? Completely drenched in blood. Even more damaged than patients that get into severe motor accidents. It's amazing they can stay alive in those conditions. Even so, shouldn't it be considered a miracle they return alive at all? Not at all, the doctor answered. Even the weakest heroes have superhuman abilities. Some are just as monstrous as the villains they face down. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Ha, huh, ha. Huh. Ah, Izuku's heavy breathing slowly morphed into that of a relieved laugh as he sat against Rasaka's still corpse. Haha, <laughs> I guess. I got a bit stronger. You have acquired a weapon. Item, Rasaka's scales. Item class, C. Item type, gauntlet. Attack, plus 33. Powerful gauntlets made from Rasaka's impenetrable scales. Its incredible toughness can inflict a stun debuff and its sharp edges are capable of inflicting the bleed debuff. Effect stun. Attacked foes have a chance to become stunned and unable to attack. Effect Bleed Attacked foes lose 1% of their health every second. Izuku swiftly equipped the gauntlets, reveling in their perfect form-fitting beauty. Their attack power was far higher than even Ryoji's now broken sword. Rasaka also dropped some sort of pouch containing his venom. But Izuku ignored it for the moment, his body too tired to deal with reading any longer. With that, he stood, the ruined subway around him disintegrating away to revert to its cleaner, more modern form of Tatooine Station. Izuku couldn't help but smile at the sight of his home world. But, something felt off. The station was completely empty. It's late, but not that late. Where is everyone? Upon finally making it to the subway's exit, emerging to darkness and rain, he was greeted by a member of the JDF. Hey, what are you still doing out here? Did you not hear the broadcasts? The soldier fixed him with a concerned gaze as Izuku returned his questions with a question of his own. What happened? What? I, the man trailed off, before pointing to his shattered sword and armored gauntlets. Are you a hero? Izuku blanched for a moment. His license had been revoked due to his age and illegal methods to obtain it. He swiftly calmed as he realized this simple ground soldier would have no reason to doubt his answer. His weapons and torn clothing would be pretty convincing evidence. So Izuku answered, uh, yeah. The man suddenly snapped to attention. Ah, uh, forgive me. I will guide you sir. 
Uh, okay. Izuku responded with a raise of his eyebrows, still confused by the situation. Continuing to strut through the city, Izuku was shocked by the amount of destruction. Cars and buildings were torn up and strewn all over the place, covered in villain bodies and blood. A gate opened. Correct, sir. The small fry have been taken care of. Only one larger villain is left. But Izuku already knew that. Much to his surprise, the teen found himself tracing the villain's presence through the air, finding a much denser packet of mana than any of the surrounding villains. Without a doubt, that's the boss. It only took another five minutes for Izuku to begin hearing the sounds of battle. Metal on rock, shouts for healing, strategy calls. The one that stuck out to him most however, was, Hey, I thought you said you were in a rank. I don't care if you're a fighter or not. Do something. Izuku peeked over the crowd that was surrounding the fight against the golem villain, surprised to see Eirazu standing at the rear of the party, her body shivering, but not from the cold. I'm honestly surprised she even came back to hero work. Wait, does that mean they didn't revoke her license? Before Izuku could think on it any further, he looked back to the fight, his eyes widening as the golem grabbed a piece of rock from its body and hurled it at the support group. Two of the three healers were quick enough to dive away, but Yeirazu was stuck in place, her legs too weak to support her own body. The rock filled her vision and she quickly collapsed, fainting into unconsciousness. But while her fellow party members simply watched in shock and horror, Izuku's body was moving before he even knew it. Like a flash of light, he scooped up the rich girl in his arms and raced past the fight, stopping once more just behind the crowd, setting her down gently. He checked her pulse and breathing. She seemed okay. So Izuku picked up his broken sword once more and took a few steps back from the crowd, looking around to make sure no one was watching him. When he was satisfied, Izuku hauled his arm back, the sword gripped like one might hold a spear or javelin. And then, planting his foot hard enough to crack the ground, Izuku threw the blade. It streaked through the sky, tearing through the golem's head like a .50 caliber bullet and practically causing its entire head to implode from the force. Hum, even at a low level like 18 I was able to kill it in one hit. Izuku swiftly brushed away the thought and moved to leave, not wanting to be spotted. But Yeirazu's prone form on the ground stopped him. I'm sure the other heroes will take care of her. Right, remembering the other hero's awful tones, ones that resonated with his own past, he decided against it, he didn't trust anyone that looked down on others. Scooping up the girl took practically no effort at all, and he walked off into the night, seeking out the hospital for refuge. It had been another three days since the fight with Rasaka and Izuku was working out in his hospital room, sweat dripping off him as he continued his push-ups for the day. After reaching the hospital, the nurses assured him Yeirazu just needed some rest and would be fine. Izuku was pretty sure she wouldn't even know that it was him who brought her back. That was fine with him. Anything else would just require more explanation. As he went to finish his 100th push-up, a small knock came from the door. I'm coming I. Izuku stood as fast as he could, going to put on his shirt, but it was too late. The young nurse was immediately smitten with his body. Ah, uh, I'm so sorry. Izuku gave her a warm smile, it's no problem. If anything it's my fault. So, you're being discharged today. Yep, can't wait to finally get out of here. Er, no offense. But the nurse was too busy handing over her phone to take offense, if it's okay with you. Could I have your number? Number, yes, I mean, only if you're okay with it. Is there some test result they need to text me later? But upon handing back the phone, Izuku finally noticed the heavy blush on the young woman's face. Oh, oh, Izuku scratched the back of his head nervously. Have I really changed that much? He hadn't spent much time looking in a mirror lately, but he knew that he looked different. From his perspective, he had just gotten a bit taller, but to any outsider, it looked like the 15-year-old had gone through the most extreme puberty on earth just without the acne or mood swings. He looked less like a teenager now, and more like a young man who had just reached 20. I wonder if she knows how old I am. T thank you. Izuku nodded and wished her goodbye as he began gathering up the few things he had with him. Suddenly, he was overcome with a feeling of dread and anxiety. Oh shit, what do I do if she actually calls me? Jeez Izu, what did they do to you at that hospital? Izuku smiled down at his sister, Sakura. I just worked out a bit while I was recovering. A bit. Her eyes became concerned, like she was worried her brother had been replaced with this far more athletic man. Come on, sis. You're gonna be late for your first day of summer school if you don't hurry up. Izuku lifted her backpack with one hand and underhanded it to her. Although, judging by how heavily she fell backwards in an attempt to catch it, he may have thrown it too far. Sorry, sorry. Sakura was about the same height as Izuku had been before his reawakening, and her hair was a dark black color. Apparently, she got more of their dad's genetics than their mother's. At least, that's what they had been told before their mother had fallen into an eternal sleep. As he waved goodbye to his 12-year-old sister, he sighed. I hope she gets along with the others well. Sakura by all means, was a perfect student, who had no need for summer cram school, especially not for middle school. 
But despite that, she was determined as anyone could possibly be about succeeding academically. As he mused over her education, Izuku found himself looking down at his arms. A few weeks of exercise wouldn't do this to me, much less eight days. Which means the system is doing it. Or maybe it's my stats. Did I put too much into strength? Izuku shook his head as he imagined himself practically overcome with muscle, like one of those disgusting bodybuilders that went too far. Hopefully that won't happen. Plopping down onto the couch, Izuku began skimming through his phone. The UA entrance exam starts in just two months. Am I gonna be strong enough by then? At level 18, Izuku's stats looked as such. Strength, 48. Vitality, 27. Agility, 27. Intelligence, 27. Sense, 27. But he also had another 12 points to distribute. So in an attempt to evenly distribute it he threw 8 into agility, 2 into strength, and 2 into sense. Izuku was able to just kick back and relax for another 7 seconds before his phone started ringing loudly, causing him to sigh once more, I just want a small break. He picked up the phone, this is Izuku Midoriya. It took you long enough to pick up. A voice on the other end screamed, forcing Izuku to pull away from the phone. Uh, I'm sorry Mr. Landlord. I was hospitalized for a bit there, so I wasn't able to pick up. Well, I suppose there's nothing to be done about that. Of course, this month's rent is still due. Oh, right. If you can't make the payment. No no, it's fine. I'll make the transfer soon. Thank you very much. Izuku hung up as he paced through his small apartment, a double awakening. If I'm really a reawakened person then I should be able to make a lot more money. Right, ugh. But people have given me the reputation of the world's weakest, so I can't just start clearing high-ranked dungeons. Otherwise, more malicious eyes might spy down on me for my unique growth. Izuku held a hand to his chin as he thought deeply about his troubles. Maybe. The next day felt oddly nostalgic to Izuku, walking up to a construction site, joining other heroes to clear a gate. Only this time, it was a C rank and Izuku was not the same weak boy he had been just over a week ago. A big burly man in the front of the pack waved him over, this way. Izuku smiled back at the warm expression, but his blood froze over as a warning from the system appeared before him. Beware of lizards. That was the warning Izuku had to brush aside as he stepped forwards to greet the raid leader, taking his hand to shake it. Izuku was surprised by the man's grip, it was so gentle. He almost seemed afraid to hurt Izuku. I'm Natsuo Todoroki. Call me Natsuo. Izuku Midoriya. You're an E-rank correct. Izuku hesitated for just a moment, wondering how it would feel to claim that he was not the weakest for once, but he refrained obviously, yes, that's right. A few snickers and jeers of, the weakest hunter, caught Izuku's ears, but Natsuo quickly put a stop to it and put a reassuring hand on Izuku's shoulder. That's enough, you too. The most important thing is numbers after all. He handed Izuku a slip of paper, like I said over the phone it's a C-rank dungeon, so you'll have to be exempt from fighting. But, in exchange for carrying our equipment and filling our member requirement, I'll pay you 200,000 yen. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal, no? Izuku smiled and agreed, signing the contract immediately. In reality, he was towing a fine line right now. His hunter's license was revoked due to his age, so he was forced to find work that was not distributed through any agencies directly. It was a pain, but it was better than getting in more trouble for doing so. And really, with middle school over and done with and high school just a month or so away, Izuku had nothing better to do than look for this sort of work. Maybe I can apply for some sort of early license? After all, I am going to enroll in UA. Hero schools weren't just for getting your license though, anyone 18 or older could do that. No, hero schools coached the strongest of the upcoming hero generations in using their quirks and awakened abilities to save people, whether it be inside or outside of dungeons. Even nowadays, there are still heroes who use their abilities for criminal activities. These people were labeled villains alongside the monstrous enemies that emerged from gates. Hero schools also served to introduce their students to higher-ranked agencies through things like sports festivals and villain hunting competitions between student heroes. For this reason, places like UA were highly sought after, but only the best of the best could join. Hey don't worry, us small fries have to stick together. Izuku turned his head just to nearly be blinded by the shiny armor of a teenager not too many years older than himself. I'm a D-rank myself, Akira, so I'll make sure to protect you. It seemed like Akira was another newcomer to this raiding party, meaning only two of the ten were random additions. Izuku smiled, partially from amusement, partially from disbelief. What? Are you some sort of millionaire? I've never seen a D-rank with that much stuff. But Natsuo interrupted him before the young man could respond. The equipment is mostly provisions and some first aid materials along with some mining equipment. Nothing too heavy. Izuku tilted his head at first aid. Do you guys not have a designated healer? Natsuo shrugged. You know how hard it can be sometimes to get a healer on an attack force. Healing quirks are far and few between. He gave a gleaming smile. Well, enough of that. Time to get started. 
Izuku found himself surprised to see that Natsuo was actually a mage class despite his massive form. Well, I suppose I shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Mr. Atachi is a mage, but he totally carries himself as a swordsman. Upon entering the gate, Natsuo cupped one hand creating a floating ball of light that hovered just above their party and illuminated the entire cavern. Huh, one of the heroes mumbled. Where are all the villains? There's no lights either. Usually there are just enough luminous stones to see. I ain't heard of a dungeon with no villains. Izuku wanted to tell them to all be quiet as he set his sense stat to work. Villains typically need light to see as well. But even if they didn't they'd have to be intelligent enough to remove all other lighting sources to make it to their advantage of the sound. It's a Namu-type nest. Izuku shouted as the pounding of dozens, if not hundreds of the monstrous villains echoed in his ears. They're above us. The party, including Izuku, dove forwards further into the dungeon in an attempt to avoid the falling black creatures. Mages, bring him down. Natsuo shouted as his arms lit up with flaming energy. Tanks, get their aggro. Izuku watched on with amazement. Their teamwork is flawless. No wonder they don't need a healer. If it had been like this in the double dungeon. Izuku shook his head, dispelling the insane thought. Nothing would have changed. Turning back to the fight, he watched as the villains with exposed brains were cut down one by one with a ruthless brutality. Everyone's doing pretty well, even if they are a bit too rough with it, but... Izuku sighed as one of the smaller black creatures rushed at him, its hands extended like claws. The d rank monster didn't even see the kick coming and its head was blown off before it knew it. They're not really trying to protect their porter. I don't need it, but they don't know that. He thought to himself as he dispatched another Namu discreetly. Maybe it has to do with that warning the system gave me earlier. Within the next 10 minutes, the horde had been cleared and the group began working to pull all the villain cores from the corpses. As the rest of the party did that, Natsuo turned to Izuku, Man, you really saved us there. How'd you know they were coming? Izuku shrugged, I guess I just felt it. You've got some pretty sharp senses. He turned away as one of the other mages called for him. It's great that everyone was taken care of thanks to you. But don't stress the small stuff too much. Izuku squinted his eyes and tilted his head as Natsuo strutted off. Don't stress the small stuff. While Natsuo and a few of his party members crouched over one of the Namu corpses, Izuku felt a chill go down his spine. He looked around, but there were no more gnomus, which meant this feeling was coming off of his party members, whispering to the one with the expensive armor. You should be wary. What? If that equipment is as expensive as I think it is, then just keep your eyes peeled. Izuku had never known his premonitions to be wrong. Even before his reawakening, he was an expert at sensing danger. So, if he knew that these men were dangerous, why was he continuing onwards with them? To be honest with himself, Izuku wasn't sure in the slightest. Is it my need for cash? Am I just addicted to danger? Or maybe, maybe some part of me is calling out, telling me there's some sort of opportunity here. These were the thoughts that coursed through his mind after the group had stopped for a lunch break. It was infuriating to not know his own reasoning behind it, but Izuku continued on nonetheless, completely calm somehow. Wait, Natsuo called out as he suddenly stopped, causing one of the smaller members to slam into his back, banging their head on his armor. Oh, this might be it, he exclaimed while conjuring another ball of light in his hand, revealing a truly arachnophobic scene. Hundreds of Namu hung in web cocoons, partially eaten and torn apart. The culprit thankfully nowhere to be seen. It's the boss room, that's for sure. Izuku couldn't help but agree. The energy he was getting off the hallway was akin to what he felt from Resaka, only stronger. After only a few minutes of walking through the steely spindle, Izuku began to see the dull glow of bright blue mana crystals. Then, they made it to the cavern almost blinded by the asinine amount of brilliant crystals lining the walls. Just at a first glance, I can say these would be worth nearly 5 million yen. Hey hey, another one of the party members called out to Natsuo. If it's that much, you might even be able to make your younger brothers jealous. This earned him a punch to the arm and a scolding. You idiot, don't speak of his brothers so lightly. Natsuo ignored the comments. All right, well before we get started on mining these things, there's one thing we need to take care of. He pointed off to the back of the cavern where a massive spider was nestled into its webs. Of course, since a gate closes once the boss is defeated, we'll have to mine these all first before killing the boss. Ren, did you bring the mining equipment? Sorry, but who'd have expected a C-rank dungeon to hold all this? Natsuo smiled even as he said, Well this is troublesome. Hey, why don't you two stay here and guard this area while we go back and grab the mining equipment? Akira nodded assuredly before Izuku could even speak up and mention that there were plenty of pickaxes stuck in his backpack. It's been sleeping even through all our shouts so I'm sure it'll be fine. Good. Natsuo smiled eagerly. We'll be back soon. All eight members of the party began making their way out. And Akira went to lean against a wall in preparation for the wait. But he didn't have to wait long. In fact, it only took another 20 seconds for an explosion to ring out and for the exit to be blocked by an avalanche of rocks. Well, I guess I know who the lizards are now. 
Izuku threw his pack on the ground. Although I guess I knew all along. I just couldn't risk making any moves, otherwise they would be primed and ready to kill the both of us. Resting his hand against the cave-in. Izuku realized it wouldn't be that much of a problem to clear for someone with his strength, but as always, it wasn't that simple. The clicking and hissing of a spider's fangs caused the two to turn around, facing down the, now fully awake and likely pissed off, spider boss, a C-rank villain boss. G get behind me, I'll try to think of something. Move aside little one. I'm only interested in the true warrior. Akira blanched as the spider growled at him with its clicky voice. I I I it us speaks. Izuku had heard of plenty of villains that were capable of speech, but seeing it come out of an arachnid in person was something else. You're addressing me, Izuku said. It was not a question. Yes, I'll end your life here. For my master and for his master. Who is your master? Izuku asked calmly. A being you cannot comprehend. He is all-powerful, all-consuming. Didi don't come any close Akira fell to the ground, completely decapitated by a single swipe of the spider's powerful clawed leg. I was growing tired of that fool's pestering. Izuku's eyes were wide. He was just barely able to make out the movement. This thing, it's fast. If you give up now, I'll make your death quick and painless. My venom will numb any pain. You will drift off calmer than most will ever experience. Izuku scowled and clenched his fists, Risaka's gauntlets appearing with a blue glow. Sorry, but I'm not interested in my death. Only yours. Then come, little hero. Let me see just why my masters fear your growth. Izuku took a runner's stance, the balls of his feet pushing against the ground hard enough to cause it to ground. Like most villains, its weak point is its head. In that case, I'll just need one punch. Izuku pushed off, racing towards the boss with abandon, but it didn't flinch, sending two of its legs to slam him into the ground, sidestepping the first. Izuku reared his right fist back and punched at the second, a shockwave spreading from the epicenter as the spider's exoskeleton cracked loudly in response. I put all my points into strength. As long as I don't lose in a contest of speed, there's no way I can be beaten. In spite of himself, Izuku found himself smirking as he punched away leg after leg. He wasn't just holding his own against this villain, he was winning. Izuku ran forwards, leaping into the air and driving his armored fist into one of the joints on the spider's legs, bending it the wrong way and earning a spray of disgusting fluid as he did so. The villain had been unprepared and its body crashed to the ground as it writhed in pain. Too easy, Izuku thought to himself as he rushed the boss's face, prepared to drive his fist straight through its head. But at the last second, Izuku turned away and leapt through the air, just narrowly avoiding an acid spray that washed over the area and disintegrated Akria's body, his armor remaining behind thanks to its quality. Tsk, that's troublesome. Izuku landed a dozen meters from the acid pool that melted into the ground. I guess your head is too dangerous to get near. Then how about this? Izuku flexed his forearms and long, blade-like scales ejected from the top of his wrist, giving him a sword of sorts. I'll just have to bleed you out, beginning to kick it up a notch. Izuku activated his sprint ability, increasing his movement ability by 30%. He moved around at a blur's pace, using the scale blades to slash off the villain's legs at the halfway point, one by one. He got through three before the spider finally wised up and predicted his next position, flicking its leg fast enough to catch Izuku in the abdomen and slam him into the wall, cracking the stones like eggs. Your movement will be reduced by 50%. Damn it. Izuku had his arms crossed in front of his face, blocking blow after blow from the spider as they rained down on his body, pushing him further into the ground as wounds began appearing on his body. One last chance. He breathed out as the spider raised its leg back up to strike back down, except status recovery. The spider drove its leg down onto the spot where Izuku had been mere milliseconds earlier. But it realized too late that the green-haired teen was now racing up the leg, his fist reared back and aimed for his head. Forgive. Izuku didn't give the villain the satisfaction of his last words as he drove both gauntlets in the spider's eyes as far as they would go, the scales and blades shredding anything they came into contact to. And with that, the boss fell to the ground, dead, leaving Izuku breathing heavily and covered in the arachnid's gore. Phew. That was pretty close. I guess it's a good thing I saved that status recovery reward from the daily quest. Izuku immediately became distracted by the glow emanating from the creature. Uo. Ten villain cores. He scooped them up before looking around. He had about an hour before the gate closed and ejected him from it. There was not even close to enough time to mine all the mana crystals. But he shrugged and grabbed a pick regardless. But just before he could get to work, Izuku felt shrapnel bounce off him as the exit exploded behind him. An emergency quest has been issued. There are nearby entities that intend to murder the player, eliminate them, or a penalty will be given. If you do not complete this quest, your heart will stop. Enemies left to kill. 8. Turning around. He saw Natsuo and his seven other party members stalking inside with demented grins. I have to kill. Humans. An emergency quest has been issued. There are nearby entities that intend to murder the player, eliminate them, or a penalty will be given. 
If you do not complete this quest, your heart will stop. Enemies left to kill. 8. What? There's no way. No E rank could beat a C rank boss. The rich kid must have severely weakened it before dying. And what luck, his armor's still here, even though he was completely melted. Got some strong acid resistance on his equipment. Natsuo smiled cruelly down at Izuku Midoriya as he finished reading through the system quest. I have to kill. Humans. He barely got a chance to spit out those words before a powerful flare impact sent him flying backwards. Crashing into the same spot he had been smashed into mere minutes earlier by the villain boss. Almost half of his health was wrenched away in an instant. Izuku lay in the crater, dull pain echoing throughout his body. How? How could I forget? Not everyone is born equal, and the strong take advantage of the weak. I was not born equal to these men. No, these villains. But the system is trying to even the playing field. Maybe it's just telling me to do what I've always wanted to do. Beat down anyone in my path, become the strongest, even if it means. I'll kill you for that. Izuku pushed himself to his feet, crawling out of the crater with clenched fists. Uh, hey Natsuo, tell me you held back a little bit. Natsuo's eyes narrowed. No, I definitely put my all into that attack. Playing around with someone's life, only villains do that. And to heroes, villains are nothing more than something to be. Hunted. Izuku blurred forwards, disappearing from Natsuo's view as he frantically scanned the area, searching for the supposed E-rank. And then, splat, Natsuo felt something wet cover his face. And he turned to his right, eyes widening as he saw one of his raid members fall to the floor, headless. In his place, stood Izuku, one of his gauntleted fists outstretched. One down, no more running. Izuku growled out, more of a declaration for himself than his enemies, but they didn't see it that way. Two immediately screeched in fear and began running. But Izuku was quicker, getting in front of them and impaling both at the same time on his gauntlet blades. You bastard. Another raced forwards, his broadsword held high. Says the bastard who tried to kill me. Izuku didn't even attempt to hide from the blow, instead choosing to punch the sword. The finely crafted steel instantly shattered upon making contact with Izuku and exploded backwards, punching through its wielder like Swiss cheese. The next three took even less time than the first four, leaving only a shocked and shaking Natsuo. Why you? Izuku raised one eyebrow as his fear turned to rage at an astonishing rate. I'll show you that you shouldn't mess with the Todorokis. The Todorokis? Did he seriously name his party after himself? Or maybe he's talking about. Natsuo roared as flames began pouring off his body in waves. Let's see someone like yo. For a C rank, you're pretty strong. Izuku said as he rapped he planted his hand over Natsuo's face. But there's something you don't know about me. Izuku plowed the villain into the ground, smashing the rock like paper mash. I'm too stubborn to die to someone like you. He said over Natsuo's bruised and beaten body. WW wait. I'll give you money. You can have everything in this dungeon. Just let me live. Izuku shook off the blood from his gauntlets. Don't worry. I already have my reward. I don't need anything you have. Why your reward? Izuku stalked towards the man as he attempted to scramble away. His irises sparking a magnificent glowing green. A hero's job is to save people from villains. To kill you is to save lives. To know that I can still be a hero. That's quite the reward for a quirkless nobody like me. He spat out with venom. Why you won't get away with this? Izuku tilted his head for a moment. You're right. A massacre like this will have to be reported. And since I had my license revoked, I'll be subject to a small fine, but they'll never expect an E rank to have killed 8 degrees Celsius and D ranks. W. -wa. Izuku wasted no more time and severed his head from his body using Rasaka scales. A thump of his skull rolling against the ground ignored as Izuku inspected his clothing. Huh, it's a mess again. Well, it is a size too small, so I suppose it was time to get new clothes anyways. Except, reward number one, status recovery. Reward number two, stat points plus ten. Reward number three, skill, bloodlust. Let's see, that's three levels that I got from the villain boss and ten points from the quest, even a new skill. Izuku took a deep breath and took another look at the system. What doesn't kill me, only makes me stronger. A week later, Izuku found himself out with Sakura, jogging through the park outside their apartment. They didn't even find you. Izuku shrugged. The strongest agencies barely bother with C-rank or lower dungeons, so they've been short-handed lately. And they said as long as I assisted in a few other raids, they would waive the fine. That's pretty convenient. Izuku smiled at his little sister and changed the subject. How's school going? Same old, same old. She smiled back. You're not going to forget about the teacher-parent meeting in a couple of weeks, right? Not a chance, Izuku assured her. But the UA entrance exam is the same day. I'm gonna be rushing to it, so there's no guarantees that I'll be perfectly on time. Sakura sighed. Well, I suppose that's all I can ask for. She said as her brother became lost in thought. I've got four and a half weeks to prepare for the entrance exam. 
On top of the practical evaluation, I've got to handle the written portion. While Izuku was a self-sufficient 15-year-old, he still had to go through high school and Yue was like a condensed version of typical high schools for heroes. Speaking of being 15, I totally forgot that my birthday is in just 12 days. Maybe I can treat myself to something special with the million yen I made off the C-Rank dungeon. His thoughts quickly turned to those of rankings. If I was able to beat a C-Rank boss on my own, does that make me a B-Rank or a high C-Rank? He shook his head. It doesn't matter, I still need to become stronger. UAS2 hero classes are typically filled with S, A, or the strongest of B ranks. Thanks to the lack of high rankers overall, UA was able to typically fill their classes with a few S ranks and a majority of A ranks, something that not many other hero schools around the world could claim. All too often, countries were too busy fighting over the high-ranked heroes to worry about training them properly. But UA was basically the only hero school in Japan for high rankers, so it received them all. If Kaken really is applying to UA, then he's almost certainly getting enrolled. As an S rank, he's basically guaranteed a spot. A small ding brought Izuku back to the present where he glanced over at the system. Looking around, he realized he had left Sakura behind while he had been lost in thought. Uh, how fast was I going? Just about to start running back towards her, he realized the daily quest requirements had gone over their limits. Well, I'm sure she'll catch up eventually. Maybe I should try maxing these out for a better reward. Izuku lowered himself to the ground and began counting out push-ups. Him, it won't go above 200, Izuku noted as Sakura rounded the corner, practically collapsing from exhaustion. Since running 200 kilometers is a bit much, I'll start with 20. Without a word to his sister, he took off once more, running full speed, this time on purpose. Sakura just gazed on with mute shock. That's it, I'm going. Home, as it turned out, doubling his daily quest did provide Izuku with a hidden reward. The choice between a blessed box and a cursed box. At first, he intended to choose the blessed box. After all, who would want to choose a cursed reward? But something stopped him. He wasn't a huge otaku or anything. But what he knew of anime told him that the demonic powers were always the strongest. At the very least, this was his flimsy excuse for grabbing the cursed box and opening another key. Item class, S. Type, Key. A key that allows you to create an instance dungeon. You may use this just outside of the Endeavor Agency. Izuku was incredibly tempted to try out this new dungeon key he had received, but he refrained. He had a hearthstone, so if he needed to leave, he'd have no problem, but he wasn't sure if he'd ever be able to re-enter it. If the key is ranked at S, the dungeon is at the very least in a rank, I'd stand no chance. And in order to get the most out of it, I should wait until I've leveled up more. These were his musings as he walked through the downtown district of Jaku City, making his way to one of the gates the inspector's agency had asked him to fill the slots for. Dressed in a pair of jeans that allowed him to move easily, a dark gray jacket with the hood pulled up, and a lighter gray undershirt, he heard a familiar voice call out to him. Mr. Midoriya. Izuku looked to his right, removing his hood as a smile spread across his face. Mr. Atachi. A middle-aged hero's dark hair whipped in the breeze as he gave a sigh of relief at Midoriya's appearance. You've changed so much. I barely recognize you. He rested a fatherly hand upon Midoriya's shoulder. It's such a relief to see you once more. I had heard rumors of your survival, but I just couldn't get my hopes up. Even as the man laughed with all the joy in the world, Izuku couldn't help but frown at Kaido's missing arm. Please, pay it no mind. I'm lucky to have kept both my life and my other arm, as well as my skill with a blade. I owe that to you, you know. Izuku nodded, happy to oblige the friendly old man. Are you here on the inspector agency's orders as well? Hmm, no, I'm here on order of the agency association. Ah, yeah that makes sense. Izuku cursed inwardly as he realized admitting to be here thanks to the inspector agency sounded fishy. But thankfully, Kaido seemed to ignore it. The agency association was the overseer of all agencies. No matter how powerful they were, they all reported to the agency association. It was run by one man in particular, the strongest S rank in Japan, All Might. Looks like the others are already here, Kaido said. Heh, <sighs> what a day this is. Everyone's here. Izuku's eyes widened as a certain girl caught his eye. M. Midoriya. Miss Yeirazu. Izuku decided it would be best not to mention saving her during the golem attack. I. Tears began forming in the corners of her eyes. I told you to just call me Yeirazu. You're right, Yeirazu. Izuku nodded a calm grin on his face, sorry for being late. Tears began flowing freely as another, less beautiful face drew his attention. Ryaji, Izuku said, not even bothering to be polite with this man. Unlike Yeirazu, who had to be knocked out to be dragged away from the altar, or Kaido, who offered to be the sacrifice before the option was taken out of his hands, Ryaji openly threatened Kaido and ran away with cowardly excuses. Why you got so much taller? Izuku chuckled, you're gonna start sounding like mine. 
Mother, Yeyarazu didn't notice his stutter and was instead obsessing over his leg, your leg. It's, what happened? I'm not really sure about it either, but, what a romantic atmosphere you've got here. A guttural voice called out, is someone filming a drama? Or are the heroes dating each other these days? Izuku scowled deeply as three men wearing orange jumpsuits exited a van, handcuffed. Shut up trash, a man in a suit growled, his soulless gray eyes glaring down at them, this isn't a picnic. The three men strolled up to the group, creepily leering at Yeyarazu as they neared the girl, take care of you. Izuku appeared in between the handcuffed criminals and Yeyarazu, his eyes glowing with the same green killing intent that had stared down Natsuo. Using his new bloodlust skill, he was able to pump some fear into the target. Sweat trickled down the man's neck, but he surprisingly held his ground. Oh ho, looks like we've got ourselves a shining knight. Izuku briefly considered a show of his new strength, but Kaido's shouting dragged him out of his red-tinted vision. You're not really sending us to raid with Krimino. Villains, are you? The short woman with large round glasses flinched for a moment at Kaido's abrasive tone. W well, they're rehabilitators, and you'll have the monitoring division Hitoshi Shinso watching over them. He's a B rank and these men are C ranks, he should have no trouble handling them if the need should arise. Kaido growled and scratched at his stubble with his one remaining arm. These were the association's orders, he couldn't really do anything about it, fine. The woman nodded quickly and made her way back to the van as the purple-haired man walked up. Izuku noticed that he had extremely heavy bags under his eyes, as if he never slept. Well, you heard the little one. I'm Hitoshi Shinso and I'll be keeping a close eye on those three today, so try not to worry about them too much. He glanced in Yeyarazu and Izuku's direction for just a moment before redirecting his attention to Kaido. Who will be the raid leader for today? I'll do it. Just so long it's okay with you, he said, looking over his shoulder to Izuku. Izuku was taken aback. To Kaido he was still a lowly E rank with no leading experience. He didn't think he'd respect his opinion this much. Of course, he trailed off as Kaido bowed at a perfect 90 degree angle. Thank you for giving me this second chance. Because of my actions, eleven people died, but because of you, six lived. I bow to you not just for my life, but in place of all the other heroes. Kaido was still, unmoving. Thank you, Izuku Midoriya. Please, Mr. Otachi, raise your head. Kaido did so, Ryoji. You have no complaints right, even if I'm the one to be leading. The man turned away, his back heaving with a sigh, do as you please. As the men cleared out and went through the portal, Izuku stopped Yeyarazu for just a moment. Please, Yeyarazu, I want you to drop out of this raid. What? Why? Izuku pursed his lips. I've just got a bad feeling about it. Will you still be going? Yes. Izuku could have sworn that at that moment, Yeyarazu's smile was enough to outshine the sun. Then I'm coming with you, she declared. Izuku felt slow, but not because of any debuff. He already knew that he couldn't be afflicted with such things thanks to the system or any stamina loss. Rather, he felt slow because he was. In order to not raise suspicion with Kaido or Yeyarazu, he was holding back a considerable amount. I could have cleared this cave of goblin-type villains in a matter of seconds, and yet, here I am, waiting minutes for them to clear it. And on top of that, I'm barely earning any experience for the few I have killed. It seems like you've really improved a lot, Midoriya. Kaido waved his hand, flash baking another pack of villains with his fiery attacks. And I've got to ask where you got such good gauntlets. After all, it's weird seeing the usually bare-handed Midoriya carrying a weapon. Is it so? Izuku asked with a laugh, attempting to avoid the question of where he had acquired his weapons. Thankfully, though his answer was less than enough to satisfy Kaido, Yeyarazu was too busy obsessing over Izuku's new skill. I didn't even have to create anything to heal you once. Izuku brushed it off with a smile. I just worked out a little. And yet, you seem nothing like the Midoriya I knew. Is that a bad thing? Izuku asked, wondering if his new deeds of murder had changed him more than he would have liked to admit. I think it's great. Shinso rolled his eyes and muttered, Children, I think it's great. Kaido whispered back to the monitor, to be in a dungeon and still be able to find love. The man simply scoffed at the word love and turned back to the task at hand. There's three tunnels. Since it's a low-ranked dungeon, how about we split up? Kaido thought for a moment before nodding. We'll split up. I'll take these three down the right path, so if you find the boss, come and grab us first. Right. Izuku put his sensibility to work, scoping out the two remaining tunnels, getting the strongest signal from the left. Mr. Atachi, how about we take the left one? Hmm, sure. Upon suggesting it, Kaido and Yeyarazu moved past him, giving Izuku a glimpse of Shinzo's half-smile out of the corner of his eye. He went to scowl at the man, but he was already turned away by the time Izuku did so, with seemingly no other choice. He followed close behind Kaido, wondering if he had made the right choice to ignore the man, no. Everyone in the tunnel froze at Izuku's odd exclamation. The three criminals grinned strangely. Looks like this one's already losing eye he suddenly grasped at his throat, blood pouring from it like a waterfall of crimson. 
His two friends fell the same way just moments later. W what? Ryoji croaked out. What is this? Shinso grinned evilly. Now holding a dagger, that was a dumb move to call me out like that kid. I'm not sure how you knew my plan, but I could see it in the way you looked at me. Izuku put himself in between Yeirazu and the killer. Your eyes, I've seen them before. He raised his fists. Those criminals are scum. I can't say I exactly disagree with their executions. But I also can't risk a killer like yourself wandering around in here with people I care about. Shinso chuckled. People you care about. You mean this man? He said, nonchalantly pointing his dagger at Kaido. Or maybe her. He drawled out pointing at Yeirazu, who was cowering behind Izuku, being the only a rank in the room. Yeirazu was the only one able to witness the exchange as Shinso rushed towards her at superhuman speeds. Or rather, she thought she'd be the only one. Paralyzed with fear, she was unable to create anything to defend herself. But Izuku had already resolved to protect her no matter what it took. Shinso's dagger sparked off Izuku's gauntlet and his eyes widened as he noticed the teen's other arm reaching out for his throat, maybe a little too close for comfort. Just before Izuku could crush the government agent's throat with his rock-solid fingers, the man leapt back, smiling all the way with sadistic glee. Then I suppose I will start with this one. Izuku was just barely able to follow Shinso's sprint over to Ryoji, pushing aside his blade at the last moment and taking a swipe with his own scale blade. Hmm, I'm surprised you acted to defend a man that you obviously have problems with. Mr. Ryoji has acted cowardly maybe even maliciously, before and I won't deny that I despise him, but he is a hero nonetheless and fights for those who cannot fight for themselves, even if he has run from fights or abandoned teammates. That one small part of him that is a hero, it's redeemable, salvageable, but you, you're just the same as the men you killed. Instead of some coy remark or maniacal laughter, Shinso merely tilted his head, that's weird. Then looking over to Yeyurazu, hey you, what's your name? And Momoya her eyes suddenly glazed over and her shivering form stilled, that's more like it. I guess you're just immune, he said to Izuku, whose eyes were flicking back and forth between the two. What did you do to her? As an assassin type, I've built up plenty of skills, but none of them compare to my quirk. Brainwash. Izuku's eyes widened and he shouted, Mr. Pin her down. But the shout was somehow overpowered by Shinzo's calm command, kill everyone but your boyfriend. Yeirazu leapt into action, showing off that she was indeed in a rank with her strength, speed, and incredible quirk. Yanking two katanas from her arms, her large ponytail danced wildly as she attempted to decapitate Kaido entirely. Kaido, Ryoji shouted over the commotion as he underhanded his new broadsword to the swordmaster. It was a dangerous action, capable of hurting rather than helping, but Kaido was not so easily foiled. His right arm nimbly launched through the air, feeling the all-too-familiar grip of a sword as he responded in kind to the young woman, parrying away her blades like they were nothing. In a fight with blades, you stand no chance as a simple puppet. We've got this handled, Midoriya. Yeah. A voice whispered into Izuku's ear, causing him to spin around and just barely block Shinzo's strike. They've got that handled, Midoriya, so why don't you focus on me? Gladly. Izuku replied as he beat aside the dagger and took a swing at the man's face, narrowly grazing his cheek and opening a small cut. Shinzo once again took some distance and finally asked, Fine, I'll bite. Who really are you? Izuku bounced on the balls of his feet, fists held like a boxer. Izuku Midoriya, E rank. E rank. Shinso scoffed, as if some E rank could match me in speed. A false ranker. No, it seems like you've known these others for some time, which leaves only one answer. You've been rewakened. He smiled, and judging by your friends' reactions, it looks like it was recent. Ryoji, Kaido, and Hamada, their last raid member, all had wide eyed looks, even as they continued to fend off Yeyurazu without hurting her. Oh well, I guess there's no going back now. I guess all of you were simply killed by the prisoners while I was fighting the boss. Such a shame too, you were so young. Izuku planted his foot into the ground and caught Shinzo's downward swing in his open palm, Rasaka's scales creaking under the pressure. Why are you doing this? Izuku shouted back. Shinzo giggled maniacally. I could tell you. He took another swipe with a secondary dagger, once again parried away by Izuku's armor, about the father who wanted revenge for these creeps manhandling his daughter. I could tell you that I just can't stand the sight of trash. I could tell you a million things. But it doesn't matter what you believe. You'll die alongside those pitiful insects all the same. Shinso blinked and Izuku was gone. If that's your reasoning, then you're just as pitiful. Izuku deadly gid the assassin from behind and went to punch his head clean off. But his swing only grazed open air. Shinso now reappearing off to his right. Is that your fastest speed? Izuku answered by exchanging a flurry of blows with Shinso each swing or punch eliciting a hail of sparks from their contact. I don't know how many ranks you raised yourself up through, but it doesn't matter. It won't be that easy. There are nearby entities that intend to murder the player, eliminate them, or a penalty will be given. If you do not complete this quest, your heart will stop. Enemies left to kill, one. 
Well, it looks like your fate has been sealed, mister. Now I have no choice but to kill you. Skill, sprint has been activated. Movement speed will be increased by 30% and will consume one mana every minute. Izuku drove his fist into Shinzo's abdomen before he could react to the attack. The impact was enough to leave a shockwave in the air as Shinzo went flying backwards, crashing into the wall, blood leaking profusely from his stomach wound. Effect, bleed has activated. I'll admit kid, you're pretty interesting, but even with your strength, the enemy's resistance was too high. The effects were cancelled. You can't beat skill. Shinzo's figure disappeared into a fine mist and his presence vanished completely. Izuku's body went into overdrive and he raised both arms in front of his face, just narrowly blocking an invisible strike. Ho, oh, you managed to block that too. Your senses are pretty damn sharp. Let's see how long you can keep that up. Shinzo chuckled. Only a few assassin-type heroes ever acquire the camouflage skill, but no one knows about mine. Would you like to know why? Izuku raised his fist into the air, because no one ever lives to tell about it. Milliseconds before Shinzo was about to make his critical strike, Izuku punched the ground with all his strength. Dust and rocky shrapnel were kicked up by the insane force and Shinzo found himself stumbling forwards desperately stabbing at the area he was aiming for before his vision had been obscured. There was nothing there, but a darkness that passed over him and sent a chill through his body, weighing him down. What? What is this? Shinzo put all his effort into just turning his head enough to glimpse Izuku's shining green eyes. Is this? His shadow. And then, Izuku shoved his gauntlet's blade straight through his back, piercing his heart and ending the battle. As Yeirazu was freed from the control of Shinzo's quirk, she stumbled into Kaido's arms, just barely able to make out a mumbling from the killer. What are you? Truly, what are you? Izuku gazed down at him with a sad expression, surprised that he felt some small part of him break as he watched the life drain from the man's eyes. Let's say, I'm a hero that can grow stronger from every fight. How strong do you think I can become? Shinzo gave Izuku an honest smile for the first time, if you can become. As strong as your shadow is dense, you have no equal. The man took his very last breath and passed on to the next life. Except, as Izuku removed his blade from the man's chest, he noticed a small twinkle in his coat and he bent down to inspect it. Just as his finger touched the light, a small rock was teleported into his inventory. Type, Rune. A skill can be acquired by breaking this rune. Just as he was about to pull it out of his inventory, a dainty and slightly shaking hand rested on his shoulder. Thank you, Midoriya. Izuku stood and turned, surprised as Yeirazu practically barreled into him, wrapping her arms around him. Too shocked by the suddenness of it, he simply stood there, arms at his sides, staring blankly at Kaido Atachi who was grinning ear to ear. I'm glad to see that your power hasn't changed you that much. You're still the same old kid that's awkward around girls. Taking on a more serious look, Kaido nodded. I guess I owe you another thank you for saving our lives. Ryoji had his arms crossed, an uncomfortable frown on his face. So, what do we do now? We should probably go report to the association. Izuku finally snapped out of his stupor enough to send one of his gauntlets to the inventory and rest a calming hand on Yeirazu's back. That's a good idea. I'll meet you out there. Hamada blanched. You can't seriously be thinking of handling the dungeon boss yourself. Kaido shook his head. We've all seen his power. If he wants to do it, let him. He's no longer the world's weakest after all. Yeirazu pulled away from Izuku. Her face beat red from embarrassment, but even still she declared, I'll come with you. Absolutely not, Izuku replied, much to her annoyance. Hey, I'm in a rank. And yet you were held back by 3C ranks, Ryoji chimed in. Yeirazu hung her head in shame. I'm stronger than that. Really, I just wasn't really using my skills to their full potential. But you were brainwashed and told to kill us. He didn't say how to kill you, so I chose the method that would give you the best chance of survival. Izuku chuckled lightly. That's pretty cool that you managed to find a way around his quirk that quickly. Yeirazu beamed with pride, but was quickly shot down as Izuku finished his thought. And no one is calling you weak, but in a boss room, I can't guarantee your safety, he said, remembering Akira's brutal execution. Kaido nodded. He's probably right, miss. For now, it might be best if we just leave this to him and do our best to explain the situation to the association. No one bothered to mention her remaining trauma. Yeirazu thought for a moment before finally acquiescing and pulling out something from her pocket. Izuku nearly gasped at the sight of the E-rank villain core from the double dungeon raid. She waggled it in front of his face like an owner enticing their dog with a treat. This time, you better not be late for our dinner. Without another word she turned on her heel and strutted off. W what just happened? 
Izuku asked. Kaido threw his remaining arm around the teen's shoulders. I think that you just got yourself a date. Defeating this dungeon boss was nothing compared to the spider boss or Resaka and Izuku found himself making his way back to the gate before even ten minutes had passed. As it turned out, Kaido and Yeyurazu had already informed the association lady who had been waiting patiently outside, sending her scurrying away to call one of her superiors. Upon exiting the dungeon, Izuku was surprised to see Ryoji bowing low, Hamada in the same position next to him. Thank you Midoriya for saving our lives, and please forgive us for being cowards. Ryoji sighed, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Well then, Izuku replied, holding both his hands out to the men, if that's the case, let's start over. The two looked up in confusion, surprised to see Izuku smiling warmly, his emerald green eyes sparkling, not with killing intent, but with happiness. When I saw Shinso dying, I think I realized something. Even if I have to kill, I refuse to let that vicious part of me take over. I want to forgive, I don't want to hate. Ryoji stood and took his hand, breathing out a shaky sigh of relief. Damn you kid, making an old man like me all teary-eyed. Izuku took Hamada's hand as well and shook both hands. It's nice to meet you both. I'm Izuku Midoriya. Are you sure about that? A voice asked. Cause I'm almost certain I don't recognize you. Izuku turned, staring at the blonde man who had come to talk to him in the hospital. Investigator, call me Tsukachi. I'm actually from the monitoring division, but was there with the investigator division, so that's the card you got. He joked. Then, getting serious, I understand one of our employees has caused you all some distress. We will give our official apologies after the investigation has been concluded. But for now, I'd like to ask you all some questions. His eyes narrowed. So, who killed Hitoshi Shinzo? Damn, I guess I have to reveal myself after all. There's no way around. It was me, Kaido answered, stepping forwards. And what rank might you be? C rank. Sukachi scowled. Shinzo was a B-rank assassin with crazy skill and an even more powerful quirk. How did someone like you beat him? Kaido hitched a thumb over his shoulder at Yeirazu. She's in a rank with support and offensive ability. Ryoji stepped forwards next. And he used his quirk on me after thinking that I was the biggest threat. Sukachi paused for a moment. It does make sense. He'd look down on the smaller girl, the E-rank, and the man missing an arm. That would leave only this one or the bigger guy. I suppose this man had more skill for Shinso to use. Very well, Sukachi said. If you don't mind coming with me, I need you to help fill out some paperwork regarding this incident. Izuku stopped Kaido before he could go follow and he whispered, Why'd you lie for me? I assumed you had a good reason to hide it. Besides, this is the least I can do to repay you. Midoriya, Sukachi called out. I'm not sure when you'll have to fear for your life, but it will be sure, I can guarantee that. Izuku tilted his head. What's that mean? You were the only survivor of Natsuo Todoroki's raid team. I personally have no reason to suspect you were involved in any foul play, but Kaya Todoroki won't see it the same way. Dabai, the S-rank hero, Izuku asked, using the man's nickname. Yes, if possible, I might recommend fleeing the country with your loved ones, because not even laws could hold back someone like him, someone that even the monsters fear. Level, 27. Strength, 72. Vitality, 43. Agility, 82. Intelligence, 39. Sense, 69. Remaining points, 5. <laughs> Item class, A. Type, necklace. Equipped. Agility plus 20, sense plus 20. Mr. Tsukachi. Hum. The detective looked over to his assistant. A short blonde woman with round glasses who was driving his care. What is it? Why did you let those four get away with their lie? He gave her a curious gaze. What do you mean? Well, uh, whenever you detect a lie with your quirk, your ring finger kinda twitches. I guess that's the right word. Sukachi chuckled. Either you've been doing your research or we've been spending too much time together. Sukachi looked down at his hands self-consciously. Do I really twitch my finger? Yes, sir. Not even my wife noticed that. Oh, um. Sukachi cleared his throat. Well, we know that they were lying, but we have no idea why. Shinso had been in the position for 15 years and never once in that time could he be completely controlled. I don't doubt for a second that he tried to kill them. But what I do doubt is their ability to kill him. The man shook his head. Shinso was rated as a high B rank. But in actuality, he should have been at least. Unless an opposing hero had a quirk or skill that resisted specifically brainwashing. They were his puppet, which means it's technically possible for someone like him to beat an S rank. But he can only control one person at a time, which is why he was defeated. He took control of a C rank while there was still in a rank lying in wait. No, Shinso could switch his target by releasing his first victim. The girl could have been taken over once he realized her strength if he didn't sense it at first that is. So then, who do you suspect? We tested his strength at the hospital and it would be weird to think that an E-rank could kill someone as powerful as Shinzo. But every bone in my body is telling me that Izuku Midoriya is responsible. His assistant gave him a strange look. If that's the case, why not interrogate him further? 
You seem to be pretty gracious with this Midoriya kid. Sukachi stared out the window, his glasses reflecting the now setting sun. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I'm just interested to see what he'll do next. By the time Izuku and Momo had left the cafe, night had completely fallen, their stroll through the lush greenery lit only by the stars, moon, and park lamps. Izuku hadn't said much since leaving the cafe. After all, he had been slightly scared by Yeyorazu's crazy insistence to pay for the meal. He had never seen her in a threatening light before, but he could swear that as he reached for the check, her eyes began to glow red with power. He wasn't crazy enough to risk his life over some basic chivalry. Midoriya, do you think I should give up being a hero? Huh? Yeyorazu spun around, shame covering her face like a mask. I was raised in a pretty wealthy household, to say the least, and in that household, I was groomed for use of my quirk. She sighed as a small sparkle of pink light erupted on the palm of her hand and a round green matryoshka doll appeared, apparently modeled after Midori. I can make literally anything, but my parents didn't want me using it for good, only for money. Izuku shuddered at the thought. To be nothing else but a tool in your parents' minds, it was awful. I could have made myself any amount of gold or platinum and escaped them at any time. But that would have only turned me into a hypocrite, so I resolved to only use it once, in order to get my beginner's license. This was before I knew that those sorts of licenses limited the rank of gates you could enter, but in the end, I guess it didn't matter. So even as I ran from home, determined to make it on my own, I was kinda in trouble. She wrung her hands out, even at a rank. I couldn't handle higher ranked dungeons that I managed to sneak my way into. I'm just, not capable of that same lust for life. I can't make those snap decisions to save my life or anyone else's for that matter. You're wrong, Izuku said, looking deep into her eyes as she turned bright red. You knew how to circumvent Shinzo's mind control in an instant, probably saving Kaido and the others in the process. Sure, you're nervous, who isn't? But you can't get better at something by giving up. Izuku smiled boldly as he repeated the words that he himself had always wanted to hear. You can become as strong as you want to be, you just need help that was never offered to you. Holding out his hand to the girl, he felt like crying himself. It felt so cathartic, so beautiful to finally be able to say those words and mean them, to offer help to someone in need wholeheartedly, with the belief that you can help them. You've worked hard to get to this point on your own, so please, let me help you. Yeyorazu gasped out a sob of relief as she took his hand and looked up into his kind, warm eyes. Thank you. You, do this, every day. Yeyorazu panted out as Midoriya effortlessly jogged beside her. Every day, Izuku answered. Why? Izuku stuttered for a moment. He had yet to tell her about the true nature of his reawakening. The system seemed a dangerous tool and no matter how much he trusted Yeyorazu, he wanted to keep its secret under wraps. Even after I went through my reawakening, I was pretty weak. I mean, I had all the increased strength and stuff, but I became exhausted really easily. He gestured at himself. Heroes can't increase their strength or speed after an awakening, but we can lessen the strain those attributes have on us by training. And as someone who's quirkless, I can't really speak on this subject. But apparently, those with quirks can decrease the mana drain said quirks have by similarly training them. Izuku looked back to his side, where Yeyorazu should have been, only to find that she had been left behind. Oops, turning back around. Izuku began to wonder how he had repeated his same mistake as a chime rang out, signifying his running goal had been completed for the day. Though the two hadn't run that far, he had done several warm-up laps before she had arrived to meet him. It only took him 30 seconds to backtrack far enough to find Yeyorazu collapsed onto a bench, her chest heaving rapidly. In fact, the breathes were so violent, Izuku noticed her voluptuous ch no 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 no. Izuku nearly slapped himself in front of the girl and instead chose to lightly shake his head to clear the thought. Sorry, I space out a little during my runs. I guess it's just kinda become second nature at this point. Yeyorazu shook her head and waved him on, just, go on, without me. Izuku almost laughed at the dramatic declaration and instead decided to lower himself to the ground, beginning his push-up's goal. Don't worry, he said, I'll keep you company. With one hand keeping his body in rhythm, he reached behind his back and grabbed the water bottle tucked into his sweatpants pocket. He quickly tipped a bit of water into his mouth, allowing Yeyorazu to marvel at his multitasking skills before he offered her the container. She took it and self-consciously spun the bottle 180 degrees to avoid drinking from the same side as him. Of course, it was an action Izuku felt a great deal of amusement towards. So, enrolling in UA, do you really think that's the best idea? All the best agencies were started thanks to UA. Might Towers, the Endeavor Agency, Genius Office, and Prime Heroes are all agencies that exist solely because of UA High and the heroes they train. And you think we could start an agency as successful as theirs? Izuku's mind faltered for a moment and he accidentally let slip his inward thought, we. Yeyorazu flinched upon realizing what she had said, we as in both of us starting agencies. Izuku smiled, you don't have to defend it so vehemently. I wouldn't exactly mind running a hero agency with you. 
Slowly, but surely, the girl's mouth curved up into an embarrassed smile that matched Izuku's unhappiness, faltering only slightly as his head turned to gauge her reaction. She was so red, Izuku thought she might have some sort of blaze magic inside her. Changing the subject, Izuku called her back to reality. Well you seem a bit more rested, why don't you join me for some push-ups? The request seemed so jubilant that Yeyurazu couldn't help but acquiesce, even as she groaned on the inside about the workout. Two weeks later, uh, W, what? Yeyurazu stammered out as she watched Izuku insert a key into mid-air spawning a gate. I was wondering if you would be able to see this. After all, the last time I used a key, only I could see the gate. Then murmuring to himself, I wonder if the system sensed my intentions and adapted accordingly. How? How can you do this? Where'd you get that key? Yeyurazu was overcome with confusion as she observed the gate just outside of Alderham Middle School. It's a long story, but for now, just know that it's part of my reawakening. Izuku once again felt bad holding back the truth from Yeyurazu, and that feeling was only amplified tenfold when the onyx-eyed beauty gave him a nod of complete trust. So then where's our raid team? You're looking at them. Yeyurazu paled. You want to take on a dungeon by ourselves? It's a C rank, nothing to worry about for us. Izuku declared hopefully. If we can't take it, then I've got two hearthstones to use. He began walking through, only for Yeyurazu to grab his arm. I trust you enough to not ask about that key, but to handle a dungeon on our own. Izuku stopped and nodded solemnly. You're in a rank, someone that would be on the front lines of plenty of agencies' assault teams. That's the sort of future you want right. To be a strong hero. Yeyurazu froze in place. Was that what she really wanted? A ranks made plenty of money and lived more comfortably than most. But it was also a dangerous life. Every time she entered a dungeon, there was the chance she wouldn't come back. Just go back home and live like the rich girl you are. A voice whispered in her head. Why risk your life with this guy? If you gave up and apologized to your parents, you know that they'd welcome you back. Yeyurazu shook her head. To go home meant to be a tool, nothing more than someone to create items for her parents. Yes, I want to be as strong as possible, so that I can be independent and live only as I want to. Izuku smiled in this time. When he let himself sink into the gate, Yeyurazu let herself be pulled along, entering with a deep breath. Like the E-rank dungeon key from before, this one turned the landscape into a ruined mess. The junior high school was now more of a decrepit prison, shambling villains filling its courtyard. Their heads now turned in their direction. Izuku summoned his gauntlets as a floating pink mist began to spread itself around the courtyard. As it struck the zombies around them, he realized it made them slightly bigger. Yeyurazu make a gas mask for yourself. She quickly did so, fastening it securely around her face. What about you? I'll be fine, Izuku assured her, probably. Thankfully, as the pink mist hit him, he was greeted with a system message. Yeyurazu seemed to be faring fine as well. So without further ado, Izuku gestured to the field of zombies. Those are your foes, kill them. Bye. Myself. Like I said, you're in a rank, those are D rank. It's like squashing bugs for you. Seeing the anxiety on her face, Izuku rested a calming hand on the small of her back. I'll be right here to make sure nothing happens, but if you're going to be a hero, then you need to get used to fighting. You're not going to get past the temple incident if you don't learn that you are your own force to be reckoned with. I, I don't know about this. You told me you could take on Kaido, Ryoji, and Hamada if you were going all out, and I know you weren't lying. Think about how quickly you were moving when you were fighting them. Izuku began speaking faster as the zombie horde grew closer and closer. If you move like that in awe, one of the zombies leapt at him, moving far quicker than Izuku had thought possible of the creatures. His right arm instinctively flew upwards, moving to decapitate the creature, but he stopped as he noticed a flash of silver and he instead sidestepped the villain. Collapsing behind him, the villain lay dead, cut in half by one clean cut. Izuku grinned with pride as he laid his eyes back on Yeyurazu. Her body lunged outwards, both hands gripping a katana. Her face was pale and her breathing was shallow, but it was nothing if not progress. Her eyes met his and she gave a weak smile. I couldn't let them hurt you. Izuku grinned even wider, thanks for the save. He slammed his fists together, creating a resounding clang. Now, only 200 more to go. A bit of life seemed to re-enter Yeyurazu's eyes and she nodded back, pulling a second shorter blade from her arm, leaping into battle behind Izuku. With every severed head, slashed torso, dented chest, and flying body, Yeyurazu got into more of a rhythm, her body dancing on its own as she practically forgot why she had been afraid in the first place. As Izuku dashed through his old middle school courtyard, blinking in and out of reality thanks to his new camouflage skill, courtesy of Shinzo, he felt a rush of relief. He had never expected things to go this smoothly, for Yeyurazu to recover like this. Then again, he thought to himself, she's never once killed a villain, so that unknown was probably the only thing holding her back. It's like the first time you ride a roller coaster, you don't know what to expect, so you're terrified, but once you go on it you want to ride again. It was that same sentiment Izuku felt right now. 
To kill a villain was a scary experience at first, but the first time was always the worst. From there on, it was like a game. A cathartic experience of power over one's life. 34. Izuku shouted across the horde. 27. Yeyorazu yelled back, quickly ascertaining the meaning of the number. Game on. All Yeyorazu had ever wanted in life was the strength to be her own person, to not be defined by who she was born as. But until now, she had never felt that power. Always hanging back as a healer she had never known what she was truly capable of. Even when under the control of Shinso, everything felt like it had been fuzzy, in a haze. But now, everything was crystal clear. Could I always do this? She didn't for a second fool herself that these were some sort of crazy strong villains. But they were villains nonetheless. I guess all that training with Midoriya was worth it. 39. She shouted. Izuku punched away another zombie. 51. Skill, overwhelming force LV. One has been learned. 70 mana. Gauntlet only. You have mastered the use of gauntlets. From now on, all attacks involving gauntlets will have a 33% increase in attack power. Additionally, upon activating this skill, your strength stat will double for one strike. 52. Huh. Izuku looked around, realizing that in his desire to look over his new skill, he had activated camouflage, allowing the rest of the zombies to surge to Yeyorazu and feed themselves into her blades. HMPH, fine, Izuku said as he activated his new skill and emerged from camouflage. The nearest zombies were turned into a fine paste as Izuku's new strength stat of 150 tore through them with E. The punches were so strong that they continued on with a piercing effect, killing row after row of zombies. Within no time at all, Yeyorazu and Izuku each killed their last zombie respectively. Yeyorazu, looking more alive than ever before, her eyes shining with intensity, threw her swords down with exhaustion and declared, All right you win. I know I got 81, so you must have got 119. Izuku smirked, 169. What? It looks like there were more than 200. Alert, zombie horde training is complete, gate will now be closed. Izuku tilted his head. There's no boss. Before he could get an answer or further look around, he found himself in Yeyorazu once more standing outside Aldera Middle School, looking the same as ever. Secret quest, train a partner, complete it. Would you like to accept your rewards? Accept, Izuku muttered, somewhat stunned. Reward number one, item, weapon. Reward number two, stat points plus 15. Reward number three, item, armor. Wait, this was all a quest? He looked down at Yeyorazu, smiling wider than he'd ever seen her smile. Oh god, I didn't cure her fear. The system did. So you got a girlfriend, right? Sakura blurted out as she sat on the floor of the apartment, wolfing down pizza. Izuku began to cough violently on the couch, caught off guard by her question, where the hell did you get that idea? Well you've been out practically every night for training, but since the entrance exam is tomorrow, I don't feel like you'd risk pushing yourself too hard. She stuck her finger into the air, as if coming to a brilliant conclusion, which means the only thing you could be doing is hanging out with your girlfriend. Izuku downed a glass of water, allowing the pizza to pass through his esophagus. Taking a deep breath Izuku fixed his sister with a look of amusement. I have other things to do besides training. This was a lie. Izuku had done nothing in the past couple of weeks besides work out with Yeyorazu, take down system-generated dungeons with Yeyorazu, and have meals with Yeyorazu. Wait, do I have a girlfriend? The thought just briefly shook Izuku out of his anxiety. Ever since the zombie dungeon quest, Izuku had been unsure if Yeyorazu snapping into her hero persona was some miracle or an act of the system. Aside from her increased confidence, nothing else in her had really changed, which reassured Izuku. It had been nothing but a positive so far, but to alter someone's personality without them knowing was a problem nonetheless. Fine fine, don't give up your secrets. Sakura pouted as Izuku continued to be lost in his own thoughts. Looking over at the clock she sighed, I should probably get to bed. It's late. Remember 5 o'clock tomorrow for the parent-teacher meeting. Izuku waved away her concerns, I know. I'll do my best to make it on time with the entrance exams. Then that should be enough, Sakura said, stumbling off to get ready for bed. Then that should be enough. Izuku held a hand to his chin, she's never that laid back about stuff like this. Should I be worried? He shook his head, it's just a parent-teacher meeting. What reason would she have to be so strict about it? I'm sure everything's fine. Level, 39. Strength, 97. Vitality, 59. Agility, 97. Intelligence, 51. Sense, 81. It should be enough. Izuku thought to himself as he looked over his stats. Yeyorazu sitting next to him on the bus to Yue. It has to be enough. Alright here's your stop people. Proceed through the main entrance and personnel inside will guide you to the lecture hall. Izuku took a deep breath, closed his system window, and stood, following Yeyorazu off the bus and back into the frigid April air. The hustle and bustle was almost overwhelming. 
There were at least a dozen buses, all piled high with hopeful examinees. While UA was the only hero school equipped to handle B ranks and up, it also had an excellent general studies division for those not looking to become pro heroes. As he stared forwards at the massive blocky school building from the courtyard, he felt Yeyarazu take his hand. Looking over, somewhat embarrassed, Izuku smiled back at her. Come on, let's do this. Their jovial mood was interrupted as someone roughhoused their way past them, wrenching their hands apart. Out of my way you damn extras. I'll kill you. Izuku looked at the back of the student's head, able to recognize it at a glance. Even when angled towards the floor, Izuku knew. It's good to see you haven't changed one bit Kaken. The bully spun around, his eyes widening at the sight of his old childhood friend. The few months had passed since last seeing him and in that time, he had grown nearly half a foot taller, put on irregular amounts of muscle for a now 16-year-old, and his face was different. Bakugo had no idea how to explain it. It was still the annoyingly kind and gentle face he had always had, but now, there was some sort of calm aura around him. He scoffed, you may have worked out, but you're still a useless E-rank. You and your bitch might as well get back on the bus. Suddenly, Izuku was in front of him, his hand resting on Bakugo's shoulder. His face was lit up with a warm, friendly smile as he spoke. It's incredibly rude to speak to someone like that, Bakugo. I'd watch your tone. Some people aren't as forgiving as we are. Bakugo wanted to flinch away, to shove his hand off his shoulder and spit in his face, but something held him back. Izuku had no malice in his eyes, no killing intent, and yet, everything in Bakugo's body was telling him to run, as fast and as far as his body could carry him, that this quirkless loser was now something to be feared. Maybe it was the disbelief that Izuku could have actually gotten stronger, or maybe it was the shock at hearing Bakugo instead of Kakin come out of his mouth. Whatever it was, the discomfort was enough to shake him out of this trance and he stumbled backwards, finally realizing that they had attracted a small audience. Is that Bakugo? Wasn't he the one to get grabbed by that escaped gate villain? I heard he had to get rescued by All Might himself. Who's that person standing with him? He kinda looks familiar. Oh my god, that's the world's weakest E-rank hero, Izuku Midoriya. Someone like him is taking the entrance exam. These comments and many more rolled off Izuku's ears as he pushed past Bakugo, Yayarazu joining him at his side. I'll still kill you, Bakugo muttered under his breath, clenching his fists tightly and glaring at the surrounding spectators. He's not worth it, Midoriya whispered to Yayarazu in the dark hall as she stared pointedly at the blonde who chose to sit next to Izuku for no good reason. He's been like this ever since he was ranked as an S. Yayarazu's eyes widened. He's an S. Midoriya flinched at her exclamation and mouthed a silent apology to some of the surrounding testers all of which were trying to listen to the man at the podium. He was a famous B-rank by the name of Present Mike, someone with extreme sonokinetic abilities, both in terms of his quirk and his awakened skill. His quirk is ranked at a, but his technique and skill with it put him at an S rank. He's also got pretty high physical strength and durability for someone focused mainly on mana attacks. The cards being handed out now will determine your practical exam location. Alpha through Delta, four separate battlegrounds to split you silent testers up in. As Izuku and Yeyarazu received theirs, they exchanged a slightly disappointed look. Izuku had gotten Battleground Alpha, while Yeyarazu got Beta. Good. Izuku heard as Bakugo leaned over to glance at his card. Now I can crush you. Izuku glared back. I'm looking forward to it. You there. Izuku looked down the rows in front of him nonchalantly, noticing someone had stood and was pointing at him. Hello. A young man wore perfectly clean glasses and a fine press school uniform. You've been muttering to the two people next to you this entire time. It's distracting. If you're here for some sort of pleasure trip, I believe you should leave immediately. We're here to learn, not mouth off. Bakugo gutturally spat out. Killing villains is a pleasure trip for eyes. If you don't get that same rush from hero work can you really even call yourself a hero? Aye. All right all right. Present Mike called out. His voice laid back, much like a surfer dude. Thank you very much for your questions and comments 7111, but please, let's not get too heated. The student bowed and excused his interruption before sitting robotically once more. It's as you said, there are indeed four villain types. Points 1 through 3 are standard attack robots that anyone with halfway decent skill could take down. There is, however, one more type that can be taken down for bonus points. A massive silhouette appeared on the screen behind him, a tank-like lower half with a human-like torso and a seven-eyed head. The 20-pointer is a very special type of villain. Only one exists per field and while they are not impossible to take down, some would consider it a waste of time, even for its bonus points. Robots, Izuku muttered, you think that's gonna be a problem for your blades? Yeyarazu shook her head, I have other means of taking down opponents. Izuku raised one eyebrow and shrugged, I trust you, but I'm gonna be pretty upset if I'm enrolling on my own. He joked, just make sure you get in, then you can worry about me. Present Mike was unconcerned with their conversation and finished his explanation with a hearty, plus ultra. 
You, Izuku felt a hand grip his shoulder tightly. Even after I kindly asked you to be quiet for the rest of us, you continued to mutter to that girl. Is your goal in taking this exam merely to mess everyone else up? Izuku turned on his bloodlust and spun around, fixing the teen with a glowing green gaze. What's your name? By Ida, Tenya Ida. Ida answered as his grip loosened and he stepped back. His magical power seems around B rank. Izuku let up on the pressure and attempted to give a more amicable smile. Present mic was quite loud, far louder than any whispering I could have been doing. If you can't focus your hearing to that degree, then the villains are going to sneak up on you first. Dungeons are nearly as accommodating as a lecture hall. Dungeons. How old are? Start. Skill. Sprint LV. Two activated. Movement speed will increase by 50%. By the time Eater realized he should have started running straight away. Izuku was completely gone having disappeared into the false city within seconds. Calling out his gauntlets from his inventory, Izuku came across the first villain. Crashing through a building, riding on one omnidirectional wheel, it brandished its gatling gun equipped arms menacingly. Refusing to fire, it rushed him, its computational mind unable to comprehend the speed at which it was torn apart. Izuku was disappointed by how easy it was to kill them. Since he couldn't read their non-existent magical power, he wasn't sure what to expect, but this was far less than anything he had anticipated, so the system recognizes them as enemies. Izuku smiled as another three villains rolled towards him. Well then, I guess I should take this opportunity. And level up. Examinees weren't allowed to take in anything other than their main weapon, but Izuku was a different story. Thanks to the system, any armor he equipped turned invisible and it acted like it wasn't even there. With this, he could wear the warden's necklace and the shadow steel armor that he had gotten from the secret questline without being disqualified. Unfortunately, it seemed like the villains were nothing but complete fodder. After tearing through 20 of the things, he had only gained one level. Player has reached the required level. A job change quest has arrived. A job change. Well, I guess it can wait until I'm done he Izuku's eyes narrowed as the world in front of him froze completely. Robots were turned into metal statues. Bakugo and his explosions were turned into a beautiful display and even the birds had stopped flying. Stopping time. Why is it giving me a warning about this being the only time? Is it trying to make sure I don't rely on this? Izuku stopped for a moment, thinking out loud, if time is frozen, why not just take out the rest of the robots or just really take advantage of it? As it turned out, the system had other ideas. Purple lightning struck the ground just in front of him and a gate burst into existence, sucking him inside without a chance to escape its pull. Maybe it was just the strangeness of the event or the insane magical energy Izuku was getting off the gate. But in that instant, he felt like something was different, like the system had finally started to become serious. This is all the job change has to offer. Izuku asked himself as he easily batted away an armored knight, nothing inside its shell. To someone with a stabbing weapon, this might have actually been trouble. But with my strength stat they're just as weak as the villains from the entrance exam. Izuku didn't even have to utilize his overwhelming strength skill to punch straight through their armor in one shot. Four approached him at once and he simply slipped into his stealth mode, dealing out four equal punches. They crumpled like tinfoil and fell like tungsten, exposing their corpses and their respective loot. Now Izuku had shadow steel leg armor to go with the shadow steel chest plate. <laughs> Item class, B. Item type, armor. Plus 7% to physical damage reduction. <laughs> Item class, A. Item type, armor. Plus 30 strength when using kicks. Huh. It gave me a set bonus, but won't tell me what it is. Though the armor disappeared altogether when wearing it, its icon in the inventory made it look rather demonic. Pure black plates that overlapped and pressed firmly into each other made Izuku wonder if the secret bonus had something to do with his stealth skill. Maybe. Izuku flinched and the scale blade popped out from his right arm, disappearing straight into an invisible foe. Suddenly, a skeletal form, its face covered by cloth, willed itself into existence, falling to his side dead. I barely sensed him. Izuku trailed off as a bright yellow light filled the drab stone brick hallway and grew closer to him at a rapid pace. He leapt back, a fireball passing inches from his face, magicians too. Magic like Mr. Otaches and stealth like Shinzo's. Is this dungeon? Replaying my last fight. Izuku received no answer and was instead beset on all sides by magicians, assassins, and knights. Knights were the easiest to kill. Without any other special abilities, they were simple fodder for Izuku's punches. But not everything was so easily defeated. Magicians and eventually some joining archers managed to keep their distance, firing off spells and arrows as the hard-to-spot assassins and numerous knights engaged him at a close range. But despite the unrelenting onslaught, Izuku smiled, what is this? I train my body every day by brushing up against death. You think a little skirmish like this will tire me out? Overwhelming strength LV. Two has activated. Assassins became splatters against the wall. Knights became large flying metal debris that tore through or knocked the magicians and archers back. 
Izuku wasted no time leaping on top of the discombobulated enemies and drove his scale blades into their necks, ending their lives. You have acquired Shadow Steel Ring. You have acquired Shadow Steel Necklace. Wow, what's up with this Shadow Steel stuff? Item, Shadow Steel Boots. Item Class, A. Item Type, Armor. Plus 7% to Magical Damage Reduction. Item Class, A. Item Type, Accessory. Plus 30 Intelligence. Plus 15 Agility. Item Class, B. Item Type, Accessory. Plus 30 Cents. Plus 15 Vitality. Again, Izuku shrugged, whatever. As long as it makes me stronger. Stronger for, whatever is behind this door. Resting his hand against the ornate red and gold entrance, Izuku could practically smell the magical energy emanating from the next room. Definitely the boss room. Casting aside his trepidation, Izuku shoved his hand against the door, Rasaka's scales sparking against the metal. Replacing Izuku's view of the door was an enormous throne room, seven rows of dark stone pillars leading up to an empty chair. Bright yellow torches illuminated the area and the metallic stomping of feet filled the air. Izuku found himself tensing up as a reflective blood-red armor emerged from someplace yet unknown and took its place in front of the throne. The chill racing through his body, it was familiar, almost nostalgic in nature. Blood-red Commander Igris, a dark red name. Izuku shuddered. Even something like Rasaka had an orange name and that's when Izuku had been at his weakest. Even with my favorable matchup against armor-type villains, can I handle him? The knight wasted no time taking advantage of Izuku's momentary pause and charged him, moving much faster than anything with that much armor should have been able to. Swinging a blade just as long as Izuku was tall, Igris went to bisect him at the torso with a horizontal slash. Knowing that even his gauntlets weren't strong enough to resist such a heavy blow, Izuku ducked low feeling the intense wind from the strike pass over him and rustle his tracksuit. However, while the strike was powerful, it also carried extreme momentum, leaving Igris open for a few moments. Izuku activated overwhelming strength and drove his fist straight into the knight's side, significantly denting his armor and knocking him to the side. It was enough of a distraction for Izuku to wrap his hands around the sword-wielding arm and twist as hard as his strength stat allowed him. The metal creaked and gave for just a moment, but by then, it was too late. Igris slammed his free fist into Izuku's stomach, stealing all the breath from his lung and sending him flying back into a wall, crashing through a pillar as he did so. Igris wasn't far behind him, attempting to stab his sword straight through Izuku's head, just narrowly missing as the teen tilted his head to the side, unable to dodge the punch that was thrown into his stomach once again. Just what? I was waiting for. Izuku wrapped his gauntlets around the blade as he kicked out with all his strength at his enemy's chest. The Shadow Steel Leggings effect kicked in and Igris had no choice but to leave his sword embedded in the wall and leap back. Izuku fell down from the impact crater in the wall and found his footing, facing off once more with Igris. He expected him to immediately draw the two dagger blades holstered behind his back. But the Blood Red Commander betrayed his expectations and instead chose simply to unclip his cape from his armor and hold up his fists. This might have seemed like a stroke of good luck to an outsider who believed Izuku to have an advantage with his insane strength stat and gauntlet weapons, but reality was not so simple. Before Izuku even knew what was happening, Igris had wrapped his hand around his ankle, lifting him up into the air and slamming him face down into the brick floor. Growling, Izuku pushed himself up and wiped away some blood from the corner of his mouth before standing, surprised that Igris had allowed it. Chivalry, guess it's not dead after all. Izuku's eyes lit up with their signature green glow and he cocked his fist back, intent to wait for Igris's approach. The knight tilted his head for just a moment, seeming to consider his options. Izuku could have sworn he had shrugged before crouching slightly. Then, he was gone, blurring forwards to take Izuku down once more. Igris slowed almost to a halt as he attempted to slow himself in front of Izuku, his glowing white eyes widening as he realized his predicament. Igris's hand reached out for the wall behind him, a blue energy of sorts wrapping around the hilt of his sword as Izuku brought his fist down, flying towards him at lightning speed. Igris's sword reached his hand just in time for him to raise it in defense against Izuku's devastating downwards punch. But it wasn't enough. A shockwave exploded outwards as Igris's sword was shattered like glass and Izuku's punch continued downwards, splitting his helmet in two. The Red Knight collapsed to the ground, his body unmoving. For just a moment that is. His clawed hand dug into the ground, attempting to push himself up. But Izuku was no longer entertaining this knight and he activated overwhelming strength with his opposite arm, punching straight through Igris's chest, ending the boss's life then and there. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Izuku almost immediately collapsed beside him, falling onto his rear with heavy breathing. I won, but I shredded my gauntlets in the process. Looking down at his fists, Izuku noticed that he could see his own red, blistered skin, exposed. The scales around his fist had been completely broken by the force of his punches. HP 2392 10278 
Izuku sighed at the destruction of his prized weapon, feeling somewhat disheartened by the loss of something so precious to him. He was, however, brightened up as a small pile of glowing drops alerted themselves to Izuku's presence. The leather pouch contained an insane amount of gold, 1.5 million to be exact, which effectively doubled Izuku's current ledger. Dominator's touch seemed to be a rune that contained the same telekinetic ability Igris had used to call his sword back to him, so he quickly broke it. A hearthstone was nothing special, but the helm and gauntlets were the real prizes in Izuku's mind. Item class, A. Item type, armor. Plus 20 agility. Exhaustion will stack up slower and stamina will recover twice as fast. Item class, S. Item type, gauntlets. Attack, plus 67. Active skill, mechanical destruction. One gauntlet of your choosing will be enhanced by an extremely powerful pneumatic burst and deal double damage. Costs 500 mana and can only be used every 10 minutes. Izuku wasted no time equipping his new weapons and reveling in their beauty. Like the rest of the armor set, the gauntlets looked like they were forged from pure obsidian. Ending in the same claw-like protrusions Igris's armor had, Izuku thought they almost looked evil. Level, 47. Strength, 115. Vitality, 82. Agility, 130. Intelligence, 89. Sense, 109. HP, 3472 11754. The green-haired teen smiled as he felt himself begin to swiftly recover. Looks like I've gotten pretty strong. He put away any other items he had removed in order to equip his new stuff and in doing so, his eyes landed on the hearthstone. I'd only need one of these if there was no other way out of the dungeon. But, don't these instance dungeons disappear when I kill the boss? Izuku spun around rapidly, searching for enemies as a realization set in, which means, the quest isn't over just yet. Looks like things are only going to get harder. Izuku was almost unsurprised as six portals opened around him simultaneously. Begun, Izuku downed a bunch of healing, mana, and stamina region potions he had bought from the system shop just after killing Igris. Then what was the last two hours? The amount of enemies you can defeat will earn you points. Points will also be added depending on how long you are able to last. The higher your score, the more likely it is for you to be given a high-tier job. Izuku scoffed as the words, good luck appeared just above a timer and everything else kicked off. All at once, seemingly base-level knights began to pour from the portals, warhammers, swords, battle axes, daggers, all adorning their bodies. Izuku's pre-battle excitement began to take over and he began bouncing on the balls of his feet, holding out his demonic hands to either side. My mana is full at 1150. Stealth takes 200 initially and then one mana every second. I could buy myself a little under 16 minutes with that strategy. Izuku smirked, but the system told me to take out as many enemies as possible right. The knights gave him no answer, so if that's the case, I guess I'll just have to test out my new equipment. Izuku's body lowered to a crouch as the metal puppets began to fully surround him, their weapons raised to strike him. But, just before they could even swing with their full strength, Izuku acted. Izuku blurred through their lines, his claws tearing through armor like a knife through Swiss cheese. Nothing could touch him and nothing could stop him. Of course, not everything was so easy. Izuku could only guess that this marked his position and sped up the other knight's perception. Because after slicing through another ten bodies, the eleventh had a hammer coming down to strike him. It was a precise attack, using quite a heavy amount of prediction to guess at where he was going to be, confirming Izuku's theory about the magician's skill. Instead of trying to avoid and slice through him, Izuku went back to an old classic and clenched his right fist tightly, throwing it forwards with about half strength. The hammer stood no chance. Like Igris's blade, it shattered into a million bits of metal shrapnel that pinged against the knight's armor harmlessly. But Izuku's next punch was not harmless in the slightest and the armor fell to the floor moments later, its head completely compressed. By now, there were far too many knights to even weave between and Izuku took his chance to clear out as many as possible. Widening his stance, he formed two fists, holding them to his side as the knight's circle closed around him. Skill, overwhelming strength has activated. Punching out to either side, Izuku formed two immense shockwaves, shredding the nearest knights and throwing the farther ones back hard enough to flatten into sheet metal. By Izuku's count, he had dealt with maybe a full 100, but it had taken 400 of his mana and in the grand scheme of things, he appeared to barely be making a dent in their numbers. They were emerging from the portals faster than he could kill them. Izuku growled as he punched away another and another and another. I don't even have time to even think. Skill, overwhelming strength has activated, slamming his fist into the ground. A wall of pressure emerged, spreading outwards in all directions and clearing the area around him, since it was a less focused blast. Izuku didn't think any significant amount of the knights had been killed, but he didn't mind, as long as he had some room to think. It told me to kill as many as possible and last as long as possible. But if that's the case there's no end to it and to use the hearthstone would be to escape the dungeon before I get a job. 
which means that there has to be a way to complete this quest. Izuku frantically scrambled for an answer as the front lines recovered. I'm not leveling up from these guys, even though Igris gave me plenty of experience, which means they're special for one reason or another. At that moment, his eye traced over a magician. I've been wide open, and yet, they haven't once used any ranged attacks against me, only that detection skill. Izuku finally found himself punching away the knights again as a sudden realization dawned on him. They haven't been attacking me with magic, because they're too busy using summoning magic. Activating sprint once more, Izuku jumped between the knights, using their shoulders or heads like stepping stones as he made his way to the nearest magician he had seen. Thanks to the shadow steel leggings, his steps were practically like cannons going off every time he pushed off a knight, leaving a trail of destruction behind him. Izuku finally reached the magician, driving all ten of his gauntlet claws into its chest as his body plowed into it, using the floating magician's body as a cushion. Izuku crashed back to the ground as the body dispersed into a cloud of black mist. Subsequently, one of the portals and a good chunk of the knights collapsed to the ground, disassembled. If there's one magician for every portal, then that means there's only five left. Izuku looked up, shocked to see that a full 30 minutes had already elapsed. This turned out to be a poor decision as the recognition that he had been fighting for that long creeped into his body, and a small wave of exhaustion pushed through him. But still, he was undeterred. You may be many, but you're also weak. Then to the magicians hovering in the air far behind their armies, he shouted, Don't get too comfortable back there. From there, all hell broke loose. The knights that had remained still as they listened to Izuku's declaration rushed forwards and the fight was on. For the next 30 minutes, all Izuku did was wade through an ocean of dead metal, making his way to the magicians. The next two kills were simple, built on the same principles Izuku had used to kill the first. Hopping on top of the knights was easy at first, but they quickly learned in doing so for a fourth kill risked Izuku landing on one of their weapons instead of their shoulders or heads. By the time the clock struck an hour and five minutes, the magicians had found a pattern to easily avoid Izuku by floating through the room. Fine, we'll try it this way. Skill, Dominator's Touch has activated, no mana will be consumed. Imagining his hand wrapping around the magician's throat, Izuku knew telekinetic abilities snatched up the target and yanked him towards Izuku. The villain could only watch in fear as Izuku cocked his fist back and drove it into his face as he got within range. Izuku then looked to inflict the same fate onto the two remaining magicians. But by the time he raised his hand, they were gone, likely hiding behind a pillar or amongst their summons. Although, a fair portion of those summoned disappeared as their armor was pulled apart and put back together into one giant clump, a giant metal golem. Izuku just smiled. It would have been so much harder if you have kept them as they were. The golem was insanely strong and had a large area of attack, but it was practically standing still next to Izuku's blurring motion. With the area so freed up all of the sudden, it took Izuku only 30 seconds to find the three magicians crouching over a small magic circle. Before they could notice him, he yanked one away with Dominator's touch, killing him with one blow, leaving only two targets. Two surprisingly unconcerned targets. In fact, Izuku almost felt bad as he dragged his claws against them, slicing their unresisting bodies to bits. Then, all at once, the entire room of armor fell apart, leaving a panting Izuku Midoriya as the only living thing left. He fell to his knees, gauntlets hanging heavy against the ground. It's over. Right. Thankfully, the system seemed to hear him. A job will be granted after analyzing the player's actions. Granted, do I not get to choose? Izuku looked down at his arms and shrugged. Based on my weapon of choice and strength stat, I bet I'll get warrior, or maybe tank. Mere moments later, Izuku was shown his fate. The player's path is littered with corpses and the smell of blood. Izuku raised his eyebrows. What is this? It seems too dark to be something as simple as a warrior. Your desire for strength burns strong enough to call those who wander the valley of death. And the army of the dead who follows your commands shall create a path where your voice will be the law and you would never need another's help again. Wait, this can't be right. My job is. But, why? Izuku cried out. I've barely touched my intelligence stat. Will you refuse or accept? I have a choice. Izuku thought to himself for a moment, to create an army. That's pretty alluring. But if they can't level up like I can, then they'll be worthless. I refuse. Necromancer is a hidden class. Do you still wish to refuse? Hidden class. Does that mean it's some super unique skill? Izuku felt like slapping himself. Of course, it's unique. This entire situation is unique. And so far, the system hasn't led me astray so. I accept the job. Your job has been chosen. Based on the amount of points you obtained, you will be given a chance to promote to a superior class. You have reached the required play time. Points will be added. You did not use a hearthstone. Points will be added. Final health is above 75%. Points will be added. All enemies have been slain. Points will be added. The total points have exceeded the feat limit. 
Izuku flinched back as a wave of darkness and shadow rushed to envelop him in its embrace. You have learned a job exclusive skill. You have obtained bonus stats. You have obtained the title the one who overcame adversity. Suddenly, Izuku felt rejuvenated, like someone had poured adrenaline into his veins. The shadow steel bonuses are revealing themselves. Does this mean the system was trying to make me a shadow monarch this whole time? Set bonus 2. Chance to succeed in extracting a shadow increased by 50%. Shadows. That word keeps popping up. Is that what I call those I bring back from the dead? Final set bonus. Active skill. Appearance befitting a ruler. Izuku's once invisible armor suddenly popped into existence, folding out from its original placements and covering all the empty space between the pieces. His leggings folded down to create armored boots. His chest plate expanded down his arms, connected to his gauntlets, and his helm slunk downwards, forming an interlocking space of neck plating. Eventually, Izuku was completely covered, aside from his face, in the pure black armor. Looking down, Izuku nodded to himself, I definitely look evil. He looked back at the system, active skill. Does that mean I can turn it off? After focusing for a moment, the armor became completely invisible once more and Izuku couldn't feel it. He sighed in relief. After all, once he finally returned to the entrance exam, he wouldn't be able to show off the armor since armor was not allowed. Like always his gauntlets remained visible. Once his attention was finally turned back to the room at large, Izuku noticed a slew of the same messages. Okay, there's no way shadow extraction is not for raising the dead. Command phrase. A hint of a smirk tugged at Izuku's lips and, relishing in the power he could bestow this word, he growled out, Arise. The husks of armor erupted with movement as a dark, and Kai-looking substance began pulling itself out of them. Within seconds, the blobs formed hands, and bodies, legs, and heads. Before long, Izuku found himself looking at over thirty night-shaped shadow creatures, all with a nice blue glow to the eye gaps in their armor. Skill Shadow Extraction LV 1. Job-Specific Skill no mana required. A shadow soldier is created from a body without life by taking out its mana. The chance of failure increases the higher the target's stats are, and the more time passed since the target's death. Shadow is able to be extracted. 39 over 39. Skill, save shadow LV. 1. Job specific skill. No mana required. You absorb created shadow soldiers and save them. Saved soldiers can be summoned and reabsorbed whenever and wherever the animator desires. Saved shadows. 0 divided by 26. Shadow infantry LV. 1 rank. Normal. Shadow magician LV. 1 rank elite. 33 infantry and 6 magicians. Hmm. I can make 39 of these shadows but only store 26 of them. Izuku was slightly disappointed by that limit, but another realization dispersed his lamenting. He spun around, laying eyes on the dead red armor of Igris. If I can take him, then I'll basically have two ranks in my party. Shadow extraction can be used on this target once one or more shadow soldiers have been sent to the world of nothingness through extraction cancel. Then I guess I'll have to remove the weakest 14 in order to make room for Igris and Shadow save the rest. Izuku bumped his fist against the nearest infantry. Sorry for calling you, but cancel extraction on 14 infantry units. As the shadows melted away, falling into the ground and leaving no trace, the message gave him a warning. Izuku nodded, kinda expected that one. Without wasting any more time, he stalked over to the red armor. Arise. For just a moment, shadows peeked out of the gaps in the armor, as if trying to escape, but they quickly burst apart stumbling Izuku. Attempts remaining, too. Izuku scowled. This one's not gonna be as easy I guess. He's far stronger than the others and has been dead for well over an hour. But I'm not gonna let him go like that. Arise. Attempts remaining, 1. Izuku sighed heavily and looked around, noticing the empty throne once more. This time, instead of commanding the dead body, he held out his hand, stop protecting the seat of someone long forgotten, and instead, serve me, Igris. Arise. Bakugo was glad that he had met the waste of space again. Not that he would ever admit it of course. He had felt so much disgust, so much anger, that it started seeping over into the exam and he put more effort into using his abilities than ever before. I'll be stronger than anyone else has the right to be. I'll surpass even All Might and show everyone that I'm not some wimp who needs to be rescued. It was that anger, that annoyance that now coursed through his veins and built up a powerful explosion for the robot in front of him. They were so weak they were barely even worth the effort. But, before he could unleash his might, Bakugo watched in disbelief as a dark, shadow creature raced past the robot, splitting it in half with a sword. What the hell? He screamed out, landing on the robot's corpse and looking around. Almost shocked to see that more than two dozen of these creatures were dancing around the battlefield, stealing kills left and right. Using his explosions, Bakugo shot himself into the air, scanning the surrounding area, befuddled by the six shadow magicians and Igris standing next to him. It's just some other extra protecting him. Right. Someone who feels bad for his helplessness. Of course, Bakugo couldn't have been further from the truth. 
back on the ground. Izuku admired the efficiency of his army as he watched from a distance, his magicians casting blaze magic at anything that came close to him. Upon exiting the dungeon, he had popped out right where he had entered the portal time resuming seconds later. Igris, Izuku asked, aren't you bored watching your fellow knights fight? Igris was absolutely the most striking, visually, of all the shadow minions. His cape hung over his back like a waterfall of darkness and his cool blue eyes were enough to unnerve even Izuku. And yet, all he did was hold a hand up to his chest. He couldn't speak, but Izuku knew what he meant by it. Izuku had given orders to everyone but Igris, instead telling him to, do what you want. And it appeared his choice was to remain at Izuku's side. Although, he wouldn't be there long. Like a bunker buster going off, one of the streets and its nearby buildings exploded into dust as the enormous 20-pointer rose from the ground, spraying rubble and debris every which way. In fact, one of these enormous pieces of concrete came roaring towards Izuku, and yet, he chose not to move. He chose not to move because he had no need to. Without being asked, Igris appeared in front of him, his once shattered longsword, rebuilt into the shadow blade that sliced the debris into four chunks that fell to the sides of Izuku. Izuku was impressed, he had barely felt any wind or anything. Igris, now kneeling in front of Izuku, looked up to him for orders. Igris, I want you to rescue anyone who may be endangered by that 20-pointer villain. I'm interested in a test of your real strength, but for now, I'm really itching to see just how strong I can be. Igris dipped his head lower for just a moment, acknowledging his orders before standing and racing off towards the voice of a rather panicked girl, one trapped under rubble and mere moments away from being crushed by the robot's fist. Izuku found himself racing close behind the knight his right fist warming itself up for the strongest attack he had ever manifested. As Igris crouched down to pull the heavy rubble off the bob-cut brunette, Izuku heaved back his arm, taking a deep breath moments before the villain's attack arrived. Skill, mechanical destruction has activated. Izuku heard a hiss of air escape his demonic gauntlet as his fist shot forwards, meeting the villain's head on. For just a moment, Izuku could have sworn the world was quiet, perfectly quiet, and then it exploded. Thankfully Igris had already gotten the girl free and raced away from his liege, because otherwise, she might have been outright killed by the force of Izuku's punch. It was so strong that the villain's arm was completely torn off, launched back at its own head, decapitating itself. Fortunately, the robot was on tank treads, so it didn't completely collapse over the city, causing even more damage. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Letting out a heavy breath, Izuku looked down in awe at his gauntlets, oh yeah. I'm definitely keeping you guys. Upon turning around, he found Igris before him once more, this time, holding the girl in his arms, presenting her to him. I asked you to save her for me, not. Never mind. Izuku took the girl's hand and helped lower her to the ground just as the paw system came on. The time allotted for the exam has now been expended. If you are in need of medical assistance, please see Recovery Girl, who is now making her way onto the battlegrounds. If you do not require medical assistance, you are free to make your way back to the buses. Your results will be mailed to you within the coming week. Izuku wanted to laugh at present Mike's overly excited announcement. It was a breath of fresh air compared to his middle school's announcement. But before he could do that, he asked the girl, Are you hurt? The girl was too shell-shocked to respond, a light blush dusting her face. Although, much to his surprise, Izuku was certain she was blushing over the way Igris had saved and carried her. Good for, Igris. The girl finally returned to reality as Izuku asked again and she shook her head. Jay just a little bruising, thank you. That's go. D-I-K-U. Sensing danger. Igris immediately put himself between Izuku, the girl and whatever was coming their way. It was so quick, even by Izuku's standards, that he only managed to catch the tail end of the explosion that blew off Igris's arms. Using up Izuku's mana, the arms quickly recovered, but it was too late to stem Izuku's fury at whoever had attacked them. And who else would be so daring as Katsuki Bakugo? Igris, the knight turned to his master, show me what you can do. Igris nodded as the remaining 19 infantry and 6 magicians crowded back to him, prepared to defend Izuku at all costs. Leveling his sword at the team, Igris prepared to dash forwards, ready to kill if need be. Bakugo himself wasted no time ignoring the knight and instead chose to launch himself at Izuku, Igris moving to intercept, but no one ended up reaching their targets. A bright form fell from the sky, crashing down in between all three fighters, stumbling them, there is no fighting between examinees. Do you know why? A boisterous voice asked before a hand cut through the dust obscuring his form. Because it is against school rules. All Might cried out. Hem, Izuku muttered. Nonplussed by the situation on the outside, but fanboying on the inside. I guess I'll just have to wait to see what you can do for another time. Igris. Sorry. Igris bowed low as Izuku used Save Shadow to disperse the surrounding Shadow soldiers, leaving only him, the girl, Bakugo, and All Might. Hold on their young Midoriya. All Might built it out. We must sort this out. 
We cannot have bad blood between our two best scorers. But Izuku waved him off with a heavy heart, wishing nothing more than to stay and talk to one of his favorite heroes. Sorry, but we'll have to do this some other time. I have a parent-teacher conference to attend for my sister. All Might seemed to recoil for a moment. Ah, my apologies. That is very responsible of you young Midoriya. I do hope we can talk at a later date of course. Izuku felt an honest smile creep back onto his face. Of course. Izuku expected the UA entrance exam to have an assembly. Thankfully, he was able to leave the school grounds. With the extra time, Izuku was able to board the bus with no issue, heading home, focusing to change into something more suitable comfortable clothing. Last week, Izuku's bank income income increased. As such, he had no issue purchasing new clothes for this meeting. In fact, he was so caught up in getting ready that he didn't notice the simple note resting on the coffee table. Only a few months had passed since Izuku's graduation from Aldera Junior High, the middle school that Sakura was attending for summer classes, and the school where she would resume her studies. Walking down the JR. High halls with newfound confidence, waves of energy on his well-built body. He was no longer looking down in shame, avoiding eye contact at all costs. Instead, he stood tall, drawing a few infatuated looks from the female population. He returned some good-natured smiles, surprised that even though he had only just graduated, people were whispering about him like he'd never been enrolled. Fortunately, it only took another couple minutes to find the teacher's more than spacious office and take a seat across from the neatly dressed woman, a teacher he had never met in his own time there. I had no idea Sakura had such a cool brother, she said with a smile after pouring Izuku some tea. That's very kind of you to say, miss. The teacher set her cup down. Well, I can't say I have a better student than Sakura. Straight A's, always focused, and a great personality. Izuku took his turn to smile with pride. That's wonderful to hear. I assume you are aware of her desire to enter the medical field correct. Izuku nodded. She has the brains and the quirk for it, so she'll do just fine. As long as there isn't too much pressure on her. Izuku nodded. She's more than motivated enough. I don't think I've ever had to pressure her into doing homework or study. The woman sighed in relief. You have no idea how many brilliant students we get that become burnt out by their parents before they can even reach high school, so I'm glad to hear that. There is, however, one true concern I have regarding her. The teacher's amicable smile disappeared. Like most of the world, she has awakened and been gifted a powerful healing quirk, so, if she ever expressed a desire to become a hero, would. Izuku's smile was swept away by a frown. Never. Then I believe there may be a problem here. What? Recently, I may have overheard a conversation between her and her friends about taking on a dungeon with a raid party. I dismissed this at first because thanks to her age, it's unlikely she could get a beginner's license, but, well, you know how sneaky these kids can be. Izuku was standing before the teacher even finished her sentence. Is she still here? At school? And no. She left around an hour ago after finishing her studies early. The woman let out a shriek as Igris rose from the ground. I want you and the rest of the shadows searching the surrounding gates for Sakura immediately. Igris nodded and faded back into the ground, slinking away to obey his master's orders. You'll have to forgive me for this, miss, but I need to head home immediately to check on Sakura. The teacher's eyes widened. Oh, oh. Realization sparked inside her and she panicked. Standing alongside him, please hurry. I don't know what I'd do if a student got hurt because of me. Izuku shook his head. You couldn't have known that she would follow through with it. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. Izuku had driven to the school on his motorcycle, but compared to his max running speed, it was slow. So, much to his chagrin, he left the bike behind, choosing instead to activate sprint as he blurred through the campus and out onto the streets, weaving between and even jumping over cars if need be. It only took him a few minutes to reach his apartment, sweat dripping from his forehead, his breathing just as labored as it had been in the job change dungeon. Sakura, he shouted, rushing through the rooms and finding nothing. Just about to run back out the door to join his shadows on the streets, his eye was caught by the slightly crumpled paper left on the coffee table. Scooping it up, he began to read with increasing dread. Sorry Izu, I didn't want you to worry, so I decided to not tell you, but I've decided to take up gate work. I know you don't approve, but you've been spending less and less time at home and I didn't want you shouldering the money troubles alone. It's only a C-rank dungeon and I've got B-rank healing, so I'll be fine. Please don't try to find me, I can do this on my own. Izuku crumpled the piece of paper and bolted out the door, looking up the nearest C-ranks in his area, finding only three. He quickly pulled up his short contacts list and pressed on Yeirazu's. The phone rang for a few seconds before it picked up. Midoriya, how'd you exam G? Where are you? Yeirazu was perturbed for a moment. Izuku usually had such wonderful manners, but she quickly understood that whatever the situation was, it was serious. I'm downtown right now. At the cafe we ate it after our raid. My sister went to a C-rank gate. I'm really sorry, but I need you to check the location I sent you and make sure she isn't there. 
If she is, please stop her, even if it requires force. I'll leave right now. Thanks, I owe you one. Izuku shouted as he literally jumped through the open doors of his complex. By now, I think we're about even, she said before ending the call, allowing him to put his full focus into running. Luckily, the first gate Izuku checked was still unentered, the raid party checking their equipment. He had been leaping from rooftop to rooftop and as such, falling down to the ground cracked it slightly, startling the heroes. Is there anyone in your party named Sakura? A B-rank healer. A few less shocked members shook their heads as Izuku double-checked with his own eyes. Damn it. Sorry. He excused himself as he jumped into the air once more, heading for the second site. Upon touching down on the roof, one of his basic infantry appeared at his side. Did you find her? The knight shook his head. Then what are you doing here? The knight was unperturbed by his master's outburst, however, and instead held up a map. Several locations throughout the city crossed off. Oh, a progress report. Izuku bowed his head. Forgive me. The white slit on the knight's helmet widened, mirroring his shock and he waved his hands in front of his face, as if saying, No no, you have nothing to apologize for, my liege. Izuku took the map and examined it quickly, noting a particular X on the map. I would have gone there next. You've been a great help. He could have sworn the knight blushed and kneeled to him before disappearing into the ground once more. She's not at any of the locations you gave me. Yeyorazu texted the team, and she still won't pick up her phone. Izuku growled, knowing this could mean one of two things. She was either already inside the gate, where electronics didn't work, or she was simply ignoring him. He prayed it was the latter. I have others looking at the other gates, which just leaves this one. I'll meet you there as fast as I can. Izuku pinged another location to Yeyorazu before beginning his sprint. Both of them were a fairly equal distance away, but Yeyorazu was slightly closer so he had no idea who would get there first. Some might have called Izuku's actions hypocritical. To be so protective of his sister when not only was he much more of a risk taker than she was, but she was actually far stronger than he had been as an e rank But that was exactly his purpose as an older brother, to be overly protective, even if it made him a hypocrite, or even if it made her hate him. With his mother on life support, his main goal in life was to ensure that no matter what, Sakura lived a long, healthy life, unhindered by the horrors of the gates. Within five minutes, Izuku could have sworn he could see the telltale blue glow of the gate from the rooftops. Judging by its pulsing light, people were beginning to enter it. It took him another few seconds to reach the edge of the rooftop, but it felt like an eternity as he gazed down onto the scene. Yeirazu was charging towards the gate having arrived moments before Izuku. Yelling up to the air, Sakura just went in. He was surprised she had been able to sense his presence, but he wasted no time losing time over it and shot off the roof, diving headfirst through the vortex, Yeyorazu following close behind him. Izuku found himself crashing face first into a hill of snow as he passed through the gate, quickly gaining his footing and standing, eyes wide as he scanned the confused gazes of the other heroes. Eventually, he finally landed on his target, a small girl with dark black hair, Sekura. He rushed over to her, grabbing her by the shoulders and spinning her around, revealing her face, bright red with embarrassment, are you an idiot? Why the hell would you go into a gate? Midoriya, Yeirazu asked, a tinge of fear in her voice. Do you know what could happen to you here? Midoriya, Yeirazu said, slightly more forcefully. You're aiming to be a doctor. You kinda need all your body parts for that. Izuku, Yeirazu finally shouted, getting his full attention. It's a red gate. What? Izuku realized he had been too busy worrying about his sister, not focusing himself enough to detect the immense chance in magical energy. She's right, a man in bulky armor reinforced. I'm not sure who the hell you two are or where you came from, but I can assure you that you're going to regret having come in here. Red, Sakura whispered out, slightly panicked by her older sibling's ranting. Izuku cursed under his breath, it's. With his hands still grasping his sister's arms, Izuku spun both of them around, so that the ice arrow that would have hit Sakura slammed into his back instead. Grunting in pain, Izuku growled out, Igris. The shadow wasted no time appearing slashing through another dozen ice arrows that began to pelt the area. Infantry, protect the others. Magicians, give everyone a visual. As the basic knights jumped into action, swinging their swords, the magicians all cast their perfect spotting skill, marking around a dozen figures in the trees. The man in armor shook himself out of his shock and took to action, determined not to get outshined. We've got ice-type villains people. Heat magic and quirks, make some fire barriers. The remaining heroes thankfully managed to keep their eyes on the prize and tear their eyes away from the shadowy summons, firing off spells or shooting their quirks towards the trees with the help of the magicians. Noticing that the remainder of the raiding team had changed from sitting ducks to warriors, Izuku changed his orders. Egress, no matter what happens, keep Sakura safe, even if it means endangering me. Infantry, engage the enemy. Magicians, light them up. Izuku stepped away from Sakura, not wanting to get blood on her as he yanked the ice arrow from his abdomen with a grunt of pain. 
Yeirazu was there mere moments later, pouring her special potion over it and proceeding to wrap it with bandages. Izuku wasn't sure how yet, but somehow, Yeirazu's specially crafted potions were stronger and more efficient than even the systems. Hey you! The man in armor shouted at Izuku, pull your summons back. We can't risk overextending ourselves. Taking stock of the situation once more, Izuku realized that his orders may have been too strong. The arrows that had rained down were from only a small welcoming group, rather than an army. All but Igris kneeled and slunk back to the ground. I meant that, Izuku said to Igris, having mostly recovered, as long as we are in this red gate, her importance far outweighs my own. Igris bowed, but Izuku could tell that he was reluctant to accept such orders. Sakura's eyes were wide as she looked around, still unable to comprehend what had happened. Too dead, the leader declared, crouching over two young men, ice spread over and through their face. I'm not sure how many of you understand our current situation, but we're not in any normal dungeon. This is a red gate, which means we cannot return to our own world until we either kill the boss, the gate opens on its own, or all of us are dead. He stood after making sure to take the dense packs. A red gate. Are you sure? Someone shouted in a panic. The leader ignored them and removed his helmet, revealing a face in its twenties with a small scar on its upper lip. I'll introduce myself once more now that we are more organized. I am Shinji Nakami and a rank hero. The agency that sent us has been training me for quite some time now, so I am not lacking in experience. In order for us to stay alive and make it out of here, I'm going to need everyone's support. So, who are you two and why are you here? Izuku bowed, most of the pain from the arrow having faded. Izuku Midoriya, I was here to take my sister, he gestured to Sakura and leave the gate, but that is apparently no longer an option, so for now, I'm simply here to guard her. Yeirazu followed his lead and introduced herself. I was assisting him in finding the gate his sister had entered. Well, judging by your summons and her creation abilities, I can't say I'm upset to have you two in here with me. Speaking of summons, Yeirazu began, giving Izuku a narrowed gaze, since when could you do that? Izuku smiled awkwardly. Listen, when we're not in a deadly inescapable dungeon, I'll tell you everything. Regardless, Shinji interrupted, we should put together a hunting team to chase down and kill the boss. You sure that's a good idea? Izuku asked. W what? Shinji asked, surprised anyone would question the leader of a raid. Yeirazu answered for him. The dungeon was ranked C, but since it's a red gate, we have no idea what its true power is now. So then what do you suggest? Red gates can take months before deciding to open up on their own. But a day in here is only an hour out there. At most, we get stuck in here for a week. You're not truly willing to spend seven months in here are you? Are you truly willing to fight a boss that could be S rank? Shinji blanched but held his ground. I will go even if no one else joins me. Now, who is with me? The surrounding twenty or so heroes exchanged only glances, but Izuku knew what they were thinking. Do we accompany the A-rank hero with experience, or listen to the tag-along teenager who's an unknown rank? In the end, fifteen joined Shinji and the weaker five, decided to join Izuku, Yeirazu, and Sakura. Shinji gave Izuku one last look. You seriously won't accompany us, even with those summons of yours? Izuku nodded. I choose to walk the path that risks my sister the least. I refuse to bring her to a boss fight and I refuse to leave her alone to fight the boss. Therefore, the simplest choice is to hunker down and wait for the gate to open. Shinji sighed, then, I wish you luck. Same to you. And so, as Izuku walked into the forest, a group of low-rank heroes behind him, he was completely unaware of the S-rank that had arrived just outside the red gate, patiently waiting for his prey. As Izuku led the others deeper into the woods, the tree line became thicker and thicker, blocking out more and more light. You um, excuse me. One of the B-ranks asked Izuku. Hmm, we really shouldn't go any farther. We're already in Ice Bear territory. Izuku looked over to Yeirazu and she looked at him, both asking at the same time, that was your plan, right? They both took a moment to chuckle, feeling the icy dread warming for just a moment. Then to the B rank, those ice elves are far more dangerous than any ice bear. Only one of them will sneak up on you while you sleep, the other's just gonna charge in. So, while we're in the forest, the only thing we have to worry about is the ice bears. I should have thought of that. Yeirazu's subsequent smile was warm, but not warm enough to keep Sakura and the others from shivering. Here, Izuku said as he pulled warm fur coats from the system store. As spatial magic. Yeirazu cried out as she stomped over to Izuku and gave him a look full of betrayal. Where are all these skills suddenly coming from? Looking around, Izuku could tell by the amazed faces that they were shocked he could carry this much with spatial magic. I've only heard of up to three things being able to be stored in. Izuku cut her off. Yeirazu, I promise you. As soon as we're out of here, I'll tell you everything. I promise. The seriousness that framed his face must have been enough to convince Yeirazu because she fell silent as he turned to the rest of the group. Don't bother asking questions. 
You won't get any answers. As they began their trek once more, now that everyone was warmly dressed, Izuku called upon Igris to walk with them. While Izuku's shadows had already done a fair bit to endear themselves to the raid members, it seemed like some were still pretty uncomfortable with the night. Sakura on the other hand, was smart enough to know that Izuku had the summons under his control. For as long as we're here, Izuku said, you stick by my side. He pointed to Yeyarazu, her side, then to Igris or his side. Sakura, having had time to recover from the shock of the elven attack, pouted at Izuku, I'm a B rank you know, I'm not helpless. You're a good healer, but you have no offensive abilities. Izuku didn't want to scare her, so he held back the part about the smart villains always going for the healers first. Yeyarazu, I'll take these five, just protect the others. Right, take five. Five what? The party asked as the sound of stomping feet grew louder and closer. Skill, appearance befitting a ruler has activated. Strength will be doubled. Intelligence increased by 50%. Agility reduced by 30%. Izuku smiled as the onyx black armor spread over his body, covering him like a beautiful infection. He rolled his shoulders, causing the warm coat to fall off of him as five enormous white bears came into view, charging through the forest. His claw-like fingers extended as the trees cracked and snapped under the weight of the ice bears. Whoa, Sakura breathed out, infatuated with the craftsmanship of the shadow steel armor. But while the armor may have been intimidating to human opponents, or maybe human-like villains, the ice bears didn't even slow. In response, Izuku chose to simply hold out his hand to the nearest one. Now, ice bears weren't exactly the smartest creatures. So it was no surprise that the leader decided to plow headfirst into Izuku's palm. Several tons of ice bear was stopped instantly. All of the weight carrying the bear forwards was enough to crush its own head, effectively doing Izuku's job for him and killing itself. Izuku shook off the blood and gore that dripped from his hand and turned his attention to the remaining four bears, all slightly more on edge now that Izuku had made an example of their friend. Unfortunately for them, their judge, jury, and executioner was not in a merciful mood. Wanting to blow off a little steam after the insanely hectic events of the day, Izuku rushed over to the nearest ice bear, grabbing it by the paw, heaving its entire body into the air, and slamming it down moments later. Using the trees as springboards, Izuku jumped between the remaining three bears, making precision slashes as he went. To Izuku it had taken a couple minutes to tear apart the beast-type villains, but in reality, the fight only lasted 30 seconds. Level, 54. Strength, 244. Vitality, 89. Agility, 96. Intelligence, 159. Sense, 116. HP, 17,424 over 17,424. A. And, just for clarification, the strength, intelligence, and agility stat numbers shown are the numbers after having the buffs and debuffs applied. I. Izuku's real strength stat is 122. Even with the reduction to my agility this armor boost is insane. With one final push off the trees, Izuku crashed down in front of his makeshift party with a heavy thumb. A clunking noise filled the air as his armor folded off and disappeared into nothingness. Well, this is as good a place as any to set up camp, Izuku declared with a bright smile, having successfully secured a food source with the five bear corpses. So, seriously, what were you thinking? Izuku asked with a, I'm not mad, just disappointed, tone. It was enough to earn an embarrassed look from Sakura and a slightly amused gaze from Yeyarazu. Ew, you've been out so late these past few weeks, and I was just really worried that you were pushing yourself too hard. I'm a B-rank with my healing powers, so I thought I could earn some more money. Izuku sighed heavily and placed his hand on Sakura's head, separated from her hair by the fuzzy coat. It's probably obvious by now, but I've rewakened. For the past week, I've been clearing B or ranks dungeons with her. He pointed to Yeyarazu, eliciting an excited gasp from Sakura. So she's your girlfriend. Izuku's mind froze for a moment, mirroring the snowy conditions around them. W what? Yeyarazu was busy hiding her bright red face in the hood of her parka. Her confidence may have increased when it came to fighting in dungeons, but when it came to such loud and blatant declarations from her crush's sister, she was as helpless as a baby deer. Izuku finally came back to his senses and mercilessly pulled at his sister's cheek. I'm the one doing the interrogating here. Oh, oh, sorry. You can't just go saying those types of things in front of her. I'll stop if you stop. She cried out. Izuku groaned and let up on his sibling, standing as he did so. Then to Yeyarazu, who had slightly recovered from the shock, he said, I'm going to go hunting for now, keep an eye on the troublemaker. She nodded, a smile on her still blushing face, forcing Izuku to realize something. Hum, maybe Sakura's onto something. If I had to have a girlfriend, I can't imagine someone better than Yeyarazu. The B-ranked girl ignored Izuku's remark about his sister, hunting. But we've got plenty of ice bear meat. 
What did I say about asking pointless questions? She grumbled something about strange men, but kept to herself shortly after, leaving Izuku free to strut into the forest, hands in pockets. I wonder if there's some way to turn off the daily quest requirements. Izuku pondered as he hung from a thick branch by his knees. It's not exactly convenient to need to work out inside a red gate, even if the daily rewards are worth it. Hup. His legs let go of their hold on the tree and Izuku went plummeting to the ground, flipping around at the last moment to land on his feet. Well, now that I'm warmed up, let's see about recruiting some ice bears to my ranks. Turning his sense stat up to 11, Izuku sought out the nearest concentration of magical energy, finding a deep dark cave. Approaching without the caution, Izuku sized up the packs of ice bears, eyes glowing red and fur bristling at their intruder. Go forth. A mass of shadows exploded from Izuku's back, painting the forest in ink black. Within seconds, the shadows had taken shape, forming Izuku's indomitable shadow army, with Igris standing next to him as his general. Izuku held out a hand, loosely gesturing to the bear horde, kill them. Izuku's forces charged with a silent battle cry, their stoicness a complete parallel to the ice bear's magnificent roars. Flesh and shadow metal met in a clash unlike anything Izuku had ever seen. There were only about 55 total combatants, but the intensity of the battle was nearly overwhelming. From the get-go, it was clear who had an advantage. The ice bears had huge frames and powerful attacks, but they made for big targets. On top of that, when they fell from their wounds, they stayed down, whereas the shadow warriors refused to lose. I had no idea they could regenerate at such a speed. Izuku marveled at his troops, grateful he had received the job of shadow monarch. If they didn't consume so much mana, they might as well be immortal. Downing a mana potion. Izuku activated his armor skill, increasing his intelligence stat. 1722385 Magicians lobbed huge fireballs one after the other, searing the bears with a heat they had never felt before. Soldiers slashed at their tendons, bringing their bodies down to the ground for killing blows. And Igris remained where he was, his head tracking the enormous shape that began to emerge from the cave. I wonder if Igris is providing his own instructions. I mean, he is my second in command after all. But how much autonomy does he really have? 802385 Izuku's severe mana loss brought him back to the present and he immediately recognized what had caused it. An ice bear, at least four times the size of the others, had brought its paw down across a line of shadows, smashing seven at once. Well you're certainly a big one, Izuku said, staring down the ice bear leader. His left eye was crisscrossed with scars, likely from another ice bear's claws, and two more scars stretched down from his shoulders to his torso, forming an impromptu X. Of course, these scars inhibited him in no way and he continued to swipe away the lower shadow knights with ease, bringing Izuku's mana down to zero. Pulling back the infantry, using the magicians to cover their retreat, Izuku called to his strongest ally, Igris, I think it's finally time to see what you can do. Igris acquiesced, drawing his sword soundlessly and holding the immense blade out to his right side with ease. Then, blurring forwards, he struck with all his might. The ice bear roared in pain as Igris raced up his front left leg, carving it up enough to form a spiral of blood that splattered over the ground, hissing as it hit the cold snow. Izuku was surprised to notice that Igris had not remained on the bear's back, instead choosing to leap past him and land on the side of a tree. Ha! Eh. Izuku smiled, glad to see I'm making an impression. The shadow knight imitated his leaves attack from earlier in the day, launching off the tree and digging his sword into the bear's other leg. His momentum from the tree helped push his blade through muscle, tendon, and anything else that threatened to get in his way. By the time Igris landed with a roll, standing in front of the bear with no fear, he had left two massive, bleeding wounds on his arms, effectively crippling him. But that didn't stop the enraged villain. Using his back legs to waddle forwards, he threw his head at Igris, intending to swallow him whole. He never even saw Igris's blade moving. Izuku stared on in awe, was. Was he holding back when he fought me? The ice bear's head was spinning through the air, just feet from hitting the ground when Igris's hand whipped out, snatching it by its hair. Without my armor, he's certainly stronger than me. No, even with the armor, could he be my equal? Izuku asked himself as Igris knelt in front of him, presenting the head as a trophy. You did excellently. He complimented as the remainder of the ice bears were slaughtered. Shadows able to be extracted, 75. Shadows able to be saved, 51. Still with his hands in his pockets, Izuku strutted over to the lead bear, Arise. 25 bear corpses rumbled with evil energy as their mana was sucked out and transformed into a duplicate shadow soldier. Shadow monster LV, 1 normal grade. Shadow monster LV, 1 elite grade. 24 normal and 1 elite. Ranks that are knight or higher get to be named, Izuku thought to himself, reciting the message he had received upon reviving Igris. Neither the magicians or this ice bear gave me the option to name them, which means that so far the rankings are normal, elite, and knight. 
While lost in his thoughts, Izuku hadn't noticed the lead bear sneak up to him, nuzzling its snout against him with affection. Caught off guard by the action, Izuku laughed warmly and petted the shadow, surprised to find that his thick fur had been replicated onto the shadow, making it feel like Izuku really was petting a bear. Igris stood off to the side, his arms crossed and his eyes narrowed, obviously jealous with the attention the bear shadow was receiving. A few of the knights walked over to their boss, patting him on the shoulder consolingly. Within the week, Izuku had obliterated the ice bear population, leveling up half a dozen times in the process and acquiring another ten of their shadows. Realizing that by now, his intelligence stat was the most important, he had poured all of his daily points into it, aside from his own successes. Their motley raiding team had established a base camp of sorts. Food storage, fire pit, seating, places to sleep. The bears provided a bountiful source of food and the trees provided an excellent source of raw material. They weren't just surviving anymore, they were thriving. Ice bears no longer came around, likely due to the fact that most of them were dead, so there was no need to fear the beast. In the end, it began to feel almost like a camping trip, or at least, it did, until one particular rank came running back to them. Izuku was perched high in a tree, doing his workout for the day as he felt a sudden magical energy. It was just barely within his sense range, and if that was to be trusted, then the signal had just arrived at base camp. He was on the ground and sprinting away in no time, shots ringing out in the distance. Eirazu parried Shinji's blade with little effort, slashing at his forearm in the same motion. A thin red line appeared in the gaps of his ruined armor. You hid this from all of us. Shinji screamed about their food supply as he swung madly with all of his strength. It's your fault. Not mine. Yeirazu calmly stepped back, avoiding his wild and predictable strikes. We offered you a chance with us. It's nobody's fault but your own. In her free left hand, she conjured up a handgun, already loaded and aimed it at Shinji. Normal armaments, such as swords or guns, were practically worthless against higher-ranked heroes or villains. In order for them to work, they had to be imbued with magical energy, something Yeirazu had not yet been able to do with guns. However, while it wasn't deadly or even a danger to Shinji, it was loud and it drew out certain instinctual responses. The A-rank raid leader couldn't help but flinch and hold his hands up in front of his face, obscuring his view as Yeirazu fired several times, the rounds pinging off him harmlessly. But what didn't ricochet off his armor was Yeirazu's katana. Unlike her gun, which had too many parts to effectively strengthen with mana, her sword was given a full treatment, and as such, it had no trouble finding a gap in his armor, breaking the skin and going all the way through, exiting out his back. Shinji gasped, dropping his own chipped and damaged sword as he fell to the ground, spitting up blood. But Yeirazu wasn't done. After sliding her blade out of him, she shoved him to the ground, tying up his legs and hands with strengthened carbon steel wires. After checking to make sure he wouldn't be able to slip out of them, Yeirazu pulled out two bottles of healing potion, pouring the entire contents over her attacker. The wound almost immediately healed, closing up without any fuss, just as Izuku arrived, sprinting full speed at Yeirazu, who was crouched on the snowy ground. Everyone's okay, she called out, but Izuku didn't stop, causing her eyes to widen. His gauntlet was held out to his side, looking as if he was going to take a swipe at her. Out of nowhere, he accelerated, passing her fast enough to knock her off balance. The only thing registering in her mind at that instant was the ring of metal on metal. Looking up, she saw Izuku's right hand crushing a small dagger, his other hand buried in the ice elf's stern. Stealth, she looked around frantically, attempting to make out any other would-be assassins. There's no use. Izuku called out, with your mana levels, I can see you as clear as day. Immediately, twenty or so ice elves revealed themselves, their camouflage vanishing with an icy flourish. The lead elf rode atop a silvery white horse, his long white hair whipping around in the cold air. So it seems like there truly was one useful one mixed in with the garbage. Izuku's eyes narrowed. Did you just call us trash? And you can converse with us. How splendid. The elf reached down to his supposed underling next to him, laying a hand on his shoulder. There's someone I'd like to introduce to you. This is the one who spotted your strength after you survived his arrow. He wanted to face you in one-on-one -on -one calm. Izuku wasted no time using his claws to rend the archer's head from his body, startling the leader, sorry. But he aimed to kill my sister. That's simply unforgivable. So, anything else you want to say? Or should we get this thing started? The elf paused a moment before a maniacal smile spread across his face. Oh ho, oh, you're an interesting guy. Level, 60. Strength, 128. Vitality, 95. Agility, 143. Intelligence, 133. Sense, 122. HP, 18,434 over 18,434. Meanwhile, outside the gate, two S-rank heroes were busy staring each other down. The Draconic Menace, Ryukyu, and the Fires of Hell, Dabai. 
Ryuki you didn't look all that imposing. Clothed in a Chinese dress, some might have mistaken her for a damsel. But the gleam in her eyes and the large talons extending from her hands put more than enough fear into the nearby investigator and monitoring division employees. What business do you have with this red gate, Dabai? Dabai threw back his head and laughed. I thought that was clear already. I have no business with this gate, only the bastard inside it. Izuku Midoriya, the only survivor of my brother's raiding party. My dad doesn't give a shit about his kids. Even if he is an ass, my sister is busy bawling her eyes out because of his death, and my younger bro is too disconnected to care. So it's up to the big bro to avenge him. Izuku Midoriya, what rank is he? He's an E rank according to the agency documents. Vukiyu shook her head. Then there's no way a weak E rank like him could kill one of your powerful siblings, correct? Dabai grumbled. False rankers exist to kill others you know. Mr. Todoroki, a slightly calmer voice, belonging to Tsukachi, interjected. As a member of the monitoring division, it's my responsibility to take care of any S-ranks from out of the country. But I cannot condone the murder of anyone you deem fit. I don't care what rank you are. Look at you. Dabai scoffed. So brave for a little man. He got in Tsukachi's personal space. Face it little man. That gate closed, its boss was killed and only that shrimp survived, meaning he's the only possible suspect for who killed my brother. He wasn't someone who was stupid enough to risk his life on a boss, he knew when to run. Sukachi sighed. I myself suspected Izuku Midoriya of a reawakening as of late, but when we went to measure his magical signature, it was still that of any rank, and government papers indicate that he's not in possession of a quirk. Thankfully, the UA entrance exams were not a broadcasted event, meaning Izuku's shadowy servants still remained a secret to everyone outside of the Red Gate. Dabai grumbled. Well, I'm slowly starting to lose any excitement I had about this situation. So how about it, Kayu? You want to spice things up tonight? His hands lit up with blue flames, just like old times. He didn't wait for an answer, instead choosing to punch out with his fiery fist. Ryukyu, however, was not caught off guard and her claws drilled through the air, aiming to cut straight through the villainous hero. The remaining members of the association dove for cover, because when S-ranks clashed, they clashed hard. An explosion of blue flames and invisible shockwaves radiated out, ripping up the surrounding area. Kadiha, Dabai chuckled. Not too shabby little man. Sakachi stood between the two, one hand holding back Dabai's burning first, the other gripping Rukyu's wrist. His suit sleeves were shredded like paper, exposing only his muscles' forearms, now slightly bruised from the insane impacts of two S-ranks. To be able to stop both of us, Sukachi let out a sigh of relief. If you hadn't dulled your blows in time, both of my arms would have been broken. He then fixed Dabai with a serious glare. I won't repeat myself Mr. Todoroki. I cannot condone this type of behavior whilst you're here in Japan. Dabai brushed off his hands, ash falling from them. Whatever. If you won't let me have my fun with Rukiu at least, then just drive me to my hotel. Sukachi bowed even as Dabai turned away. Izuku Midoriya. Just what are you? To attract this sort of attention. You must be one special person. He thought to himself as he calmly walked back to his car, determined to glean more of the boy's secrets as soon as possible. TCH. Izuku scowled as the elf raised his hands up, one holding a dagger loosely. This one's definitely the boss. His gauntlet strike against him had been easily deflected. Hey now, let's not get too heated just yet. The elf's disturbing smile refused to vanish. Now that the one you had a grudge with is dead, we can just chat right. What do you want? Well hold on. He bowed slightly, you can call me Getten, what should I call you? My name doesn't matter to dead men. Getten's shoulders shook with a sudden mirth. I swear, you're just the funniest guy. He stepped off his horse with practiced efficiency. Here's the thing, I've got a deal for you. But first, I want to know something. Why protect humans when you yourself are not human? Izuku shook his head. Realizing that the villain was just attempting to throw him off, just spit out the deal so I can refuse it and we can get down to business. Getten's smile dropped and he looked genuinely disappointed. Are you serious? In our heads, there's a constant command, a voice, telling us to kill humans. But you, I can't hear that voice looking at you, like you aren't human. Noticing that Izuku's expression had not softened he sighed. Fine, since I have no desire or orders to kill someone like you, then simply hand over those humans behind you. I'll spare your life and it's no skin off yo. Getten paused, his eyes widening as shadows poured off his back. You made the same mistake as him. Izuku said, gesturing callously at the elf he decapitated, you've attacked my friend and you threaten my sister. Skill, appearance befitting a ruler has activated. Igris and the lead bear flanked Izuku, the latter emitting a low growl as their liege's armor folded over him. Magicians, the robed shadows didn't even need to be given orders. Their master's rage and disgust had a clear target. Before the elves could respond in kind, half of the battlefield was alight with burning flames, trapping the twenty or so villains in a vortex of fire. Izuku had no doubt that the lesser elves were struggling to fight through the fire, but he also held no hope that it had killed Geten. 
His beliefs were confirmed as the snowy surroundings erupted with ice, smothering the flames instantly and subsequently shattering. His hand raised high, Geton tilted his head. And here I thought it was just some cheap trick. Get used to disappointment, Izuku said, lowering into a crouch. As you wish. Wait, did he just get my reference? Igris shoved Izuku behind him before he could finish his thought. Geton's right dagger met Igris's longsword as his left hand shot forwards, going to wrap itself around his wrist. The ice bear was not keen on that happening and went to slam his claws down on the elf, ready to squash him like a bug. It didn't matter how strong Geton thought he was. It would be dangerous to get trapped under the paw of such a huge beast. His slight hesitation was enough for Igris to leverage his sword against Geton's dagger, locking then in one of the elven blade's unique curves. Enforcing the dagger in place, Geton was forced to drop the blade, still somehow unperturbed by the loss of his weapon as he jumped back, avoiding the paw strike. Did you really think that was my weapon? I have far more power than a simple blade could hold. Izuku's eyebrows shot into the sky as the entire forest was lifted. Well, that wasn't exactly true. Geton lifted all the snow off the ground with one hand, creating the illusion of the forest hovering for just a moment. Condensing into hundreds of separate points, the light fluffy snow changed, forming clear, hard as steel, pointed icicles. All of them were aimed straight for Izuku. He had no choice but to disable his armor and increase his agility back to its normal state. Skill, Sprint LV. 2 has activated. Movement speed increased by 50%. Izuku wasn't sure if Igris and the bear were just moving to kill the threat for his sake, or if they understood his plan, they seemed to be working together in perfect unison. There has to be some form of mental communication going on. Just as Izuku completed his thought, Geton's arm acted out the motion of throwing something, directing the hundred icy spears at him. Izuku barely had a moment of time to raise his gauntlet, blocking the nearest icicle, fast. He dove, rolling forwards and feeling the attack scrape against his back. Propping up on one knee, green grass beneath him, he reared his fist back. Mechanical destruction has activated. Geton stumbled backwards as the shockwave of Izuku's punch rocked the air, smashing the ice like it was built from wet sand. But that wasn't a problem for him. There was still moisture in the air, and he had plenty of mana left to reconstruct them. It would be Izuku's loss, or at least it would have been, if he hadn't stumbled back into the jaws of the ice bear and the sword of Igris. Unfortunately, Izuku's own shadows were similarly battered by the wind and were thrown off their mark. Igris's blade only sliced up his side, instead of piercing his chest and the shadow bear only managed to take off a hand, leaving Geton free to conjure up another hail of projectiles with his remaining arm. Igris and his new monstrous compatriot doved to the side, giving Geton a burst of relief. Had they chosen to attack, they might have been able to do fatal damage, not before he took them out himself. But his relief was reduced to atoms in mere moments as he realized he was looking down the barrel of a Barrett M99. He had no idea what the name meant, but he knew that the weapon Yeyarazu was holding was dangerous. Fire! Izuku shouted from his spot behind Geton. Yeyarazu chambered her mana-enhanced bullet, breathed out, and pulled the trigger on the anti-material rifle. The kickback was enough to break collarbones and dislocate shoulders, but Yeyarazu's enhanced physical abilities handled it like a pro. Barely budging from her spot, she watched in awe as Geton's arm went spinning through the air, severed at the shoulder by the high-caliber round. A-H-H-H. Geton's unfazed attitude was finally shattered and just like his ice, it didn't have the chance to reform. The moment between Yeyarazu chambering the round and firing had given him just enough time to avoid a shot directly to the chest, but it was too late. This ice elf had magical abilities that were unparalleled when it came to cryokinetics. He could pull moisture out of the very air to create deadly barrages of weapons. But he also had one major flaw. He was intelligent. Geton didn't need his hands or even arms to make his magic work. And yet, in this moment, he found that he was as helpless as a baby ice bear. He knew he was screwed beyond belief and that panic had set in, keeping him from forming even the most basic shapes. Turning around, he gasped as Izuku's claws dug into his chest, grasping his heart and mercilessly crushing it. I, why, can't I, since you? The hero's stealth faded, revealing the bloody and gruesome scene. Like I said, you made a mistake. The literal light began fading from his glowing ice blue eyes. Mass. Teru. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Looking around, Izuku could see that his infantry, magicians, and other bearers had already torn through the remaining ice elves. Thanks to their combined teamwork only himself, Igris, the bear, and Yeyurazu had been necessary to kill Geton. Shadow Monster LV. 30 is now capable of ranking up. Hem. Izuku looked over to the lead shadow bear. Panting like a dog, Geton's arm in its mouth, and what Izuku could have sworn was a smile on its face. Rank up. Shadow Monster LV. One night grade. Oh thank god, Izuku exclaimed. I was getting tired of just calling you bear. Hmm. What? What do I call you? It was so much easier with Igris. He mused out loud, attracting his sister's attention. 
Let's call him Smokey. Huh? Izuku gave her the old, annoyed sibling look. He's not going to be putting out fires. No, look at his back. Izuku followed her instructions, seeing nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. And, she sighed, as if it was the most obvious thing in the world, and pointed to Igris, now look at him and back to Smokey. You see the difference. She grabbed his chin and jerked his head back and forth, forcing him to glance between the two. Now that she mentions it, I do see it. Whereas Igris's shadow was clean, defined, and only smoked around his cape, the bear was practically spurting out the dark and Kai shadow mist. It made him look like he was on fire and, well, smoking. Okay, it's creative, I'll give you that. But there's no way I'm naming an awesome shadow summon like him Smokey. Oh, are you serious? Izuku shouted into the air, greatly confusing Sakura, who could in no way see the system messages. Just, ugh, whatever, let's get everyone out of here. He nodded to Yayarazu, who was standing in wait by the newly generated, spinning gate. Could you take her through? I've got one more thing to do. All right, but remember, you owe me some answers after this. Izuku smiled, and maybe a dinner. Yeyorazu blushed furiously, realizing that this was the first time he had asked her on a date and not the other way around. She said nothing else, resting one hand on the small of Sakura's back, her other hand on the restraints securing Shinji, dragging both of them back to the real world. Wipe that shit-eating grin off your face, Sakura. I can see it from a mile away. I called it. Izuku shook his head with a chuckle before getting back to business. As soon as he was the only one left inside the gate he stalked over the Getan's cold corpse and held out his hand. Arise. Shadow Elf LV. 12 Night Grade. Should I just name him Getan? Izuku scowled. The name had left a bad taste in his mouth after the horrible things Getan had attempted to do. Looking over the slim and robust wizard elf, no particular attribute stood out over another. Let's see. Freeze translates to Hyoksu. But that's too wordy. How about Hyo? Izuku tasted the name in his mind a few times before speaking out loud. You're now Hyo. Shadow Elf LV. 12 Night Grade now designated as Hyo. Hyo knelt to his new master, the same creepy smile on his face that Getan once had, causing Izuku to give him a look of disdain. Cut that out. Hyo instantly became stone-faced and Izuku finally felt himself relax. The rest of the elves were weaker than the bears and knights, so it's not really worth extracting their shadows. Oh well, it's time to go home. Izuku scooped up Getan's old dagger as he sent the shadows back into his own shadow. He wasn't a user of daggers, but this weapon was at least a rank and rarity. That should sell for a pretty penny. Right. It's been a week by now. One of the investigator division members said, You should go home Ryukyu, we can keep watch for now. But Ryukyu didn't move from her spot. She had already been angered enough by Dabai's appearance, and this red gate was not helping. Even if she went home, she'd never sleep. Honestly, that jerk. He doesn't get to call me Kayu anymore. The association employees tilted their heads at the slight blush that was forming on Ryukyu's face. I refuse to leave while some of my people are stuck inside a gate. Then, almost as if the universe was listening to her, the red gate conveniently split open, like an oyster revealing its pearl. Ryukyu's eyes shot wide open, any other distractions cast aside as the faces of relieved, and some crying, low-rank heroes emerged. Her real shock came as Yeyorazu emerged, dragging along Shinji, still unconscious and tied up. What on earth are you doing with my employee like that? One of the survivors, the B-rank girl, held up calming hands. Please miss Tatsuma. She helped save us. It was Shinji who attacked us. What? Her skin began to lose its perfect complexion as it shifted to a scaly covering. I demand answers. She shouted at Yeyorazu, unable to comprehend one of her up-and-coming ranks being capable of snapping under the pressure. Then get your answers from your heroes, Izuku said, stepping out of the gate with his fur coat flapping in the wind behind him. We're going home. He took Sakura by the shoulder and Yeyurazu by the hand, guiding them out of the wide alleyway. Rukiyu was not happy with the answer and wrapped her claws around his own shoulder, nearly piercing through his clothes. I am Rukiyu, the S-rank hero and the head of the Dragon Guild, and none of us are members of your agency. But, we are the reason the remaining heroes even survived. Izuku felt awful to talk to one of his heroes like this. Ryukyu was one of his favorite top ten, but he could feel Sakura and Yehuraza's exhaustion next to him. He didn't want to put them through anymore. I. Ryukyu heaved out a heavy breath, doing her best to relieve all the toxic emotions she had been subjected to in the past few hours. I apologize. I've been under a lot of stresses of late. Izuku's expression softened. I understand. I'm sorry as well, but these two need rest. Ryukyu nodded, very well. As soon as they disappeared into the night, she felt her body relax. What was that? Was I nervous? No, I felt it. If I wanted to, I could kill him. But I would have to be prepared to lose an arm in that fight, maybe more. Ryukyu snapped her fingers at her nearest employee, someone not actually from the association. You. I want that man, whoever he was, recruited within the week. You have my full support. 
All right, Izuku said, sitting down on the couch next to Yeirazu. Sakura had just fallen asleep and he was ready to fulfill his promise to Yeirazu. Here it is, the story of how I became strong. Yeirazu's expression was one of wonder as she looked around, staring at the system display. As expected, the system had sensed the player's intention to reveal itself to this girl and gave in, allowing her to see it the same way Izuku did, and the rest is history. He finished, doing his best to gauge her response. I I mean, this is just, incredible. Yeirazu traced the words across the screen with her finger. I've never heard of anything like this existing anywhere in the world before. Is there, a limit, a level cap or something? I wouldn't know. Then, is it possible that you could keep getting stronger and stronger? Forever. Izuku nodded. Wow, she breathed out. A genuine sparkle of intrigue and excitement caught in her eyes. With this, you could become the strongest hero in the world. So, you're not, freaked out by it. The fact that I'm bringing back the dead. Or the fact that it forced me to kill. Yeirazu gave him a slightly exasperated glance. You're you. She said as if that answered everything. I knew you before the system happened and I know you now. She took his hand in hers, doing her best not to blush too brightly. You've changed. You're taller, stronger, maybe. A bit more handsome, and more confident. But you're still Izuku Midoriya. You're still the person I. LLL. Yeirazu huffed, stealing her nerves. You're still the person I like. For just a moment, the loud declaration echoed as Izuku sat there, eyes wide, and mind scrambled. He was no fool. He had seen the way Yeirazu acted and had concluded she had some sort of feelings for him. But it was still too much for him. Izuku had never been ugly per se, but he had been scrawny, short, owned a baby face, and had acne like any other teenager. That, in addition to his overly shy attitude and lack of strength made him a less than suitable candidate in the lady's eyes, and Bakugo's constant attempt to put Izuku down had only continued to decrease his self-esteem. It was for those reasons that Izuku remained in stunned silence for a good twenty seconds. He simply could not believe that Momo Yeirazu, a beautiful, smart, and dangerous girl had confessed her feelings to him, Izuku Midoriya, of all people. This silence left Yeirazu squirming in her seat, terrified of his response. I am sorry, that was too sudden. I understand if you... No, Izuku exclaimed, perhaps a bit too forcefully. I mean, no. He squeezed her quickly retreating hand back. It's not too sudden. I like you too. You like me. As a friend or... Izuku did his best to stifle the rising laugh that bubbled in his throat. He couldn't risk waking Sakura. The two of them had already been quite loud after all, as more than a friend. Absolutely more than a friend. Yeirazu's entire body relaxed at once and she fell back to the couch's soft leather with a massive exhale. Oh thank god. And with that, she passed into unconsciousness, her grip on Izuku's hand going limp. Izuku raised an eyebrow. Seriously? I can't tell if I should be impressed. He chuckled and stood, moving her body so that she wasn't at risk of sliding off the couch in the middle of the night, taking a blanket from his own bed. He gently laid the plush fabric over her. He knew from experience that it was like being cuddled by the fluffiest dog all over your body, she'd sleep just fine with it. Speaking of sleep, Izuku thought to himself, tiredly rubbing his eyes as he glanced at the clock, I should get some, it's already past five in the morning. Wasting no time, Izuku crawled onto his mattress and closed his eyes drifting off to dreamland easier than he ever had before. Yukiu leaned back in her creaky office chair, desperately attempting to relax after such a stressful day. Unfortunately, the incessant ringing of her phone gave her no relief. What? She growled into the receiver after picking up. She may have been a calm and collected figure in the public eye, but after having to deal with reporters for two hours in regards to the Red Gate incident, her patience had vanished. Well geez, Rukiu, a smooth voice echoed in her ear, who pulled your chain today? The dragon lady gave a tentative smile as she recognized the voice, sorry Hawks, just, trying to wait out the reporters. You looked perfect on screen, as always, not in the mood for jokes, if you have something to say, spit it out. She could just barely hear him chuckling over the other line, serious as always. Well, I just thought I'd let the ten know about my recent findings in Korea. Korea. Yukiu felt a bit of energy re-enter her body and she leaned forwards, as if her proximity to the phone would grant her more of Hawk's ever more elusive secrets. What the hell are you doing in Korea? As it turns out, Japan called South Korea's agency association about a week ago with a pretty heavy request. Our association called theirs. Yukiu asked, shocked by the sudden development. Why? We've been on bad terms ever since Endeavor and Cha Hee and took down the Song Pa Gu Tower in their scuffle. Well get this, Japan requested nothing but a simple consultation. Rukiu was beginning to become bored, with who? Any and all heroes who experienced the Shai Hasekai raid. Rukiu's immediate instinct was to pick up the phone and slam it down, silencing the call, but she held herself back, tell me everything. 
Four years ago, the 5th S-rank gate opened on Jeju Island, nicknamed the Shai Hasekai Incident. It took three attempts before the South Korean government gave up and declared the island a total loss. From a satellite's view the only thing that could be seen was stone spikes that stretched out as far as the eye could see. The villains that poured from that gate were not numerous or specialized in any combat style. They were, however, some of the most powerful demons they had ever fought. Their only known rival was that of the first S-rank gate's boss, a dragon that burned the entirety of America's west coast. Vukiu and Hawks had both given the Koreans their assistance during the third and supposedly final raid. It was an utterly unique experience for two reasons. For one, it was the first S-rank raid either had ever participated in. And for another, it was the first time either of them had ever had a near-death experience. Japan isn't seriously planning a raid, right? Ryukyu exclaimed, just leave that hellhole alone. They can't get off the island anyways. Wheo, Hawks drawled out, nothing in his voice betraying even a hint of apprehension about that. Two days ago, a Namu-type villain washed up on Japan's coast. It was dead, but its body had been twisted, modified. What do you mean modified? When the autopsy was performed, it was concluded that gills and insectoid wings had been grafted onto its body through intelligent means. Ryukyu's blood had run cold by this point. H. How is that possible? Any technology left on that island is long dead by now. Even if they were smart enough to use it, it's impossible. That's why Japan called Korea. They want to take out whatever is causing these augmentations before they become too advanced. If we wait any longer, those bastards aren't just going to trickle into the world. They'll overrun it. Izuku despised the passage of the next four days, even though he knew that his acceptance letter was going to arrive. Thanks to All Might's remark about him being one of the top scorers, he couldn't help but grow anxious with its arrival. But while that was making him nervous, there was another little something that was churning his insides like butter. Waking up the morning after the Red Gate incident, he found that the couch Yairazu had been sleeping on was empty and that the apartment itself was completely absent of her presence. Was she embarrassed by her own confession? Or by Izuku's reciprocation? He couldn't be sure what the reason was and although he had her number, he lacked the guts to press send on any of the dozen or so texts he had compiled for her. And while Sakura's constant nagging for him to man up was reason enough to get it over with, he still refused. Snapping back to reality as he sat on the couch where Yeyurazu had slept, he noticed Sakura creeping to the front door. Her backpack hung over her shoulder. Remember, be home by five or your shadow is going to kidnap you. He said with a teasing smile. Sakura just shook her head, giving him her perfectly practiced death glare. You're worse than mom. Hey, you're the one who decided it would be a good idea to sneak into a C-rank raid. She huffed. Will you at least tell me what you did to my friend? Your Fryo you mean the one that was selling people those fake beginner's licenses? He stood, his eyes sparkling with a threatening emerald light. I just gave her a bit of a scare, nothing a little therapy won't fix. In reality, all Izuku had done was report her to the principal, who was apparently talented enough in her duty of scaring children out of stupidity, that she also scarred them in the process. But what Izuku wasn't lying about was Sakura's shadow. After a bit of practice and plenty of experimentation Izuku found that he could force his own soldiers into another's shadow, tracking them and keeping them safe if he so desired. Hayo, Igris, and Smokey were all extremely important members of his army, so instead of giving her one extremely powerful shadow he gave her five infantry and five ice bears. Combined, they were more than enough to handle any B-ranks that dared to threaten the shadow monarch's little sister. C-ranks were less than nothing compared to the newly leveled up knights and bears. What should I do for the day? Izuku opened his inventory, looking around for anything interesting. He hadn't been able to sleep last night so as the clock struck midnight and his daily quest reset, he set out on a cold and dark run, meaning that he had no purpose for today. I could go sell Gatton's old dagger, see what it's worth at an auction, he thought to himself as he traced his fingers past the inventory icons, stopping suddenly as he came across a gleaming white key, engraved with golden strand-like patterns. Item, the world above key. Item class, S. Type, key. A key that allows you to create an instance dungeon. You may use this just outside of the Endeavor Agency. I held back from using this back then because my level was too low, but maybe I should give it a try. I've still got a hearthstone, so there's no real danger, right? Even from 50 feet away Izuku was absolutely certain he could feel the heat emanating from the Endeavor Agency. Is that my sense stat? Or is it really generating this intense heat? If it was the latter, Izuku could only imagine the torture of sitting in a swelteringly hot office all day. I hope they have a C in there. Activating stealth, Izuku crossed the street nonchalantly, taking the beautifully crafted marble key from his pocket, moving to stab it into the air just in front of the agency doors. He was overcome with an incredible pressure that stopped him in his tracks. The doors slammed open, revealing a literally burning endeavor. It was then that Izuku realized the metal of the door was covered in scorch marks, likely from the hero's previous aggressive exit. 
still covered in his stealth ability. Izuku was invisible to the naked eye, but that did not stop Endeavor from pausing in his tracks, looking around in confusion. He could swear that he felt another strong presence in front of him. What is it, boss? A lady with literal fiery hair asked him, we going or not? Endeavor opened his mouth to reply, but suddenly felt the presence vanish. Fine, let's go. Izuku heaved a sigh of relief as he passed through the gate that was only visible to him. While he had grown far stronger thanks to the Red Gate, he was still nowhere near the level of an S rank and he didn't want to know what would happen if someone tried sneaking up on the number 2 hero. His body relaxed even further upon seeing the pearly white gates before him, laid out like a literal vision of heaven. Looking down, his feet appeared to be standing atop a solid layer of clouds. Don't blink. What the hell does that? Izuku didn't get to finish his thought as he defied the system orders and closed his eyes briefly against the blinding light. His back was racked with pain as he went flying forwards, impacting against one of the gate's immovable bars. He fell onto his now extremely sore back. Groaning as he rolled over, his eyes scanned through the room in an attempt to glean his attacker's location, but finding nothing more than five angel statues scattered throughout the room. They made no attempt to move, but Izuku knew from experience that statues were nothing to be underestimated, wasting no time. He launched himself at the closest statue, cocking his fist back as he got right up in its face. A blast of wind and pressure obscured Izuku's view, but he knew something was wrong from the way that his knuckles ached. There was no give, no momentary lack of resistance, only a rock-hard, perfectly still being. This isn't right, Izuku thought to himself, quickly spinning around to see that not only had the statues moved, but they were crowding around him in a perfect circle, their posture the same as before they had surrounded him. While Izuku went flying once more, Unable to even comprehend where the blows had come from, it felt like he had been punched in four places simultaneously. Now certain that he could not handle whatever these beings were on his own, he called to his army, come forth. Igris, Hayo, and Smokey were the first to emerge, putting themselves between the statues and their leech. Izuku hacked, feeling like he needed to cough up a lung, involuntarily looking to the ground as he did so. In that brief moment of his averted gaze, his ears were filled with a cacophony of battle sounds. Quickly looking back, he saw that Igris had his sword embedded in one of the statues. At first, it seemed like fortune had smiled down on him once more, but quickly he realized that Igris hadn't stabbed the statue, rather he had gotten his sword trapped in its innards. With an almost comedic amount of effort put into it, Igris heaved and heaved at his sword, doing his damnedest to pull it out, but to no avail. As Izuku got closer, examining the statue's body to the best of his ability, the other four angels left his field of vision and sound once again exploded onto the battlefield. Izuku couldn't help but look away from Igris's plight and noticed that now the other angels were frozen mid-battle locked in combat with his shadows. And finally, as he looked back to Igris, who now had his blade back in hand, the statue a few feet away, it clicked. Don't blink. They only move when I don't see them. Which means, Izuku retreated into the thicket of his shadows, allowing himself to trust in their abilities. Once he was sufficiently hidden by his army, Izuku closed his eyes, clangs and clashes screaming out once more. If Izuku was being honest, it was an absolutely terrifying experience. To be unable to see how the battle was faring, to be ignorant to his mono level, and to not know when the next strike to his own body may come. For a grueling 10 minus, Izuku stood still, his own idea of his surroundings being his sense stat. He could feel Igris's presence as he cut down. A statue. It was a being unlike anything he had ever felt before, something completely abstract and incomprehensible and yet, his shadows still cut them down like any other villain they had faced before. And then, everything was still. Izuku's eyes cracked open, seeing his army kneeled before him, the statue and their remnants nowhere to be found. The only sign that they had ever existed to begin with were two small items clutched in Igris's hands as he presented the gifts to his liege, signifying the end of the battle and cementing Izuku's trust in his comrades. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Item, Angel's Demonic Wing. Item Class, S. Item Type, Bronze Sword. Attack, Plus 120. Active Skill, Paralyzing Storm. The user's sword will shed its outer layer of perfectly sharpened feathers. Up to five dozen can be sent at once to seek out and paralyze enemies for a short period of time. Item Class A Type Key Level 65 Strength 133 Vitality 100 Agility 148 Intelligence 150 Sense 127 HP 20134 over 20134 Item Heavenly Gates Key Item Class A Type Key Izuku clutched the key in his hand, contemplating his options. Had I come here before the job change quest, I would have been dead. I need to get even stronger. He nodded and he called his shadows back to himself, his decision made, depositing the key into his inventory.
He made for the double doors that framed the exit, which were practically nothing next to their big brother, those perfectly sculpted gates. With the angels dead and their drops collected, there was nothing left for him here, so he took his leave and emerged back onto the busy street in front of Endeavor's agency. Thankfully, the number two seconds burning presence was nowhere to be felt and Izuku was free to make his way back over to the nearby cafe where he had parked his motorcycle. Its winding halls and massive structures were akin to a labyrinth, confusing, indistinguishable, and students crowding the halls. This was Yue High, the best and only hero school in the country qualified enough to take in and S-rank students. Izuku was glad he had rectified his application in time. Otherwise the school uniform he was wearing right now would have been far too short on his newly grown frame. Scouring the halls, he desperately attempted to find one in time. He hadn't woken up late, or taken too long getting ready. No, he had gotten to school a little under 30 minutes early and yet, he was still unable to locate that damn door. In fact, he was so lost in his fifth examination of the campus map, that he almost didn't notice himself about to bump into one of his fellow classmates. Stopping short, he allowed himself to give in and finally ask, I'm sorry, but I'm lost. Do you have any idea where class 1 is? The girl spun around, causing him to trail off. Oh, it's you, she exclaimed loudly, drawing a tad bit of ire from the upperclassmen and women. It took a moment for Izuku to recognize her. After all, for her it had only been four days, but for him it had been eleven days since the entrance exam thanks to the time dilation of the red gate. I'm Achako Uraraka, she introduced, bowing low, and earning a mirrored response from Izuku. Once she had finally straightened her posture, she asked, with somewhat red cheeks, Hey, um, do you know if that night guy made it through the exam? Night guy. Izuku tilted his head for a moment before recalling Igris presenting Uraraka to him during the exam. You mean Igris? Without another word, Igris rose from Izuku's shadow, causing Uraraka to eke out a surprised yelp. W wait. What? Izuku smirked, having a bit of fun teasing this new girl. He's one of my summons. Uraraka turned bright red at the realization that what she had become infatuated with over the past few days was nothing more than a chunk of mana given physical form. Huh? Huh? Oh? No 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 no. What's wrong? Izuku asked, still amused, he doesn't bite. And hey, he's single. This sent the girl sprinting away through the halls, her hands covering her face. Izuku looked over his shoulder to Igris. Was that too much? The shadow simply shrugged and slunk back into the darkness, leaving Izuku alone to realize that he still had no idea where Class 1 was. He could send out his 52 shadows to scour the place, but he also wasn't in the mood to start a panic on his first day of class. Just as he was about to give in, he felt a tap on his shoulder, spinning him around in surprise. This place was so crowded with high-level mana sources that Izuku was having trouble picking anyone out of the crowd. He was even more shocked when his eyes met Yeyorazu's. H. Hi, Izuku practically shouted, now realizing that he was replicating Yuraraka's embarrassment. H. Hey, she responded, her hands clasped in front of her with a nervous energy, about the other night, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. I was being too forward with you. Her eyes averted his confused gaze. Huh, I, I thought you were upset with me. That's why you weren't calling me. Realization dawned on Izuku as he sighed. I'm sorry, but I thought you were ignoring me. Yeirazu looked back up, her expression of shame morphing to one of confusion. Why would you think that? When I woke up that morning, you had already left. Yeirazu nodded vigorously. Yeah, I had a doctor's appointment. Oh, Izuku felt like slapping himself. This is why Akam's razor exists, you idiot. I'm inexperienced with relationships, but from what I've seen on television, it's always the guy who makes the first move. Izuku barked out a sudden laugh, realizing just how silly the situation was. Here they were, two people who had obvious feelings for each other and yet, neither could get their message across without acting like total fools. Their eyes glimmered with humor and relief now that the situation had been somewhat subtle, opening her mouth to say something. Yeyarazu was cut off as the bell began to toll, sending her and Izuku sprinting away, searching for the ever-elusive Class 1A. Thankfully, for whatever reason, Izuku and Yeirazu found their classroom entirely devoid of any form of teacher, even though the bell had rung over three minutes ago. Instead, they found one very loud, very blonde teenager with his feet propped up on the desk. What are gonna do? Four eyes. Take that stick out of your ass and shove it up mine. Excuse me. You heard me. Bakugo yelled, his bored eyes shifting for a moment and catching sight of Izuku, widening to the size of dinner plates. Ada noticed his sudden interest in whoever was behind him, and blanched, realizing that it was the same examinee he had berated before the exam had begun. With overly exaggerated and robotic movements, Ada stomped over to Izuku, I am from Sumi Private Academy. My name is, Ada Tenya. Izuku answered for him, I know, you told me right before the exam started. Feeling more calm than when he had last met the rigid and unyielding teen. 
Izuku gave him a smile and slightly bowed his head, introducing himself. I apologize for my earlier rudeness. I had no idea there was so much more to the exam. I truly ended up misjudging you. Oh, Izuku was honestly taken aback. Nowadays, not many people were humble or well-meaning enough to admit their mistakes. It was such a breath of fresh air that he didn't even notice the dark mana creeping up behind him. Hey, a tired voice said, if you're here to make friends, get out. The class's attention shifted from Ida and Izuku to the man dressed in drab gray and black clothing. Otherwise, put those on and meet me out by Battleground Beta. At the opposite wall of the classroom, the wall pulled itself open, revealing a total of 20 numbered cases. I guess those are our official hero outfits. Izuku's head tilted. Not only had he never seen or heard of a hero matching this man's description, he had also never seen any man that looked this tired. And I guess he's our teacher. It was the first day of class, so Izuku wholeheartedly expected the locker rooms to be filled with an awkward silence. But instead, the redhead Kirishima was boisterously shouting and bantering with his classmate. A few still managed to keep to themselves, but the notable ones were Bakugo and Izuku, who were exuding so much mana that Kirishima was having trouble focusing on his jovial personality. Hey, a small student with hair dyed purple whispered to one of the tallest students, What's up with those two? They look like they want to kill each other. The tall, multi-armed student nodded, can you not sense it? They are trying to kill each other. Or, at the very least, see who backs down first from their extreme presence. Are you kidding? A high-pitched voice asked belonging to a student with electric yellow hair, they're our classmates. They seem more like villains with that power. Well, we may seem like villains, but we also have incredible hearing. A hand rested on the blonde's shoulder gently, causing him to yelp and jump about a foot in the air. He went to bow and apologize, but Izuku stopped him with a chuckle, sorry about that. Kaminari, right, but the two of us have some. Bad blood. Kaminari looked back to the two lockers, surprised to see that both were now absent of their owners. I can imagine Izuku sneaking away. He's kinda quiet, but Bakugo's too obnoxious to be stealthy. Just what's going on with my classmates? He was just as surprised when he laid eyes on Izuku's hero costume. It was nothing more than a simple loose, fluttering, and black trench coat that was open at the front over a grey t-shirt and black jeans that looked tailor-made so he could move around easier. If nobody knew any better, they would assume he was dressed in his casual attire. Izuku was beginning to really get the hang of this power-measuring thing. The blonde boy in front of him had such enormous amounts of mana that he couldn't help but be confused by his paranoia. The really short one, he was pretty sure his name was Minta, had barely any mana, same with the tall one behind him, Shoji. But since Yue only accepted the ones who could become the strongest, Izuku knew they had a reason for being here. From now on, he'd have to be wary of every single classmate, no matter what amount of power he got from them. Usually battle training is All Might's deal, but he's too busy with the cameras to be here. The teacher practically spat out the word cameras. You're going to be fighting in a simple one-on-one -on -one so I can see where you're at. You've already been put into groups of two, so don't bother complaining when you see your opponents. Um, excuse me, sir. Uraraka raised her hand. Sir, he said, realizing he had never introduced himself. Oh, I'm Mr. Aizawa. Mr. Aizawa, what about the orientation for today? What about it? Aizawa asked. There's nothing that you're going to learn there that you need. Now unless anyone else has any more questions, I'll read the matches out. First up, we have Izuku Midoriya vs. Katsuki Bakugo. Phew, fate really has a weird way of working, Kaminari joked, earning himself a tired glare from Aizawa. No interrupting. Aizawa read out the remaining battles, but Izuku wasn't listening. He was too busy celebrating on the inside. All right, we're already out here, so you two go to opposite ends of the battleground and I'll call start from the control room. Everyone else, follow me there. As the street was left alone to Bakugo and Izuku, who turned their backs to each other, strutting away, Bakugo yelled over his shoulder, I'll kill you, you worthless nerd. A few quiet laughs escaped Izuku's throat as bloodlust poured from his body and his eyes erupted with emerald light, neither of which Bakugo noticed. I'd expect nothing less. Begin. Magician. Izuku called out one of his sorcerers. Spot him for me. Magician is using skill. Detection. Suddenly, Izuku was able to see Bakugo's glowing outline through even the buildings. Much to his disappointment, however, it was not needed. Bakugo was taking the forwards approach, intending to take Izuku head on. The magician prepared a giant fire attack. But Izuku waved him back into his shadow. I want to beat him on my own. It doesn't mean anything if I have to rely on you guys. D.A.K.U. The scream echoed throughout the fake city streets alongside the sound of rapid-fire explosions. His quirk is in a rank, his mana is S, and his skill is a low S his ranking outweighs mine, but his attacks should be at a similar level to my own. Suddenly, the explosions were right there with him, revealing Bakugo's approach from the sky, there you are, hiding won't do you any good. 
Hmm? Was all Izuku said as Bakugo crashed down, his quirk triggering a massive explosion that completely covered the area where Izuku had been standing. H-A-H-A. That was too easy. I knew you cheated your way into Yua. Easy. Izuku asked, a few feet down the street, brushing some of the soot off of his trench coat, we've only just begun. He rolled his shoulders, causing Bakugo to notice the demonic gauntlets covering his hands. Don't go blaming me if you can't keep up. Bakugo was stunned. No one had ever been fast enough to avoid one of his blasts close range. It was basically unthinkable for him. But to Izuku, it was a fairly simple task to step out of the way. Izuku had known Bakugo his whole life. He knew how he fought. He had seen it up close and personal. Because of this, he also knew everything he needed to know about his quirk. In the moment before the attack, the area around his hand would combust and kick up a smoke that obscured his view for just a second. This allowed Izuku to activate stealth and move before the explosion even happened. Of course, this was a fancy trick, but it wasn't enough to completely beat the rage-filled teen. Don't go blaming me if you can't keep up. Izuku bluffed, knowing that he was not the only one who had gotten stronger. Bakugo's explosion wasn't the biggest it could be, but Izuku recognized the new strength and focus behind it. Unlike a hero's awakened strength, which mostly relied on physical attributes, the more unique, quirks, the ones that didn't focus on simple physical enhancement, could grow with the user. Over time and with enough practice, quirks could push someone up an entire rank just from their training. For example, Yeyurazu's quirk could reduce the mana cost it has on her body or her quirk just might work faster. In Bakugo's case, however, it seemed like his quirk was simply destined to grow more destructive. In fact, Izuku's snarky jab only seemed to incense Bakugo more. He took no brief moment to pause in shock or exclaim his disbelief. He simply launched another barrage of fiery explosions. He's gotten too strong for me like this. His quirk's now at a higher or maybe even a low S. Izuku crossed the gauntlets in front of his face, which took the brunt of the attacks, but still managed to rock his body to the core. As the smoke cleared and the fires settled, Izuku emerged, his shadow steel armor covering his body. Oi D.A.K.U. Is that how you cheated your way in? Did your mom buy you those? An enormous boom could be heard for miles around as Izuku wrapped his hand around the back of Bakugo's head and slammed him into the ground. The road cracked under the weight of his blow and a mushroom cloud of dust was kicked up. Mention my mother again, and I will kill you. Bakugo was undeterred though and placed his palm against the ground, wasting no time using his quirk to launch himself out of the crater and into the sky. Izuku could have sworn he almost felt his fingers break as Bakugo's incredible velocity escaped his grasp. As he stumbled back, nursing his sore left hand, Bakugo shot forwards, getting in his face and detonating a point-blank attack. Izuku felt himself crashing through building after building as he attempted to right himself and gain his bearings. It wasn't long before Bakugo was on him again slamming his palm against his back, this time directing Izuku into the air with its explosive force. Bakugo knew that the air was his territory and that while there, he would hold the advantage over the less maneuverable Izuku. I was too confident in my abilities. Izuku realized as he was thrown about like a ragdoll, the only thing keeping him conscious and in the fight was his armor. This is it, Deku. Bakugo reared back his left arm, preparing to launch the final attack. But it was at that moment that Izuku righted himself in the air. Skill, mechanical destruction has activated. Their attacks collided like a beam clash. The explosive force of Bakugo's attack completely nullified by Izuku's powerful pressure blast. With the armor buffs, in addition to the skill buffs, his strength stat far outweighed anything Bakugo could throw his way. The bully fell back to the earth with asinine speed, his body falling through the very same gaps in the buildings that Izuku had been sent crashing through moments earlier. But just because Bakugo was dealt a massive blow it didn't mean that Izuku was suddenly okay. His armor disappeared from his body as its limit was revealed. Izuku landed on his knees, right next to the crater where his rival lay. He couldn't see his body, but he knew he had won. After all, his strength stat was basically boosted to 1000. There was no way he could stand after that attack. Right. But Bakugo continued to defy Izuku's wishes and his bruised and bloodied hand gripped the edge of what would have been the gravesite of a normal human. Looks like you're all out of tricks. Izuku should have been proud. Even as he lay exhausted on the ground, his body sore and wounded. He should have known that he had accomplished much as in a rank to take on an S rank and still see a fighting chance. And yet, he couldn't help but feel the shame of defeat. He knew that his goal had not been fulfilled. I wanted to beat you. On my own, Izuku breathlessly stated, you were the one person that, more than anything, I wanted to be stronger than. Akugo's eyes nearly bulged out of their sockets with rage, you worthless nerd. He took Izuku by the collar of his shirt and lifted him to eye level. I don't care if you rewakened or not. You still don't have a quirk. You can't beat me. I know I can't. Izuku gave a weak smile, but he can. 
Back Hugo gasped as a cold hand gripped the back of his neck and before he knew it, his entire body was encased in solid ice, forcing Izuku to tear away part of his shirt in order to let him drop to the ground. His eyes met Hayo's, who stood at the ready behind Bakugo, but also appeared to admire his handiwork for a moment. It's okay, Izuku reassured, he won't be able to escape. While Bakugo's inherent explosion power and awakened strength made him almost impossible to cage, there were a few solutions. The most prominent was to cut off his quirk, a nitroglycerin-like sweat that he secreted from his palms. But if that sweat was frozen and he was too cold to produce any more, he was effectively trapped in an inescapable prison. Izuku Midoriya wins, Aizawa's tired and bored voice announced. Now unfreeze him if you can and get back inside, I want to get the rest of the battles over with. Izuku nodded to Hayao, whose shadow seemed to sizzle for a moment in reluctance to his orders, but made no move to disobey them. All at once, the ice fell away to nothing, showing just how proficient Hayao was with his control over moisture. He didn't even need to turn it into water to turn it into air. Bakugo clutched at his throat as he gasped for air. Watching out of the corner of his eye, Izuku walk away, disappointment in his body language. What the hell was that? Deku, you lost, he said, almost like he was trying to argue away the battle's results. I have about four ways to take you down, Hayao being the most efficient. The elf gave his creepy smile to Bakugo, but none of them are of my own strength, so I tried to hold out. But I still almost lost, and in the end, I still had to rely on my shadow. I may have beat you, but I still lost. Ye Arazu wasn't sure what to do. On one hand, she wanted to congratulate Izuku, but on the other hand, she could tell that he wasn't in a good place as he desperately attempted to ignore Bakugo's presence. Both boys had vehemently defied treatment from Recovery Girl, so they looked a little out of place in the room, bodies worn and outfits torn. Midoriya, Aizawa started, a threatening gaze in his eyes, you won the battle, but you held back a lot of your potential strength, that gets people killed, do that again and I'll expel you, catastrophe child, Izuku nodded solemnly, his brain working overtime to try and place this hero, but he couldn't manage it with so little information, expel him, a girl with pink skin asked, you can't do that on the first day can you, I can and will if I need to. Aizawa sighed and rolled his neck, eliciting a few popping sounds. Now, if we could get this over with so I can get back to sleep, I'd be grateful. After the explosive start of Izuku and Bakugo's battle, it seemed difficult to measure up to them. While some matchups, like Kirishima vs. Hagakir, the girl who could turn herself invisible, and Kaminari vs. Takoyami were interesting, none really matched the same power as the first fight, at least, until the final match. Yeyarazu and Todoroki the name snapped Izuku out of his depression and he snuck a glance at the heterochromatic boy. He's Natsuo's brother. Almost as if he was responding to Izuku's unheard question, Shoto's body exploded with a seemingly impossible amount of mana. The entire room could feel it. Even Aizawa, their stern and soic teacher seemed to flinch for a moment. Has he been suppressing that force this entire time? I'd expect nothing less from Endeavor's son. Yeyurazu said, bowing to Shoto as he gestured for her to go first. Endeavors. Son, just what kind of family have I put on my bad side? Izuku asked himself as wall after wall of ice chased after Yeyurazu down on the battlefield. Her rifle the only thing holding back the waves. Izuku knew that Yeyurazu was putting everything she had and more into each and every bullet she created. There was no doubt in his mind that a single one of those bullets could tear through two whole buildings but they were just barely enough to put explosive dents in Shoto's eyes. Her skill, her quirk, her mana, everything. It was all insignificant next to the S-rank's insurmountable force. Within no time, Yeirazu had surrendered. Her mana running dry, while Shoto had barely used up 10% of his own stores. And now, with the battles over, Izuku had found just one more person to be wary of, another monster among men. There's no doubt about it. I still need to become stronger. He glanced over at the Heavenly Gates key, nodding to himself with resolve. I will become stronger, for both Bakugo and Todoroki. Three days had passed since Izuku's perceived defeat. Since then, class had continued like any normal high school would as the teachers worked out some sort of outline for their students' hero training. It had been boring and mostly trivial busy work. The stuff that Izuku did not miss from middle school. In fact, the only real interesting event that had taken place was the election for class president. Izuku, unlike most of the class, chose not to vote for himself, instead choosing to vote for Yeirazu. It was something that she became extremely embarrassed over once she figured out who had been responsible for her position as vice president. Ada had gotten the role of president after he had displayed a decent chunk of leadership qualities during a sudden campus alarm caused by the media. By lunch of the fourth day, Izuku was itching for action. Maybe I should try taking on the heavenly gates again when I get home. I still refuse to believe this little squirt could take down Shoji, Mina Ashido said, leering at Minda. Kaiwi Kajiro nodded, her backpack jostling as she set it down next to the lunch table. Who knew an E rank could take down a B rank? 
Minta gave a smug grin as he crossed his arms. Oh ye of little faith. I may not have much mana like you two ladies, he said, his eyebrows waggling, but my quirk isn't something to scoff at. In fact, Principal Nezu himself told me that I had one of the best combat support quirks he'd ever seen. Principal Nezu, Izuku asked, interjecting, you met him? Of course. So then, is it true? Minta's eyes nearly crossed for a moment. What? Mina caught on quickly and got in Minta's face. Is he really an animal? Well, Minta trailed off. A smile on his face, I might tell you, in exchange for something oh. A hand smacked the back of his head, turning around, tears forming in his eyes. Minda glanced up to Bekugo who had just walked up to their table. What was? Oi, midget, don't waste our time. His voice was quiet, but his eyes were murderous. Gyro sighed at the violence, but her curiosity outweighed her distaste for the two who'd have thought someone like you would be interested in something like this. What's that supposed to mean? Bakugo shouted, his typical behavior resuming. Izuku shook his head as Yayarazu, Yuraka, Ada, and Kirishima slid into their seats at the table. Aichi's like a bear, mouse, dog hybrid. Minda answered after Bakugo continued to shake him around. Izuku wanted to belt out a laugh at the visual, but also didn't want to do so in front of Bakugo, so he held his tongue. How's your lunch, Midoriya? Yayarazu asked, a smile on her face. He responded with a simple, good, taking note of Yuraka's continued shyness in front of him. Was she really that embarrassed by Igris? Or is it something else? A sudden, whoa, whoa, shook him out of his thoughts and he looked up, surprised to see two upperclassmen attempting to hold back the crazed Bakugo, now just raving at Minda for no good reason. It took just a moment for the blonde and light blue-haired classmates to separate Bakugo from his victim, their smiles barely wavering, even in the face of his incessant screaming. Most of the table regarded it with humor or novelty. After all, even though it had only been a week or so at school, Bakugo's raging was now nothing more than a background noise to them. Ada, however, took it extremely seriously and bowed to the two third years, apologizing profusely. The blonde boy just laughed heartily and held back the struggling Bakugo with one arm like it was nothing. It's no trouble. Just wanted to help a classmate in need. I don't think he needed help. Isn't that right, Minta? You have little faith. But the short hero in training was too busy shaking in his seat to answer. Oh, are you the new class 1A? The girl with light blue hair asked. I've wanted to meet you all so much. The boy rested his hand on her shoulder. But we've gotta go take care of some internship work. If you wanna learn more about your quirks, maybe you can join my club. She shouted after them as her friend dragged her away. Come on, we're gonna be late, Nejire. As they watched the odd exchange between classmates, Mina stood with vigor, I forgot. Today's club rush. Huh. Even Ida looked shocked. How long have you known about this? I heard about the date from a friend who went here before me, but I kinda spaced until now. Mina appeared abashed for a moment before Kirishima changed the topic. Well then why don't we go check them out? There's still a good 40 minutes for lunch right? Izuku shrugged and followed suit, depositing the remainder of his lunch by a nearby trash can. I wasn't very hungry to begin with. Yeyorazu and Yuraka took no further convincing to abandon what was remaining of their lunch. Jairo only had to see that Yeyorazu was going in order to join, but Ida stood steadfast. I haven't even started eating. It's important to get proper nutrient. Bakugo snatched him by the collar and began dragging him through the halls behind the rest of the group, giving him no chance to retaliate. There were the standard clubs, like chess, some sports, and a few language clubs. Or at least, they assumed they were language clubs, because the only response they got upon entering the classroom was Zouten Jelly Ook Grog Mir Willen Wetten over to Netherlands Tall and Kultur and to Bite Thunder Relady Die Netherland Met Japan Heath. Back Hugo immediately slammed the doors on the loud students and stomped off, muttering under his breath, I hate the Dutch. Izuku had no idea what that was all about. But by the time they had reached the final club classroom, he and his classmates had found themselves uninterested by any of the proposed clubs. It's all normie shit, Bakugo shouted, as he threw open the final door to a dark room and a small meow. Hey, if it's a napping class, I might be able to get behind that, Minda said, hopping up to flick on the classroom lights. But instead of 20 desks taken up by napping students, they found an empty room, save for one small black cat, a white patch of hair surrounding its left eye. The cat purred at them, appearing to look directly at Bakugo as the sound escalated. Before long, the cat was on its hind legs, its teeth bared and its hackles raised. Izuku chuckled, looks like it really doesn't like you. Bakugo growled back at the cat, like a lion meeting a cheetah in a dark field at night. What nobody expected next was for the cat to launch across the room, from the teacher's podium, towards Bakugo's face. Instinctively, the bully raised his hand, sparks crackling off of it as the room screamed at him, no. 
But it was too late, and smoke obscured the room as the cat was undoubtedly killed by the explosive attack. The girls in the room squealed in horror as Ader raised his hand, presumably to chop back Hugo in half with. Meanwhile, Izuku just watched on with curiosity, because while his first thought had been that he'd resurrect the cat when no one was looking for Yeirazu's sake, he knew that would no longer be possible. Not because the body was too mangled or because Izuku had yet to tell the rest of the world about his power to bring back the dead, but because it wasn't dead just yet. Meow. The room froze, their panicked actions ceasing with that one tiny sound. There's no way. Right. Yeirazu directed a mildly distressed glance at Izuku, as if to check to make sure he hadn't used his power on it. He only answered with a slight shake of his head. At first, they assumed it was a weak meow, a cry of pain, moments before death. But once again, they were disproven as the black cat strutted out from the smoke, its body completely clean and free of harm. Surprisingly, Gyro jumped up to one of the tables in shock, a bit of her superstitious personality taking over. MMM maybe Bakugo just missed. No way. He shouted back, offended that anyone would accuse him of such a thing. It's a cat. Not all might. I'm not gonna miss him. Izuku crouched down to the cat that everyone was beginning to fear. Maybe it was because he had seen too many unbelievable things before. Or maybe because he simply knew the reality that life after death was possible that he didn't freak like the others. He held out a hand to the cat, who sniffed him a moment before nuzzling up against his palm. Her purrs returned to a calm and gentle noise gracing his ears. Th that's not right, Gyro muttered. It's bad luck for a black cat to like you so much. Mina and Yeorazu appeared to be the only other two that snapped out of their shock and bent down to pet the cat who purred even louder in satisfaction. I never knew pusses were this hairy, Mina said, enjoying the soft fur of the cat as Yeirazu self-consciously brought her legs closer together. Uh, I was wondering what was going on here. A quiet, yet oddly commanding voice echoed from the door. Izuku's eyes widened as he realized there was a small, upright, white animal standing in the doorway, about Minta's height. Principal Nezu, I told you, Minta screamed at Bakugo, the rest of his courage thrown into the shout. It appears you've met my old friend, Aho the cat. She tends to get herself killed quite often, he said it as if that explained everything and he picked her up. Well, have a good rest of your day students, and stay out of trouble. Okay, so we're in agreement, Gyro asked. Yep, Bakugo said, growling his way out of the room, let's just pretend like this day never happened. Three days had passed since Izuku's perceived defeat. Since then, class had continued like any normal high school would as the teachers worked out some sort of outline for their students' hero training. It had been boring and mostly trivial busy work. The stuff that Izuku did not miss from middle school. In fact, the only real interesting event that had taken place was the election for class president. Izuku, unlike most of the class, chose not to vote for himself, instead choosing to vote for Yeirazu. It was something that she became extremely embarrassed over once she figured out who had been responsible for her position as vice president. Ada had gotten the role of president after he had displayed a decent amount of leadership qualities during a sudden campus alarm caused by the media. Relations with his class hadn't really changed much since then. Bakugo and him were still on bad terms and they avoided each other every chance they got. Yuraka still appeared embarrassed every time she was around him, likely thanks to her encounter with Igris, and Ida still appeared stiff and unmoving around him. If there was one saving grace in the lack of development, it was that Todoroki had yet to change his icy disposition or focus it at Izuku. He hoped this meant that the S-rank student had yet to learn the identity of his brother's killer, but to him, that seemed like a false hope. Izuku couldn't imagine the torture that Todoroki was going through. If he was ever to lose Sakura, he wouldn't rest until he found the bastard who took her life. It was this conviction in his own mind that made him so wary of his classmate. Of course, unbeknownst to him, Shoto was too disconnected to care about revenge. Natsuo had seemed to be an evil, vindictive killer that held no real value for human life and because of that his death had left Izuku guilt-free right up until he knew of the man's family. Endeavor was a top-ranking hero one of the best, and Shoto was a student striving to become a hero himself. Had it not been for their familial ties to Natsuo, or the supposedly murderous Dabai, the Todorokis might have seemed to be a normal family with a quiet kid. Izuku had done his best to avoid Todoroki the past few days and Yeirazu, who sat next to the heterochromatic teen, noticed. It had only taken her a moment of recollection to find the names of raiders that Izuku had killed in self-defense. So, what are you going to do about it? She asked him during lunch, before anyone else could join them. Izuku made no attempts to hide what had been bothering him. He knew that Yeirazu was smart enough to know by now. What can I do? I killed his brother. Izuku sighed, on the off chance that he doesn't care for some reason. Then I'm good, but if I tell him and he's pissed, he's an S-rank. He could kill me, maybe even with my whole army going after him. Yeirazu pursed her lips, unsure of the right answer, if there even was one. Midoriya, a bubbly voice called out, are you excited for today? 
Izuku dispelled the anxiety pressing down on his shoulders and smiled back at Yuraka, who did her best to avoid direct eye contact. Yep, after the combat training, I feel like getting to see some rescue action is gonna be fun. While heroes in this world were far more often warriors than saviors, there were those select few that decided to use their immense power for far more tame activities. Ice magic and water manipulation turned away from icicle barrages and pressure jets that could cut people in half and instead became tools for firefighting. Healers became doctors, much like Sekiro was planning to do. And even those with only strength-type quirks gave up their life of excitement and villain hunting to lift rubble. It was inspiring and what many considered the true essence of a hero. Izuku would tend to agree with that. But to him, it just wasn't lucrative enough to pay for his mother's medical bills. I hear All Might is supposed to be there. Ida said from behind Yuraka, a gleam in his eyes reflected into his glasses. This sentence alone was enough to cast off any of the stress Izuku had been feeling today. He had met All Might once before, during the entrance exam, but he ran off to get ready for the parent-teacher meeting and had to give up any time to talk to his favorite hero. In fact, All Might was most everyone's hero. He cleared the most gates, did the most rescue work out of any of the top ten heroes, and always did it with a beaming smile. He alone dissuaded most of the human villain crime just by existing. He had been 99% of the inspiration for Izuku's E-rank hero life. I finally get to meet him, like for real this time. I wonder if I can get him to autograph my notebook. So Midoriya, I have to ask, are those summons your quirk or your awakening? Izuku looked at the girl opposite him on the bus's seating rows. She had long, dark green hair, big eyes, a slender build and was wearing a bright green bodysuit. Izuku was pretty good with names, so he remembered her as Tsuyu Asui, a B-rank who apparently was here to specialize in rescue work. He hadn't talked to her much, or really at all to be honest, but her questions certainly made him pause for a moment. Awakened abilities were pretty standard and only came in a certain mixture of powers. Mages had only certain types of magic, warriors only had certain types of melee abilities, and summoners were no different, even amongst the S ranks of the summoner class. Not many could manifest more than a few summons at a time. Because of this, if Izuku were to claim to be a summoner, it would look especially suspicious. It's my quirk, he answered after a moment of thought, satiating the girl's question, but causing Bakugo to squint his eyes in disgust who sat just off to the back of the bus, leaning on one of the rails. Band, Kirishima shouted, you got lucky with a quirk as flashy as that. All I've got is this. He raised one of his arms, hardening it into a rock-solid, jagged limb. I'd love to have something like yours, or Bakugo's, or even Todoroki's. Then there's no way I could be ignored as a hero. Asui scoffed teasingly. I don't think anyone like Bakugo is going to be admired with that sort of attitude. What was that? Kaminari chimed in. There's no doubt that people would assume you to be a villain, especially with that ugly look on your face. What look? Yeah, that's it. Kaminari shouted enthusiastically at Bakugo's gnashing teeth and nearly glowing red eyes. Wow, Izuku marveled as he watched the exchange. Things really have changed since middle school. The bus continued to bump and roll along the road as its occupants bantered back and forth. Yeirazu chose to remain silent, instead simply choosing to enjoy Izuku's presence next to her. Enough, Aizawa grumbled, standing and latching onto one of the nearby poles, we're here. Izuku imagined he could fill his daily quests quota simply by climbing the stairs at the USJ. The training facility was so massive that the stairs resembled mountains more than anything else. Thanks to his level, Izuku had almost no trouble scaling the hill, but not everyone was so lucky. Minta, Kaminari, and Ayama were all breathing heavily, their talents resting more with ranged abilities than physical enhancements. Upon reaching the top and entering the USJ, the trio groaned once more. A long platform stretched out past the doors, leading to yet another staircase, this time angled to the ground. Why make two of them? Minda shouted. Just make the entrance on ground level. Kaminari sighed in agreement, slumping down to rest his already weary body to rest. And they want me to do hero work like this. Absolutely. A robotic voice boomed towards them. A hero should always be ready to work, no matter their condition. Izuku pulled his amusement away from his tired classmates and focused his intrigue on the new voice, surprised to see someone in a puffy, spacesuit-like coat. More surprising was that he recognized her as 13, a hero specializing in rescue, even with her surprisingly destructive quirk. As she recited a heartfelt speech about the teenagers with attitude and their immense power and responsibility, Izuku went back to his old ways, reciting every little tidbit of info he had on the hero. Izuku barely let the words tickle his ears. What did manage to reach him was a different, entirely overwhelming force, something he'd never felt before. It was a darkness, but unlike his own shadows, it held none of the same comfort they gave him. 
Looking around, Izuku spotted nothing by the rescue zones, each of which was specifically created to emulate a certain environment, and then, he turned his attention forwards once more noticing the sporadic spouts of water pumping out of the fountain in the courtyard until it ceased altogether. And then, a shockwave sent the class tumbling backwards onto their rears. Even Aizawa and Thirteen struggled in their attempt to remain upright. Bakugo, Todoroki, and Izuku appeared to be the only ones not struggling too much against the intense force. In reality, while Bakugo and Todoroki simply faced the force head-on, Izuku was forced to use Dominator's touch and his immense strength stat in order to stand beside them. This chill, it's the same as the double lair. No, maybe even more. The area around the fountain warped and partially vanished as a deep purple gate burst into existence. While its inherent existence was commonplace in today's world, its qualities kept the students and their teachers on their toes. A purple portal had yet to be reported and one of this size was in no way commonplace. It stretched out in unnatural patterns, fanning the area with its intense force. And then, it broke all of the common sense of a gate. A humanoid hand reached through the misty gate, pulling itself through and dragging a pale body covered in hands severed at the wrist. Pausing just at the threshold of the gate, it looked up to the platform, gazing at the students and teachers from behind the hand that covered its face. There are one nearby human that intend to murder the player. Survive at all costs. Humans. Izuku muttered out loud, his blood running cold. That thing. It's human. He found himself more stunned by that revelation than the system's dire warning, or even the figure's immense power. It defied all logic, all reasoning. He was not just an S-rank threat, he might have even been considered SS-rank. Izuku wasn't even sure if he had gotten this same measure of energy off of All Might when he had first met him. Wait, All Might, where is he? He spun around, realizing that the top hero was indeed not present, wasn't he supposed to be here? Without him, do we even? Izuku's uncharacteristically panicked thoughts were cut out and massive bursts of energy echoed from the class. Somehow in unison, Yeyurazu fired off her anti-material rifle, Bakugo shot off a concentrated explosion, and Todoroki sent waves of ice chasing after his classmates' attacks. The man simply raised his hand, allowing the bullet and explosions to crash into it. But nothing happened. There was no explosion, or even any apparent force exerted. The two attacks just vanished. The same happened upon the ice reaching him. For just a moment, it appeared to encapsulate him, however, like the other projectiles, it similarly crumbled into nothingness. This decay even forced its way up back through the ice, destroying every last bit of it, all the way back to Todoroki's foot where the decay thankfully stopped, with the attacks from their strongest classmates being annihilated like nothing. The group went silent. After all, what could they do against a monster like that? Bakugo, of course, was nowhere near discouraged. Come on, he's just one villain. Let's kill him. As if to answer his question. The man, who was still a gate villain in the class's eyes, tilted his head and waves of enemies began pouring from the still open gate behind him. Izuku's eyes widened as he realized that among the villains, there were even more humans. There are five nearby human that intend to murder the player, survive at all costs. There are twenty nearby human that intend to murder the player, survive at all costs. There are thirty-three nearby human that intend to murder the player, survive at all costs. The numbers increase slowed as the mixture of gate villains and human villains finally stopped spilling from the portal between worlds. The last to exit being a massive black monster with a beak-like mouth and exposed brain. A Namu type. Aizawa spat out as he pulled the goggles that rested around his neck up to his eyes. I recommend everyone evacuates back to the bus now that communications have been cut off. Izuku turned to his left. Realizing Kaminari had been tapping at the headset on his head. For some reason, this spurred Izuku into chiding himself. Idiot. You've faced worse than this before, stop getting distracted. We're not going to let you hog all the fun for yourself, Bakugo shouted, a demonic grin on his face. Aizawa sighed and nodded to Thirteen. It wasn't actually a recommendation you fool. Run while you still can. You aren't seriously going to fight them all on your own are you? Hiroshima asked in shock. The majority of them are measured at a low B rank. That's enough for me. Izuku found himself once more examining his teacher, doing his best to work out who this hero was. He detected no mana from him, as if he was hiding it, and he had yet to see his quirk in action. He must have been at least higher rank or maybe even S rank to be so confident in such a lopsided fight. Then 13 attempted to wave the students back to the entrance. Come on, let's leave this to a racer hat. Everything clicked into place as Aizawa leapt off the stairs into battle and Izuku cried after him, wait. But the pro didn't hesitate for a moment. What's wrong? Yeyorazu asked him as she attempted to drag him back with the others. Izuku gave her a grim look. There's no way he can win. A C rank against all of those stands no chance. C C rank. 13 grabbed the two of them with slightly inhuman strength and began pulling them away. Leave this to him. She shouted once more. As that man is fond of saying, you can't be a hero with just one trick. 
But Izuku couldn't help but feel that dark pit of dread in his stomach and he shook off 13's grasp. Sorry, but you also can't be a hero if you run away from everything. Come forth. Nearly six dozen shadows pulled themselves from Izuku, forming the hero's very own army. Everyone else can run. But since they're here, I might as well get some experience, Izuku said with a sly smile. A voice in the back of Izuku's head told him he was treating the situation too lightly. But after dispelling the poisonous thoughts that racked his brain, making him feel weak once more, he couldn't help but become invigorated to fight. His recklessness also wasn't helped by the boisterous roaring of his ice bears. With his army charging down the steps, their leader riding atop Smokey, Izuku felt like he could take on the world. Moments prior to his undoubtedly cool charge Todoroki, Yeyurazu, Kirishima, and Bakugo began moving back towards the battle after seeing Izuku, while the rest had continued on with 13. But before they could get far, the purple, misty gate vanished and reappeared as a dark dome over the entire group. Yellow eyes peeked out, narrowing as they glared at 13. I was instructed to merely scatter you. His voice reverberated in each of their skulls, like it was heavily modified by a computer, but seeing as 13 rests in your midst, I'll have myself some fun. What the hell do Bakugo's shout was cut off as the dome restricted, filling with even more shadowy mist. By the time it cleared, only two figures remained standing on the platform. 13 and the shadowy gate man. What have you done with my students? Hmm. They're still inside this facility, but they'll be kept busy by the rest of our companions. You son of a... The solid shadow cut her off with a laugh. If UA really lives up to its expectations, your students are the least of your worries. Then, if you're not here for my students, what are you here for? Well, we were here for the largest fragment, but All Might apparently decided to become a no-show. I suppose that schedule we nabbed from your teacher lounge was just partially inaccurate. Thirteen cursed inwardly. The press's invasion of school grounds had merely been a diversion for the villains to sneak in and snatch the schedule. Wait, there hasn't been any reports of major gate breaches in at least six months. Are you, human? Her mind churned rapidly as she realized the implications of this development. Gate villains possessed the seemingly simple desire to kill humans, nothing more, nothing less. There had been no reports of villains targeting certain heroes, at least, until now. Hee <laughs> hee, the shadow chuckled, I am human and I am more. His eyes turned their attention over Thirteen's shoulder as he gazed at the shadow army running down to join the battle. We may have missed the largest fragment, but we can still take the greatest. Wait, aren't you? The shadow cut off Thirteen as a dozen thin, spindly arms pierced her body, cutting off her last words. Our plans have already gone somewhat off the rails. I won't allow any more interference. Aizawa was not necessarily a prideful man. He stayed outside the influence of the media and instead of taking a flashy job like gate clearing, he joined the anti-awakened task force, which handled human opponents who chose to use their powers as a villain would. Even still, he knew that he had come far as a C-rank and while humble on the outside, he felt accomplished with what he managed to do. He was weak in comparison to someone of a higher rank, but like most others of a low rank, his quirk helped him surpass his awakened strength. Just by looking at someone with his quirk active, he could restrict their mana flow, cutting off access to both their own quirk, skills, and even some of their awakened strength. Unlike most other quirks, Aizawa's had no drawbacks, only a singular limitation. It ran on mono like other quirks, so once he ran out of energy, he was essentially just a C-rank with average strength. And yet, once again, Aizawa showed off his prowess as a hero. As the capture device around his neck, a carbon fiber band of sorts, flew at a nearby villain. He triggered his quirk, timing it perfectly in order to mitigate the mana loss. He wasn't adept with long, drawn-out battles with hordes of enemies. But these were villains and human or not, he couldn't let them go free, for both his students and for the civilians that lived nearby the USJ. If a single one of these B2A ranks got free, they could wreak an unbelievable amount of havoc on the surrounding area until efforts could be scrambled to deal with them. Dashing through the battlefield, he was akin to a one-man army. With each opening of his eyes another fell victim to his onslaught. With the mix of awakened and gate villains, Aizawa found himself in a precarious situation. They were so numerous and so varied in their powers that there was a clear disadvantage. No priority could be made for any one villain as they remained in a loose circle surrounding him. Their various quirks and magics aimed at him. Taking a spare moment to catch his breath, Aizawa prepared to leap back into the fray, determined to at least put a dent in their numbers. But before he could, a wave of darkness rushed over the crowd, parting just before it hit Aizawa. Upon second glance, Aizawa realized that the shadows were not a literal wave, but shadow knights and shadow bears, creatures of Izuku's creation. The green-haired teen leapt off his mount and landed next to his teacher, giving him a slightly apologetic smile. The Shadow Army was efficiently and swiftly dealing with the lower rank villains, allowing Aizawa a moment to sigh at Izuku, fixing him with a pointed glare. 
Of course, he couldn't deny that he was grateful for an army of his own to help fend off the villains, but he was still upset that a student disobeyed his orders and that 13 let them. Mana 18,203 24,987 Izuku nearly gasped at his sudden mana loss. 6,000 taken away in an instant meant that not only was something destroying them with asinine strength, but it was doing so at an incredible rate. Not wanting to waste any time or mana, Izuku immediately withdrew his forces, them parting like a Red Sea and revealing their truly dangerous opponents. Hmm, Tirajiri, shouldn't those masses have been stronger? The shadowy man responded, They were the very best and biggest forces we could acquire on short notice. To ch. It's a shame we have to rely on humans to occupy our true prey. Kirajiri nodded, Fret not Shigaraki, for it appears we still have an opportunity here. Huh? Shigaraki muttered, What's that mean? All Might isn't here. The only point in killing these brats is for the fun of it. Can you not see it? In front of our very eyes, we have found the Gria Izuku was suddenly within punching distance of Kirajiri, his shadow steel armor and gauntlets covering up his body. Overwhelming strength has activated. Mechanical destruction has activated. I can't beat the other two, but I can kill their teleporter. With Aizawa cutting off their mana flow and Igris distracting the other two, there's no way they can stop me. None of that little hero. Shigaraki's bare hand reached out and wrapped around Izuku's fist. Kirajiri is an important asset to me. I refuse to lose him. Then, Izuku's gauntlets began to crack. How? Izuku leapt back, out of range of the three villains, surprised to see that Igris had been flung like a ragdoll and the Namu-type creature was blocking Aizawa's line of sight. Midoriya, Aizawa shouted, noticing that the cracking of Izuku's gauntlets was tracing its way up the armor. Izuku desperately attempted to shake off the growing decay, but to no avail. He knew that it wasn't decaying his own flesh, but he couldn't help but feel like he lost something as his shadow steel armor was completely overtaken. Within seconds, the entire set of armor, in addition to his prized gauntlets, had turned to dust and been scattered by the wind. He was so disturbed by the loss of his entire armor set that he only looked up in time to see the Namu's fist bearing down on him. HYO The Namu was frozen instantly, his momentum completely stopped. However, mere seconds later, the ice began to tremble and shatter. Hayo's attack was rather ineffective, but it gave Izuku the chance to hop back and avoid the devastating punch. Of course, this didn't keep the Namu from pursuing its prey and Shigaraki and Kirajiri relaxed as the villain batted aside Smokey like it was nothing. Izuku wanted to be angry about how the other two villains were doing nothing more than sitting back and watching, but he had more pressing matters. Damn it! Izuku continued to backpedal as Hayo did his best to halt the beast, using ice spears, walls, hammers, and just straight up freezing it. At best, the Namu was only slowed. Looking back to Aizawa, he could see that his teacher was staring straight at their opponent, his quirk fully active, what is this thing? Even with its mana cut off, it refuses to stop. Hayo's eyes narrowed as he focused heavily on the target in front of him. With his hands splayed out to either side of him, he looked almost divine as mana began pooling around him, causing his shadow hair to flutter around from the force. Whether it was some sixth sense, or simply the Namu realizing that Hayo was condensing an immense force, it turned around facing what it deemed a true threat. Izuku tripped up the villain as it made for his loyal servant, instead faceplanting thanks to the telekinetic intervention. Of course, this didn't hold the beast for long and it once again reached its clawed hand out for Hayo. This time, Izuku did nothing, choosing to wait, but not because he wanted to see Hayo smashed, or because he was afraid to fight, but because he could see the ice elf's face. His lips were curled up into that same demented smile that Izuku detested so much. Just as the Namu went to squash the elf like a bug, Hayo's hands clenched into fists, and the air was filled with an immense crackling. Half of the black creature's skin was overcome with cool blue ice and it fell to the ground, its right side scrabbling for help. For a moment, Izuku contemplated why this attack was suddenly so much more effective. But it was only when its hand shattered off did he realize. Instead of creating a solid and tough layer on the outside, Hayo froze all the way through to the bone, making it look like the Namu's insides were made of ice instead of flesh. It continued to thrash around, chunks of its body cracking and falling off, but it didn't seem concerned in the slightest. Finally, it split itself down the middle, all of the ice crashing to the ground as dead matter. And then, its red insides began to move and writhe. Mass exploded outwards, regenerating the pieces it had lost mere moments earlier. Aizawa's eyes lit up red and the region slowed to a near stop as Izuku reached into his inventory, pulling a jagged marble sword. <laughs> Item class, S. Item type, bronze sword. Attack, plus 120. Active skill, paralyzing storm. The user's sword will shed its outer layer of perfectly sharpened feathers. Up to five dozen can be sent at once to seek out and paralyze enemies for a short period of time. Igris. Izuku heaved the sword into the air, sending it spinning for the knight that was falling through the air, aiming for the Namo. After recovering, 
Igris laid in wait, perfectly positioned for the moment when he'd have to make a move. Seeing that his enemy had been dealt a fatal blow and was still getting up, he jumped, soaring through the sky in an arc. Izuku used Dominator's touch once more to hold the villain in place for his shadow soldier. Igris's left hand reached out, snatching the spiraling sword like it was nothing. Crossing both his shadow sword and the angel's demonic wing in front of him, he made contact with the Namo. Glowing lines appeared in his black skin as Igris swung and slashed faster than the normal eye could track. Once he was certain that he had cut small enough, Igris kicked outwards, blowing the Namu into hundreds of small cube-shaped pieces, and in order to ensure it could no longer regenerate, it impaled the still intact head on his sword, preparing his trophy for his leech. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Now, with only Shigaraki and Kirajiri remaining, a shadow bear leapt at them from behind. Shigaraki sighed, this is boring. Without turning around, his hand stopped a creature five times his size. Now disappear. The bear instantly dissolved into ash, falling to the ground in a heap. Izuku took a step back. The regeneration. It's slower. The dust pulled and pushed at itself. A dark glob of shadow desperately attempting to form a solid shape once more. Hum, Shigaraki mused. It looks like I've still got some ways to go before I can reach his level. It's a real shame we didn't get to take out All Might. Indeed. But remember, there is always the boy in front of you. What about him? Shigaraki asked, still seeming bored with the whole encounter. Can you not sense it? He is no normal hero. He is like All Might, but something else. Shigaraki almost glared at his gatemaker, stopped speaking in riddles. That boy, he has a fragment inside of him. Shigaraki froze, then turned his attention back to Aizawa and Izuku who stood at the ready. They refused to attack as they knew they would only die. Ew, what's your name? Izuku Midoriya. Shigaraki appeared behind him, it's a shame. You'll die before you truly come into the power you've inherited. No one else dies today. A hurricane of winds struck the courtyard and Izuku had to latch onto Smokey in order to prevent himself from going flying. Why? Because I am here. Izuku's eyes were still closed to protect them from the massive shockwave, but he smiled all the same, knowing exactly who had come to their assistance. By the time he managed to finally peel them open, he saw Shigaraki slumped, looking tired and sad. It's unfortunate, but we can't win this without our tank. Kurajiri. Right. A gate popped into existence as All Might ran forwards, his image less than a blur. S-M-A-A-A-S-S-S-H-U-U-U. Save it for another day. Number 1. Shigaraki growled out as the gate collapsed in on itself, sucking inside both villains just as All Might's massive wind blast struck. It hit the flood zone just behind them, and practically emptied the entire man-made lake of its contents. Naturally, this would have blasted away both Minta and Tsuyu, who had been hiding just by the water's edge. But thankfully, Izuku had noticed them at the last moment and used Dominator's touch to lift them high above the attack. No, Izuku was so caught off guard by All Might's uncharacteristic shout of anger that he nearly allowed his two classmates to freefall the last 20 feet to the ground. Once the two did make it safely down however, Izuku paid the four, All Might, Aizawa, Tsuyu, and Minda no mind and instead instructed his shadows to crowd around the body of the Namo. Slipping in between the cracks of his army, he approached Igris, who kneeled next to the chopped-up body, with the decapitated head still resting next to him. In one of his hands, he held the angel's sword, but he had sheathed his other sword in order to hold up a runestone. Izuku quickly took it and thanked his most trusted ally, shoving the rune in his inventory. He'd look at it later. After all, he didn't have much time to invite his newest soldier before the others noticed his absence. Arise. Izuku was nearly shoved back by the amount of darkness that spewed from the Namu's eviscerated body. It was far more overwhelming than what Igris had put out back when he'd been extracted. Shadow Namu LV. 15 Elite Knight Grade. Izuku's eyebrows shot up as he realized he found a grade higher than even Igris's. I hope he's not jealous about that one. Namu by itself is no good. Attempting to glean any hints for a name from its abilities, Izuku opened its system menu. Passive skill, shock absorption. Shadow Namu will take 99% reduced damage from blunt attacks and 50% reduced damage from any magic type attacks. Geez, I guess that villain was right. This is a tank. Izuku sighed, alright fine. Tank it is. The Namu with a bird-like beak let out a piercing and human shriek. But Izuku called him back into the shadows before anyone could get too suspicious. While some may have figured out he was reawakened with what they thought was a powerful summoning quirk, there were still aspects of his power that he wanted to keep under the radar. There was no doubt in his mind that if Tank walked out from the bundle of shadow warriors, at the very least, Aizawa would pick up on his powers. All right, well now that that's done, Izuku smiled, go help the others out. The army bowed their heads before taking off in four separate directions. Hum. I guess they're avoiding Bakugo and Shoto. Now that he was no longer hidden within the circle of darkness, Izuku looked over to All Might, hoping he'd get to see more of his favorite hero in action. But all he saw was Aizawa patting the massive muscle man on the back. Hi. 
Yeah, I think I've seen everything. Within the next 10 minutes, Izuku received another three notifications about his level going up. The faculty and police arrived moments later, having realized that they couldn't contact the USJ and that its sensors had been taken offline, ascending the steps up to the platform with his classmates. Several of them immediately realized something was wrong. Many of the teachers wore masks of sorrow. Some even had tears forming in their eyes. They expected anger, annoyance, anything but this depressing atmosphere of sadness. Mr. Tsukachi. Izuku breathed out as he realized the head of the monitoring division was bearing down on him and the rest of his class. Midoriya. He replied, giving a cursory nod. What's going on? A high-pitched voice from the back of the pack shouted, Where's 13? Izuku balked, realizing that with the overwhelming events going on, he hadn't even recognized the absence of their rescue instructor. Tsukachi took off his glasses solemnly and addressed the class, I'm sorry. 13. She didn't make it. You're pretty good at getting yourself into trouble. Tsukachi was leaning against a police car as 13's covered body was lifted gingerly into the ambulance. And yet, even as an E-rank, you're pretty good at getting out of those same situations. He gave Izuku a small smile. The two stood off to the side of the rest of the class. Everyone was getting questioned, but only Izuku was getting special attention. But Izuku wasn't paying much attention to the detective. Instead, his eyes were pulled to 13's corpse, a quirk like hers. If I could extract that. Izuku nearly slapped himself right in front of Tsukachi as he realized what he had been thinking. There's no way I could do that. I'd be no better than a gravedigger. Tsukachi noticed his clenched jaw and narrowed eyes. Don't worry. You're not in trouble. Huh. As much as it annoys me that you didn't tell me, you're not a false ranker. So far, you've only used your reawakening to save people. He took off his sunglasses and wiped them on his suit. I don't think I need to tell you that isn't a bad thing. He sighed. But we're still left with too many questions. They said they were here to kill All Might. But of all people, why was 13 singled out? How'd they get that many gate and human villains to band together? Tsukachi paused for a moment, realizing that the boy he was talking to was just 16. Sorry, I shall. Maybe. She knew something about them that we didn't. If that information was important enough to them. Then, Izuku trailed off, his point made. Then if that's the case, it brings up the question. What did she know? Shigaraki grumbled as he stepped out of Kirajiri's gate, coming to a rest at their hideout, an old renovated bar hidden from the masses. Taking a seat, he growled out, Get me a drink, Kirajiri. The shadow man bowed and slipped behind the bar, his form now more humanoid than before. Left of Shigaraki, an old TV crackled to life and a dark shape with no features appeared on the screen. Tamura, master, the largest fragment didn't show until it was too late. A boy, killed the Namu and we were forced to retreat. MMM, I heard you killed 13 as well, was there a reason for this? The raspy voice mused. Hirajiri poured the clear liquid into a small glass for Shigaraki. She began to sense that something inside of me, the mana screaming to escape. I couldn't allow any information to leak. I suppose there's no helping it then. Now, does this boy you mentioned have a name? Izuku Midoriya, Shigaraki responded. Antares, Kirajiri interjected, I believe you may know him by another title. Oh, the voice asked, what might that be? The greatest fragment of brilliant light, Ashbourne. The next day, class was, animated, to say the least. Izuku almost stumbled back as he opened the door, greeted by a hail of shouts and raucous conversations. Did you guys see the news? Hagakir, a brunette with lively blue eyes, shouted, we were all on screen. I got so nervous that I forgot to turn myself visible again. At least you didn't get caught making a weird face, Kaminari bemoaned. Upon walking out of the USJ yesterday, he was caught with a drooling, limp face, apparently a result of his quirk. For real, Kirishima agreed. How did Minda even know they were filming us? He had that perfect smile for the entire time on the news. What can I say? I'm quite photogenic. Minda smirked, finally noticing as Izuku walked in. Well well well, it looks like the Demon Lord finally shows himself. D Demon Lord. He glanced back to Yeirazu who gave him a small wave and a shrug. Asui was the one to answer to his ridiculous title. We saw those summons of yours all bowing to you. It made you look like some sort of king, or at least an evil one. Speaking of you summons Izuku, Anjiro began, flashing a thumbs up, thanks for the backup. Yeah, I suppose I should thank you too. After all, me and Yamoma were so busy protecting this dummy that we barely had time to fight, she teased, pointing at Kaminari. Hey, it really was nothing. Izuku stammered out, overcome by all the attention. I wasn't even sure if anyone would need my hell. P. He trailed off as a dark, shadowy, bird-like creature got up in his face. He flinched back and Takoyami apologized, his feather head lowering. He didn't get to see your summons yesterday. And he's quite interested. Please. The bird croaked out, wringing his hands together in a comical pattern. Unlike Izuku's shadow soldiers, Dark Shadow had a rougher, less solid body. 
Oh well, sure. Izuku's palm aimed itself at the ground and dragged upwards, as if pulling out his shadow, Igris. The knight appeared beside him with a swirl of darkness, still clutching both the angel wing sword and his own shadow sword. Izuku's neck craned up as he realized something. Did. Did you get taller? Igris looked down at his liege, noticing the change in his height and bowed his head, as if attempting to make himself shorter. Does the system make them grow as well? I mean, his level is higher. Igris LV. 29 Knight Grade. I think Smokey's grade increased after hitting level 30, so Igris is pretty close to elite knight grade then. Well, I wish my summons were that strong. Koda whispered to himself from the back of the classroom as he lamented his weaker ability. In truth, Koda's powers were pretty unique. He could call upon any earthly animal whose power was slightly enhanced. Of course, not even all of Koda's summons combined could so much as scratch Igris. Their power differentials were simply far too vast. Take your seats, a voice growled out from the door, causing Izuku to jump and even Igris faltered for a moment. Having not sensed Aizawa's approach, Izuku sent Igris away and practically jumped into his seat. Yesterday was shit, but there's no time to dwell on it. There's something far more important in the coming days. Izuku could feel himself leaning forwards with the rest of the class. Something more important than a villain attack. Do you think they attacked somewhere else? Is this about 13? The last comment caught Aizawa off guard and his impenetrably bored expression flinched for just a moment. It's regrettable that we lost her, but it's also not the job of you students to worry about her death. Her family and friends are taking care of her funeral, and Tsukachi is investigating any reasons the attackers would have to target her. He shook his head. What I'm talking about could possibly define the rest of your hero careers. The sports festival. The students slumped back slightly in their seats. The sports festival was indeed an exciting time for them. As an event that was broadcasted to the nation and even other parts of the world, it was a great opportunity to get some of the spotlight. Scouts from all sorts of agencies around the country will be watching you. If you do well enough, you might just start the very beginning of your pro-hero career. In a somewhat anticlimactic turn of events nothing came after that announcement and the class was forced to go back to their normal homeroom activity. Izuku, meanwhile, was scrolling through his system status. Level, 74. Strength, 142. Vitality, 94. Agility, 125. Intelligence, 144. Sense, 106. HP, 19,734 over 19,734. I leveled up quite a bit, but my stats still went down. I guess I forgot just how much I relied on the Shadow Steel armor. Should be thankful that I didn't have to dismiss any of my shadows though. His mind began to wander as he thought back to his encounter with Shigaraki and Kirajiri, the one that could create the gates. He acted like he knew me, like he could sense that my power wasn't normal. He couldn't be part of the system too, could he? Izuku shook his head. No, the system has created problems for me to solve, not massive roadblocks like those two. He continued through the memories, coming to a moment where he had been asked a simple question. You, what's your name? And I answered them truthfully. Had he not been in class, Izuku might have smacked himself. There's almost never any villains that escape from gates and human villains are so uncommon, I didn't even think about what I was doing. For the rest of the day, Izuku was out of it, drifting into semi-consciousness as he began to become overwhelmed with guilt. I should visit mom today and maybe even up the shadows on Sakura. Midoriya. Izuku jumped as a hand laid on his shoulder. He spun around. Yeirazu was there, her lips pursed and her eyes wide. Are you okay? You've barely said one word all day. Yeah, I was just, um, thinking I would go visit my mom in the hospital today. Then as long as it doesn't bother you, I'm coming with, she declared forcefully. Izuku stared for a moment. Ha, huh, the last time you looked this upset, you got separated from our raid party and nearly got killed by some E-rank villains. Oh, yeah. Izuku smiled wistfully. It wasn't necessarily a good memory. But to be honest, the best memories of his time as an E-rank was when he got hurt and Yeirazu insisted on fawning over him until he was fine. Alright, this time it was Yeirazu's turn to freeze up. Ha, huh, I'd be grateful for the company and, well you're gonna need to meet my mother sooner or later, right? He joked without a smile. Hi mom, Izuku said as he entered the room, pulling up a chair for Yeirazu, who was standing in the doorway, unmoving, I brought a visitor today. Sorry it's not Sakura, she's been a little busy lately. I've done my best to keep her out of trouble, but she's, well she's Sakura. He turned back to Yeirazu, his eyes calm, but the inner turmoil showing through easily. Momo Yeirazu, I'd like for you to meet my mother and Ko Midoriya. Snapping back to reality, she remembered her manners and bowed, introducing herself to the frail woman. Is it? It's not. The eternal slumber. Her body couldn't handle the strain of mana flowing freely through the world, so she simply fell asleep. He scoffed. Out of all the people I knew, she seemed like the least likely to succumb to it. She was always so lively. Then, she started getting more and more tired. 
We knew what it was of course, but it took us weeks before we finally woke up from our denial. I barely got to say goodbye, so that's why. Yep, the only way to keep her alive was villain cores and money. Two things I didn't have much of. Ayarazu fidgeted in place for a moment, suddenly feeling remorseful. She had decided to never use her quirk for monetary gain. Not just to save the balance of the economy, but to show her parents that she wasn't simply a tool to produce whatever they wanted. Now though, she felt like she had been selfish. She could have saved Izuku so much trouble had she just been selfish for this one person. I don't have to worry about that now. The system has given me the means to keep her well taken care of. It's not all bad news. Can she? Hear us? Izuku shook his head. The doctors told me that slumber victims are like coma patients. They can hear some of what goes on around them. But, I did my own research. It's just to comfort the families. Thank you, Miss Midoriya. Yeyurazu began. Her head bowed low. It's regrettable to say. But your son is much like your daughter. He's far too attracted to danger. But, without him, I would have died several times over. And I never would have found my true resolve. We may have met under some pretty imperfect conditions. But I wanted to assure you that even if he doesn't look after himself, I will. Izuku wiped away a small tear. Thank you. It's been so long since, since anyone else really talked to her. I felt like I was going crazy. He hiccuped out a small sob as Yeyurazu suddenly hugged him from behind. Her warm body enveloping the sorrow he had held back for Sakura and for himself. It's okay. You're not alone anymore. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.